G'day guys and girls, and John Nicholas here from MyExcelOnline.com and I'd like to welcome you in this free Excel pivot table course. Now, this is a massive course. It is over 10 hours long and it has 230 short and precise tutorials so you can learn Excel and pivot tables straight away so you can become more efficient more skillful, gain the confidence so you can get the promotions and pay rises that you deserve. Now, I used to sell this course here, this individual course here over at my website for 300 US dollars. And I've decided to put this on the YouTube platform for free because I know a lot of people need to learn Excel and there are not that many good tutorials or courses on YouTube. So this is free. This is for you because a lot of people don't have money to spend on online courses and I understand that. So this course is for you and it's going to make you much, much better at Excel. Now in this course, you're gonna learn about pivot tables and with pivot tables, you can analyze thousands of rows of data with drag and drop ease. So when you drag and drop, into your pivot table, it's gonna create a report that analyzes your data. And with that data, you can make some awesome reports and you can make some great business decisions. And also, it's gonna give you the power that you need to take your Excel skills to the next level. In this course, we are going to talk about the following topics. First of all, we're gonna talk about how to customize your pivot table in the different layouts then we're gonna go into the summarize values by and also show values as calculations. Next, we're gonna go into grouping your data, then into sorting, then we're going to filtering. After that, we're gonna show you slices, which is an awesome feature that was introduced in Excel 2010. Then we're going to calculate the fields and items. Then we'll dive into pivot charts. We're gonna show you a bit of conditional formatting with pivot tables. Also, we're gonna show you the get pivot data formula. Then we're gonna go into pivot tables and macros. Also, there are bonus videos with some awesome tutorials there. And we're gonna go through the new Excel pivot table features that were introduced in Excel 2013, in Excel 2016, and Excel 2019 and Office 365. So, 230 short and precise video tutorials 10 hours of Excel training free for you. Now this course is for any Excel level, whether you're a beginner, intermediate, or you think you're an advanced Excel user, this course is for you. Whether you're young, you're old, you're unemployed, this course is for you. Once you learn Excel pivot tables, your Excel skills are going to skyrocket. Now, in the description area below, there's a link to download all 230 tutorials that I go through in this course. And each tutorial is in a start and finish format. So, you need to download this so you can practice along with me as I show you. Now, the more you practice, the better we get. That's with anything in life. So click on the button below, download the workbooks, and let's get straight into it. Now finally, if you have any doubts or any questions about any video tutorials, use the comments area below. Put in your question and I will be manning the comments and replying back to you with an answer. Also, give this video a thumbs up. The more thumbs up we get, the more videos that we're gonna create for you in YouTube. So go ahead and do that right now. And finally, after you watch this course, then we invite you to join our My Excel Online Academy online course. This course here has over 1,000 Excel video tutorials that covers formulas, macros, VBA, pivot tables, Power BI, Power Query, Power Pivot, charts, access. Also, we go on to Microsoft Word, Microsoft PowerPoint, and also Outlook. And we also cover dashboards and heaps more videos. Over 1,000 video tutorials, and if you really want to elevate your Excel skills to the next level, we invite you to join the Mike Online Academy. The details are in the card that will pop up now or in the description below. Click on that. But first of all, 
Let's get into this pivot table course. I want you to get better at Excel and pivot tables. Jump onto different pivot table areas. We've listed every tutorial in the description so you can click the button and go directly to an area that you want to learn. And once you learn pivot tables, you don't have to finish all the course. You can just do different sections. Then you are gonna be ready to take your skills to the next level. And we are here. I am here, my team is here to support you in your journey to become better at Excel so you can stand up from the crowd and get the promotions and pay rises that you deserve. Now let's get into it. Before you begin with a pivot table, you gotta arrange your data set. Now there are three rules to follow. Number one is to have your data in a tabular format. Number two is to make sure that there are no gaps in your data. And number three is formatting. Now here I'll talk about tabular format. So what tabular format means is that for a pivot table to work, you must make sure that your data is organized as a list with label columns, also known as tabular format. So you should have your column names on the top showing a distinct category of information. As you can see here, we have customer and going down the rows, we have the different customers. And we have products and we have information on the products. Salesperson, we have the different salespeople. And then as you can see, We'll go all the way up. We have order dates and so on. So let's try to do a pivot table by pressing Control A to select all of our data and then going into insert and pivot table. And then let's put into a new worksheet and press OK. Wow, we get an error message. It says here, the pivot table field name is not valid. To create a pivot table report, you must use data that is organized as a list with labeled columns. So the key there is labeled columns. Let's cancel out of here. As you can see here, our years and our quarters don't have any names. So therefore, it's not gonna work. Now let's put in the names in there. Sales year and sales quarter. Okay, once again, Control A. To select everything now when you press ctrl a make sure that it gets everything insert pivot table new worksheet press ok there we go we can start building our pivot table the second rule to arranging your data set is having no gaps what that means is having no blank columns and no blank rows the reason is that that section of your data might not get picked up when you create a pivot table. Now, as you can see here, we have column F that is blank and rows 11 and 22. Now let's create a pivot table from in here and see what happens. Let's select all by going to the right and all the way down. Okay, so we picked up everything here and go to insert and pivot table and press OK, we'll get an error message. It says the pivot table field name is not valid. To create a pivot table report, you must use data that is organized as a list with the label columns. Press OK and cancel to get out of it. Well, in here it's picked up that we don't have a labeled column, so obviously we're gonna delete it. Right click and delete. Now we have to delete row 11 and 22. Now imagine you had lots of rows in your data set that were blank. Now I'll show you a quick way where you can delete all those blank rows. Now once again, let's highlight all your data set and then go to the Home tab and Find and Select, Go to Special. In here, you get the Go to Special dialog box and choose Blanks and press OK. So what it does is within your selection, it chooses all the blanks. So now that we're in here, what we can do is we can hover over here and right click and 
delete from there. Or instead of doing that, let's press a shortcut, which is Control and the minus key. Now in here, we want to delete the entire row. So all the row gets shifted up. OK. And then press OK. And there you go. Now, what we can do is press Control A, make sure that it picks up everything. OK. Go to Insert, Pivot Table, and press OK. To have a great data set, you've got to make sure that your formatting is in order. This is because it avoids inaccurate reports when creating a pivot table. So it is essential to format each column that contains numbers and each column that contains dates. Now, for example, our sales column here, we're going to make sure that it's in a number format. To do this, we just click on the column F and then from the number group, the drop down box, we can choose a number from in here and press OK. We can also put in a comma and then get rid of the decimal places. Now in our order date here, we have numbers as well. Now Excel treats dates as a sequential number with the first of the first 1900 being day one. Now it does this in order to perform arithmetic operations. Now this information here doesn't make much sense to us. So we need to convert that to date. To do this, let's click on column E and once again, from the drop down arrow, let's choose short date. That's much better. So now with all of our information in the right format, we can begin with our pivot table. Excel tables are a new feature from Excel 2007 and onwards, and they're great. You should always use them. The best feature is that it has a structured referencing. This means that as your data expands with more rows or columns being added, then the table automatically gets updated as Excel refers to the table as a whole. Now when creating a pivot table and your data changes in a table, to update your pivot table, you only need to refresh and avoid having to update your data source. Now to insert a table, first you're going to click anywhere in your data source and press insert and table and Excel is smart enough to detect your data source. Now you can scroll down to make sure that it's inserted, okay? Another way is to press Control and T, which is a shortcut. Now this dialog box says create table. Where is the data for your table? So it's taken our data. And in here, check it if your table has headers, okay? And then press OK. So now it creates an Excel table. Now if we step out of it and then step back in, once you're in the table, you get the table tools option. And in here you have the design and different styles. So you have all these different styles that you can choose. Okay. Now also you can put in a total row, which means that from in here, you've got different ways to summarize your data. So you can put in a sum in there, now, if you want to expand your data, all you got to do is just grab the edge and just drag it down. Or you can just go anywhere in here, right click and insert. Now let's go back up again. Now you can also change the name of the table from in here. It's called table one, but we can change it to my table. Now once you're in here, you can summarize the pivot table or you can export to SharePoint list. Another thing is you have your different filters in here. Now, Excel tables are a great feature and whenever you're having data, you should always use them because they're gonna save you lots of time in the end. We have some data information here and we're gonna put it into a pivot table to see what the results are gonna Give us, go to insert and pivot table, and let's put it here next to our data. Now let's get our data and put it into our row labels, 
and then our data into our values to get the count. So what it says here is we have three separate values for IN123C104Z, but that can't be right. This here should be equal to three. Now there's a problem in here, and it usually happens when you're importing data from external data sources. Now, what happens is you may get some leading or trailing spaces. Now let's have a look in there and press F2. We can see that's fine. Let's go down and press F2. Here we have a trailing space. And go in there and press F2. Here we have two trailing spaces. So the pivot table treats these values as separate, so therefore it gives us a different count. Now I'll show you a way to clean up your data before you create a pivot table. One way is to use the trim function. So press trim and click in there and then it trims all your values like that and you can just double click and you have the trim values there. Now another way is to use an add-in from ablebits.com which is called trim spaces and that's one that I use all the time. All you gotta do is just press a button and then it trims all your selected area. Now I'll show you another way where you can trim your data. Highlight your data like this, the whole column. Go to data and text the columns and then choose delimited and press next. And in here, make sure that the space is checked and then press finish. So let's go back in here and have a look at the second value. Press F2, you see that it's cleaned the space and in there again, it's cleaned that. So let's go in our pivot table, right click and refresh. And now you see our data has been cleaned up and it counts it correctly. So we have our data set here and it's in a table and we know that because when we click in our data source we get the table tools option in there and we can see there that the table name is table 13. Now to insert a pivot table on the table tools tab design we can choose summarize with pivot table or we can actually go to insert tab and then pivot table like this. Now Excel is smart enough and it selects the table 13. So you see that it's all selected all the way to the bottom and we scroll to the right. Now it tells us where do we want to put the pivot table. Now we can choose a new worksheet or we can actually put it into an existing worksheet. So we can actually go somewhere in here and put our pivot table there. Now because we don't have that much space, we'll put it into a new worksheet and press OK. So you see it's created a new worksheet called sheet one and the pivot table is in here. Now if we step out of the pivot table, we don't see the pivot table tools tab. We're gonna actually step into it to activate the pivot table tools. And in here, we can choose options and design. Now under options, we have the pivot table name, which is pivot table number one. And we can change that to customizer and call it my pivot table. And you can see here, it changes the name as well. On the right hand side, we have our pivot table field list and we have all the column names here that were in our data source. Now, if you can't see this, then under pivot table tools tab options, you can activate it and disactivate it by the field list button there. Now, our pivot table is going to look similar to this design here. Now, let's go over to the right hand side and I'll show you how to create a pivot table. So the pivot table is going to look similar to the design that we've just brought over here. The fields that get dropped into the report filter will be shown on the top left hand corner of the pivot table. Fields that get dropped into the column area will be shown on the horizontal area of the pivot table. Fields that get dropped into the row labels area will be shown on the left hand side of the pivot table. And fields that get dropped into the values area will be shown into the middle part of the pivot table. Now let's go in and drop some fields into the respective areas. Now we can just hover over the name, grab it and drop it in there, just like that. And you can see on the left hand side, the pivot table is gonna be built. Let's get salespersons into the row labels. Let's get sales here into the column labels. And finally, let's get the sales into the values area. 
And you can see we get the live preview of our pivot table. And there we have it. We've created a quick pivot table with just a few clicks. And as you can see, the design is similar to the one that we saw before. When you click into a pivot table, just like I've done now, and then you don't see the field list, well, there's a couple of ways where you can bring it up. One of them is to go to the pivot table tools tab under options, choose the field list button. Here you can show it or hide it. And let's get out of this. Another way is to click anywhere into the pivot table, right click, and the last option is show field list. Now we can do a couple of things in here. We can actually move or resize the field list. From the drop down arrow, we can choose move. And then with the mouse, just click and drag to the left and we can move it out here, okay? Now to move it back in, with your mouse again, move it all the way as if you're throwing it out of the screen and it locks back in. The other option is to resize. So you can resize it from in here. And then we can close it. Let's bring it up again. Now from this drop down box, we have five different views that we can see the field list in. The first is the field section and areas section stat, which is the default. Then we have the field section and area section side by side. Then we have the field section only. Then the area section only two by two. And then area section only one by four. Now, person like the default view. In our pivot table field list, on the top half, we have our fields or column headings. If we go back to our data, you can see these column headings from customer to products, salesperson, sales region, order date, sales, sales year, sales month, and sales quarter, they're all inputted into this area here. Now in the bottom half of our pivot table field list, we have our four different areas where we can drag and drop our fields or column headings into. Now let's talk about these. First, we have our row labels. In here, you can show the unique values from the fields chosen on the left hand side of the pivot. So here you should look to add fields that you're looking to group, for example, products, company names, locations, and business units. For example, we'll take our products. Now you can actually click in the box and it will drop down into the row labels. Now sometimes by clicking, it doesn't actually drop into the area that you want. So the best way to do it is to drag and drop. So you can drag that all the way down and you can drop it in here when you see the little blue line underneath row labels and just let go of your mouse and you see products has been dropped into the row labels. Now on the left hand side, our pivot table is automatically updated, you get a live preview. So here we have our unique values that are within the products column. We have bottles, ice cubes, soft drinks, and tonic. Now we can check that if we go back to our data set and go to our products and in the drop down box, we can see that we have our four unique values in there. Okay. So these are transferred into the left hand side of the pivot table. Now next we have our column labels. In the column labels, you're mainly looking to show the trend of your data. For example, periods, phases, time, months, and years. So in that case, we can go and grab our sales year and drag it all the way into the column label area. And as you can see, on the top side of the pivot, we have our unique years, which are 2012, 2013, and 2014. Now in the values area, this is where you put fields that you want to calculate or quantify. 
The different type of calculations that you can use to summarize your data include sum for sales, count for number of units, average for prices, and maximum or minimum for your values. So in here, we're going to grab our sales and drag and drop in there. As you can see, on the left hand side, we have our sum of sales in there. So what it says in here is that in 2012, we sold $2,754,838 worth of bottles. So what it's done here, it's summarized so it summarized all the sales and put into a neat little table here where you can quickly analyze it within a few seconds. Now finally, we have our report filter. This is an optional filter. Here you can put fields that you want to drill down on and focus on. For example, regions, periods, business units, and staff. So for example, we're gonna grab our salesperson and drop them in there and sales region and drop them in there. As you can see on the left hand side, we have our report filters with a drop down box and we can see the unique values that make up the sales person. And sales region, we can also see the unique values in there. Now pivot table is very powerful because you can chop and change until you get the outcome that you like, that your boss like, or that your business is looking for. Now, if we want to move products from row labels to columns, we can do that. You just grab, drag and drop in the columns and then grab the sales year and put into the row labels. As you can see on the left hand side now we have our years and on the top column side we have our products. So you can analyze the information in a different way. It depends on what you're looking for. If you don't get it right the first time, don't worry. With trial and error, you will end up with your desired look. Now, pivot tables are that easy. Say that you're analyzing your data and you come across a strange value and it doesn't add up. For example, in 2012, for bottles, we have $2.7 million, but it should be more like $3 million. Well, we can actually drill down and audit that. To do that, you just click in the cell and then double click and you get a snapshot of your data set only for bottles and 2012. So in here, you can go into the sales and see where the error was. Now, if you're not making any changes, this is not the place to do it. You need to do it in your data set. Now, let's get out of here, control Z, to get out and press delete. So any changes you got to make has to be in your data set. And then you got to make sure that when you're in your pivot table that you refresh it by right clicking and refresh to update any changes that you made in your data set. Now you can also drill down into the grand totals. So say you want to look at 2013, you just double click and it gives you all the values for 2013 and you can begin with checking your information there and once again control z to get out and delete we have our field list here but it's not in alphabetical order and sometimes it can get confusing if you want to try and find out some fields especially if you have more than 20 different fields. Now to put this into alphabetical order, all we're going to do is go to the options and then options and under display at the bottom you have the field list and you can sort from A to Z. Press that, we'll press OK and you can see this will change to an alphabetical order. We can click on any row or column label items so we can show more fields. For example, in the row labels here, we double click and we get the show detail dialog box. And in here it says choose a field containing the detail you want to show. So it has all the fields not already chosen in the row labels 
So we can choose, for example, sales quarter and press OK. And then we have the sales quarters in there. And as you can see in the areas down here, sales quarter is also been added. Now the same thing we can do in the column labels, double click and we can add anything from in here. Let's choose sales month and press OK. If you have many rows in your data source and when you create a pivot table, it takes time to generate the live preview and the results, then all you can do is click here in the bottom left hand corner, the defer layout update. What this does is when you drop in your information like sales in your values area, you see you don't get a live preview here. So you can just drop in whatever you like in here and then sales years up there so you can drop whatever you like and then when you're happy with it just press update and then it updates it so what it does is it defers the layout update until you press the update button when your data changes either by your data source having its values updated or more rows or columns having been added to your data source that you need to refresh your pivot table. The reason is that when you created your first pivot table, a snapshot of your data was stored in a pivot cache. A pivot cache is a snapshot of your data set and this is where your pivot table is created from. You don't see this pivot cache, but it runs in the background system. This duplicate copy of your data set allows for your pivot table to run faster when you're making changes to it. So when changes are made to your original data set, then you need to refresh so you can update the pivot cache and ultimately update your pivot table. When your data gets updated, you need to refresh your pivot table to reflect the changes made in your data set. For example, if we go into our data and we go into bottles, and we change the sales here to $10 million. Then if we go back to our pivot table, you see that no change has been made here. What you need to do is refresh the pivot table to update the values. There are two ways to do that. One of it is to click in the pivot table and go to the pivot table tools tab under options and in the data group press refresh as you can see here our bottles for 2012 have changed now let's press ctrl z to go back the second way to do this is just to right click anywhere in your pivot table and you have the refresh option there and just click on there and your values get updated In this example, we have two separate pivot tables that were created from two distinct data sets. So our pivot table on our left hand side was created from data one, which is over here. Pivot number two on the right hand side was created from data two in here. So now what we're going to do is go in and change the information in each of the data sets and we're going to use the refresh all button to refresh both pivot tables simultaneously okay so what we're going to do is we're going to update bottles in 2012 so we've highlighted that in red so we can see the change and on our second pivot table we're going to change the value in soft drinks for 2012 so let's go to data one first and I've highlighted this in red so we can make the change. So I'm going to add in 10 million in there and data two, if I scroll up, it's for soft drinks. So I'm going to add 10 million in there as well. So let's go back to our pivots. Now, if we have multiple pivot tables, 
we can actually use the refresh all option which is from the drop down box and you have the refresh all and what that does it updates both pivot tables simultaneously so let's press a button and we'll see the numbers change there you go so as you've seen on the left here the numbers changed to 12 million and soft drinks it's changed to 11 million so if you have more than one pivot table in your workbook then you can use a refresh all button to update those pivot tables simultaneously. Say that in your company you have a workbook that you and your colleagues are sharing and updating on a, an hourly basis or, or a daily basis and you want to create a pivot table on your personal desktop, well, you can do that. Now, in here we have our shared data set and let's imagine that this is sitting in your company's server and everyone has access to it and they update it accordingly. So let's have a look at that. So this is a data set that we've been using in our previous lessons. Okay, so we can get out of here and let's go into our workbook, which sits in your desktop. So we can click on that and now here we can create our pivot table. So to do that, we have to go to insert and pivot table and we choose the use an external data source option. And then we have to choose a connection on the bottom left hand corner. We click on browse for more and then we have to search for our data set, which is sitting on our imaginary server and press open and we have our pop-up box that comes up and we have to select the data which is the first one the checkbox here says that our that the first row of data contains column head headers and that's correct and we can press ok let's create a pivot table let's put in our products on the row labels our sales in the values and our sales here in the column labels so there you go you have created your pivot table from an external data source. Now let's save this and we can get out of it. And let's go back into our shared data set, which is now server, and let's start making some changes. So imagine that your colleagues are making changes to this data set on a daily basis. So let's put in some fictitious numbers in there. And we can just Okay, so we have that, so we can get out of that. And imagine the next morning you come into work and you open this workbook and it has been refreshed. Well, there's a couple of ways you can update it. You can right click and refresh and that will get updated as you have you seen there. Let's control Z to get out of that. Now, another way that you can refresh it is by clicking on the connection properties under refresh and we get this connection properties pop-up box and we have a few options here we can actually refresh every x number of minutes okay so let's just refresh after one minute and press ok and we'll see what happens well there you go the updates have been made so this is a great feature to have so every x number of minutes depending on, on the default that you put on there your personal pivot table will get updated. So we can go back in here and change that again under connection properties. We can uncheck that. And let's check the refresh data when opening the file. So what that means is when you open your personal workbook that the pivot table will get refreshed automatically. You don't need to do anything. So let's save this and we'll get out of it. And let's go back to our shared data set which sits in our imaginary company server. And let's imagine that more changes have been made during the day. Well, these changes have been cleared out and we can save there and we can get out. And let's go back into your personal workbook and look at this. It has refreshed automatically the information from your external data source without you having to do anything. This is a great feature because sometimes you can come into your work in the morning, open your pivot table without refreshing. It happens. 
and this is a great feature to have so it's automatically it gets updated without you having to do anything now the last refresh control in here is enable background refresh now you're only going to use that when you're running a query in the background which will enable you to use excel while the query runs refresh every x number of minutes and refresh data when opening the file they're the options that you'll be using when you linking your workbook to an external data source so if you're working with an access database you can certainly export that information into an excel workbook and pivot that information accordingly now we have our database here which is a similar data set that we have been using in our previous lessons so i have saved this database number one in my desktop now let's get out of here and we can open up our new workbook so to import the access database information into a pivot table we need to go into data and choose from access and then go to my desktop where i saved my database one double click on that and we get our dialog box that says how do we want to view the data in our workbook we can view it as a table as a pivot table report as a pivot chart and pivot table report so now we we we'll choose the second option, pivot table report, and we'll put it into our existing worksheet in here and press OK and we we'll get our pivot table. So now we can create our pivot table here. We can put our products in the row labels, sales year in the column, and the sales in there. So we have our pivot table here. Now we can also refresh our pivot table so when the access, da access database gets updated accordingly well we can actually refresh it automatically by pressing refresh or we can put in a a time refresh every x number of minutes or we can also refresh the data when we're opening our excel workbook and this was covered in lesson 1.34 so there you have it you can insert information coming from an access database and use it inside a pivot table to analyze the data. So we have our pivot table here, which is referenced to a data range. We can see that by going into options, change data source, and we can see here that the range is all the way here. Now, when our range gets changed by having more rows or columns entered into there, then we need to go into our change data source and capture the new range. So let's go in there and add in some extra information. So press control down to go to the end of our data set. And let's enter some fictitious data in here. Let's press control D to fill down okay and let's go back to our pivot table and go to options and change data source as you can see here it only goes all the way to row 577 so our our extra rows that we've added in there haven't been captured in our range so what we need to do is include all that in our pivot table data source so to do that is press Control shift across and then down and press OK. So as you can see here, the information now has been refreshed and included in our pivot table. Now that is a long way to do it. When you're using a pivot table, you should always have an Excel table as your referenced information. So what we're going to do now, go into our table here. And select that so as you can see here it's looking at it as a table as a whole so every time we add in there extra rows or columns then we don't need to go back into the change 
data source button and include the extra lines because it's already going to include it into this table 13. So let's have a look here. Our amount is 3.2 million. And let's add in here a few extra rows or you can actually drag down. And then once again, we can copy down by pressing Control D. So all we need to do now is just go back into our pivot table and refresh. So you get options and refresh. So as you can see there, the new information has been updated. Now because Excel tables use structured referencing, then we don't need to go in and change the data source because it looks at the table as one whole data set. So you should always use Excel tables when you're doing pivot tables. And even if you're not doing pivot tables, they're great for data analysis. If you have many filtered reports in here, as you can see, and you want to clear them quickly, well, a quick way to clear them is to go into options and into your actions group and under clear, choose clear filters. Now, if you've been working with your pivot table and you don't like the look of it and you want to start again, but you don't want to delete your pivot cache, then you can easily do that by going into the options and clear and clear all. So what it does is it clears all your field list items in your areas and you can start fresh again. So now you can put in your new fields into your areas. Just like that and you can do your new analysis. Format a section of a pivot table, such as subtotals, columns, or unique row entries, then you need to go into your pivot table tools tab under options, in the actions group, under select. You gotta make sure that enable selection is ticked. As you can see there, we have the orange border around that. So now what you can do is actually go into the subtotals. As you can see, the black arrow is pointing and click there. So now we can go into our home tab and format. So we can put that into red. Now, if we move our products from row labels to the column labels, then the bottles product is still gonna be formatted in red, as you can see there. So let's put that back. Now we can also format the individual row items, for example, Q1. So by right clicking in there, we can highlight that in a different color. And once again, if we move the sales quarters from row, row labels to column labels, then that formatting stays there. So let's move that back. Now, if we go on top of the row labels and click there, then we can actually make some adjustments in there. Right click to make those in italics. Now we can also go into our column headings and do the same thing. Let's go to the grand total right click and we can put in there a border. The same thing we can do for the grand total down here. Right click and put in there a border. Now if you want to highlight the whole pivot table then all you got to go to is on the top left hand corner where it says sum of sales and you have the black arrow, you click on there. That's one way. The other way is going into the options tab, select and entire pivot table. 
So when you're in here, you can put in a different color if you like, or you can press delete and delete the pivot table. Let's press Control Z and get out of there. So there are many things that you can do with the options and select item to make your pivot table look a little bit funkier. Now, if we want to move our pivot table to another location, we can certainly do that. All we're gonna do is click anywhere in the pivot table, go into the options tab and the move pivot table button, click on that. And now we get two options. We can either move it to a new worksheet or to an existing worksheet. So let's move it to an existing worksheet and let's choose up here and press OK. As you can see, it's moved there. Now let's move into a, a new worksheet and press OK. As you can see, a new worksheet has been created called Sheet 1 and our pivot table has been moved from the pivot sheet into Sheet 1. The default pivot table style is pretty dull looking. But luckily, you have different styles where you can use and apply and make your pivot table look bright and beautiful. Now, to activate it, you need to go under your pivot table tools, tab under design, and you have your pivot table styles here. Now, in the drop down box, there are 85 different styles from light. As you can see here, you get a live preview as you're scrolling through each style. And there are some nice colors, and there are some not so nice colors. You have your medium. As you can see there, you have a few nice styles, and then you have your dark styles. And depending on, on what you like, or what your boss is looking for, you can choose one of these 85 different styles. I personally like this style here. You can make further changes under pivot table style options over here. You can put in banded rows and also banded columns. Now you can also uncheck the row headers and also the column headers. And once again, it's up to you, whatever style you like, you choose and, and use that style for your pivot tables. So now let's customize our row headers. We'll make it into italics. And now if, say we wanna change the style to a dark style, and if you right click in there, you got the first option, apply and clear formatting. What that means is it's gonna apply the new style and clear the italic formatting or any other formatting that you would have had in your pivot table. So let's click that and you can see the italics have gone. Now, again, if I change this to italics and then I choose another style and right click apply and maintain formatting, then I will maintain the italics in the row headers. Now the other option that we have there is a duplicate. So we can actually duplicate this pivot table style and change the styling in there. And we're gonna talk about that in another chapter. Now the other option is set as default. So you can set this as default. And when you're creating another pivot table within your current workbook, then you're gonna get the same style. So let's create a quick pivot table here. And we'll put it into a new worksheet and press OK. And let's put in some values in there. As you can see, it creates the pivot table based on your style that you have chosen, but it's only gonna work in your current workbook. And the third option that we have when we right click in there is add gallery to quick access toolbar. So if we click on that, our quick access toolbar is down here. So we have the other option in there.
Now under pivot table styles, you can create your own style. All you need to do is go under your pivot table styles and then you have the option at the bottom here called new pivot table style. Click in there and you get this dialog box where you can name your new pivot table style and you have your table elements. And here is where you can format your pivot table and you get a preview here and you got 25 different elements in here okay so you can start from scratch and create your own style now if you like a style from one of these 85 predetermined styles if you like one of them you can just right click and press duplicate so what it does is it duplicates the pivot table and you can make changes from from there okay so we can rename this i can rename it to john's pivot table pivot table one okay and you have your different table elements here now we're gonna go to first column and we can format the first column and that relates to here so let's put it into a, a gray color okay now what we need to do is we don't get a live update we actually gonna go back into the pivot table style and then choose our custom which is the second one here and we're going to activate it like that to see the changes so watch out for that now we can go back in and right click in there and press on modify so we can keep on making our modifications in there so in our header row we can format that into a different color. You see it's blue now, but we can make it into a different fill effect. We can choose one of these. We have the color white and the color blue and the shading styles, the variants here. We can choose any one of these, just to spice it up a bit. Let's choose that. Press OK, OK. And you see that's changed there and Let's go back again, modify, and let's go to the grand total row and format that. And we can make the grand total row black with a bold white color. As you can see there, the change has been made there in the preview. Okay. And also here now we have made that change. If we go back in there, we can see grand total row under element formatting, what we've chosen, bold background one, and where we have shaded. Okay, so now if we don't like this, we can clear it and go back to the start, but press Ctrl Z. Now, as I said, within modify, we have the table elements, we have 25 different elements. Now, to change every single one of it, I think is a bit over the top so what I've done here is I've created a a table of what the different elements are and where the changes will occur okay so just the, the important ones you don't have to go go through all 25 but the main ones I've highlighted here for you to go in and play around with um, when you have some spare time and you're bored so you've got all these different different styles that you can change and, and they're all highlighted here. When you customize a pivot table style, you can only use it in that workbook that you created it in. Now this is a new workbook and we created a new pivot table. As you can see, the customized style that we created previously is not in here. And say you want to bring it over in here. Well, we can do that. All we have to do is go back into our customized style that we created in our previous lesson 1.52 go to options and select the entire pivot table press ctrl c to copy the pivot table now let's go to our new workbook and paste the pivot table here right click and paste it in there and what happens now is that the customized style has been embedded into this new workbook so what we can do is 
click on our pivot table, apply the custom style, and then we can go and delete the pivot table that we brought over by selecting all and pressing the delete button in our keyboard. So now we have our customized style brought over into our new workbook. On the pivot table design tab, you have more options on the left hand side under the layout group. And the first one is subtotals. So in here, you got the three options. The first one is do not show subtotals. So the subtotals disappear. The second option is show all subtotals at the bottom of group. So you can see subtotal is at the bottom of each item. And the third option is to show all subtotals at the top of the group up here. So depending on what you like, you can choose to have those three different options. So the other option under design and layout group is the grand totals. So in here, we've got four different options. The first one is off for rows and columns. So the rows and column grand totals disappear. The second option is on for rows or columns. As you can see there, they come back on again. The third option is on for rows only. So we just have the row grand total here. And the last option is on for columns only. So you can see the grand total is down here. So you have four different options, but I like using on for rows and columns. Under the report layout, you have three different ways that you can show your pivot table. The first one is new in Excel 2010, and it's called show in compact form. Now in this form, you can see multiple fields in one column. As you can see here, we have our products and our salesperson in our row labels. So they're all compact into column A. So if I grab sales region and put it in there, as you can see, it will just drop it into column A. So it's all compacted into one singular column. Let's take our sales region from here. And the second form is called the outline form. As you can see there, this layout separates the row fields into separate columns. As you can see, we have products, we have salesperson, and if we drop in the sales region, it will go into column C. You see, the sales region is in column C. And the third form that we have is show in tabular form. Now this is the legacy form and this was created many years ago. As you can see, you can still use it here, but the new compact form for me works the best. Now another feature that we have here is the repeat all item labels. Now let's go into show in outline form first. And if we choose repeat all item labels, what it will do is it will fill in all the gaps that we have here. And this is fantastic if you want to copy and paste this information to analyze it into another sheet. So let's put it in there. And as you can see, we have the information here and we can, we can analyze it. We can just delete the gaps there. And we have it into a, into a tabular format that we can use to make our analysis. And in here, I have the different layouts for you to have a look at. We have the compact, the outline, tabular, and the outline with repeat all item labels. So you can have a look and, and see which format you like.
Now under design and the layout group, we have the blank rows button here. And what it does is it inserts a blank line after each item, or you can remove a blank line after each item. So let's insert a blank line. And as you can see there, we have a little bit more space in our pivot table and it just looks a little bit more presentable. But if you don't like that, you can always switch it off. For all of you old schoolers out there that still like the 2003 version of the pivot tables, well, you can actually bring that to life in Excel 2010 and 2013. Now to do this, you've got to click anywhere in your pivot table right click and go to pivot table options in display choose the classic pivot table layout now this will enable dragging of fields into the grid just like in 2003 and press ok now finally just to make it look like the 2003 version just choose a none in the design layout so we get this view here so there you have it we have our cells here there, so we can drag it and move it out there. We can get our cells month and then drag it all the way in and drop it into there. And it will take you back to 2003. The expand or collapse option allows you to drill down on specific rows or columns, or you can summarize at a higher level. Now this is located next to the item names and you can see there by the minus sign, okay? So if we press on that, we can collapse the individual item and click again, you can expand it. Now there's another way to do that. Just right click anywhere in the item name and go to expand collapse and press collapse or expand. Now, if you want to collapse all the fields, all you have to do is go up to the ribbon, which is under the Options tab, and you have the green plus sign there, which says Expand Entire Field, or the red minus sign, which says Collapse Entire Field. So if you click on there, you collapse all the fields, and then the plus sign, you expand them. Another way is to go into one of the field items, right click in there and go expand collapse and you've got the expand entire field or collapse entire field options. Now the salesperson don't have the minus sign next to them because they're last in the hierarchy as you can see there. But what you can actually do, you can actually expand them so you can bring in more fields to analyze. So we can do that by right clicking anywhere in the salesperson and go to expand collapse and choose expand entire field. Now you get a dialog box. So in here you have all the fields that are not part of the row labels. So you get everything except products and salesperson. So you can bring fields into analyze. So let's bring in our sales quarter and press OK. So as you can see there, each sales quarter has been added into the individual sales person within their products. Okay, so you get all that down there. So you can do some in-depth analysis if you like. And you can bring in more as well. Let's bring right click and bring in the months, expand entire field and choose sales month. And you get that in there. Now, as you can see on the row labels, the sales quarter and the sales month have been added in there automatically. Okay. Now expanding or collapsing is not only for row labels, you can also do it in the column labels. So let's put in our quarters in there. So as you can see, our months are collapsed. So we can click on the box there and expand them, or you can just do it individually into each year. And also you can right click on the last field, which is sales quarter and expand the entire field. We'll get a pop-up box and we can add in there our sales month. So you see sales month is gonna move from row labels to column labels when we press okay. 
Now we can collapse everything. So click in the quarters and press a collapse. Click in the years, collapse. Let's click in the row labels products and collapse. So you have the high level view that you can analyze or you can take a screenshot and send it to your boss. Or if you want, you can actually click on individual items and drill down from there. Now on the right hand side here under options, under the show group, you have the plus or minus buttons. You can uncheck that, but that doesn't mean that you cannot drill down. Well, you can. It just means that the plus or minus signs are not evident. So you can use the expand and collapse buttons even though you don't see the plus or minus signs. There are a few ways to move items within a pivot table. One of them is to click in one of your items, right click and you got the move option there and you can move the ice cubes down. So it moves down one or you can move it to the end and it goes all the way to the end. Now we can bring that back to the top just by highlighting where the box is and you get the four pointy arrows and then bring it all the way to the top. That's another way. Or another way we can bring tonic from the bottom to the top is actually type it in with a keyboard. TO and it gives us the options, tonic and then press enter and that gets moved up there. And the same thing we can do with our salespeople. We can type in the names, we can put in John, press enter and John gets moved up to the top of the list. Or we can bring in Homer to second place and as you can see He's moved in each item there as well. Now, we can do the same thing in the columns. We can bring in 2014 at the start, and then 2013, and then 2012 goes to the end. So there's a couple of ways we can do that. Now we can also move the fields around. One way is to right click, and then it says move, and you've got the products to the right, to the end, or you can actually move the products to the columns area. So let's move it to the end. So as you can see, salespeople have gone up and then the products have gone down a level. But the best way to do it is from the areas here. So you can move this around here, or if you're gonna move it from row labels to the column labels, this is the best way and the quickest way to do it. Now we can also remove just by grabbing it, dragging it all the way back up there. Control Z. Another way is from the drop down box, you've got the remove field. And then finally, we can actually right click anywhere in there and it says the options to remove products. So there's a few ways where you can move and remove fields and items to make your pivot table to your liking. There's a couple of ways to show your field list. If you click in your pivot table, go to options and under show, choose field list. That's one way. Let's uncheck it. Another way is in your pivot table, right click and the last option is show field list. If you want to get rid of your field headers, for example here, row labels and column labels, all you gotta do is go into options and then the last option on the right hand side under show is called field headers. Just uncheck that and you'll see that they go away. Let's create a pivot table. Let's grab our products and put it into our row labels. Salesperson into our row labels. Our sales year into the column labels and our sales into our values area. Whoa, what's happened here? We'll get a can of sales. I'm sure you'll have come across this at least once. Let's have a look in our data table. Look at this. In F2, we have a blank cell. Now Excel treats blank entries as text and therefore chooses to count rather than sum. So what we need to do is go back to our pivot table field list and make some changes. 
in our values area, count of sales, there's a drop down box, click on there and choose value field settings. Now in summarize value field by, we choose sum rather than count and press OK. And there you have it. Our pivot table is being analyzed by sum of sales. There are a couple of ways to format the numbers when creating a pivot table, as the default format is in general format. Now the first way is to go into your values area and in the drop down arrow, choose value fill settings. And on the bottom left hand corner, you have number format. You click on that and you can make your changes from in there. Let's cancel out of that. Another way, you can go into your options tab and in the field settings, click on there, and then the dialog box comes up again, and you can go into the number format and make your changes from there. Now I like the third option, which is click anywhere in the pivot table, right click and choose value field settings, and you get the same dialog box, choose number format, and then in here you can make your changes to a number or currency, you have accounting and time. Depends on what values you're showing. Now we're showing sales. So let's go into currency and we'll put in some dollar signs there. And we'll put negative for minus signs in red and zero decimal places. Press OK and OK. And there you have it. Your numbers have been formatted and it looks much better than it was previously. One annoying feature in pivot tables is that the values fields are named sum of sales or count of sales to distinguish them. Now if you want to just name them total sales or sales, then you can make these changes a couple of ways. In the drop down arrow here, choose value field settings and then in the custom name you have sum of sales you can make the changes in there so we can actually put in there total sales and press ok as you can see the name has changed there but in your data table it hasn't changed there it's remained as sales so what's happened is that it's only changed in your pivot cache and therefore you can only see it in here now say they want to amend that name instead of total sales, we want to put in sales. Press OK. Well, we get an error message. It says here, pivot table field name already exists. Well, that's true because sales is already here. So a workaround is to click just after the S and press the space bar. Now Excel recognizes that as a character and then we can actually use that as a different name and then press OK and you have sales there. Another way we can change the field names is to click in the pivot table and go to options. And because we're in now sales, we get the active field as sales. We can click in there and we can see that the change that we made. And let's click on the column labels sales year. Okay, so we have sales year in there. And we can actually go in there and change it. And let's call it financial year and press the enter key and that changes to financial year and also as you can see the column label name changes into financial year as well so there's a couple of ways to change the field names just to make it to your liking we have our months and our sales in our pivot table and we want to format to include a comma and no decimal places in our values so what we need to do is just right click anywhere in the values and choose number format and then decimal place zero and use the thousand separator so now let's grab our sales again and drop it into our values just so we can analyze something again and look at this our formatting doesn't maintain now i will show you a workaround fix for this let's press ctrl z okay and go back to where we were before. Now what we need to do is go into our pivot table tools and under options, 
in the actions group, select entire pivot table, then select values, press control one to bring in the format cells dialog box. And from in here, you can make your formatting changes. And now when we drop in our sales, again, to make some further analysis, you can see the formatting has been kept. We have our sales region in our row labels and our sum of sales in our values area. Let's grab our sales again and drop it into our values area. Now, let's see what happens as soon as we drop it in there. We we'll get the sum of values field in the column labels. Now that happens because we have more than one metric in our values area. Now let's change this to the count. And all we're gonna do now is grab the values field and move it into the row labels. And you see we have a different view of our metrics there. And we can also grab it and move it to the top. And then we see this different view once again. In this pivot table, our report layout is compact form. Now say we wanna change it into an outline form, but without choosing that option. Now there is a way. Let's go back to showing compact form. Now under options, and on the left-hand side options, in layout and format tab, you have here, when in compact form, indent row labels. So let's move it to the right by 10 characters and press OK. And as you can see, our salespeople have moved to the right, but they're maintained in column A. So we get the feel as if we're using an outline form, but we're actually using a compact form. We can also make changes to the layout of the report filter. Let's go into options and options. And we have here display fields and report filter area. Our default is down then over. And in the drop down box, we can choose over then down. Press OK. And as you can see, our report filter is in one row. Now let's go back and choose down then over and press OK. Now the second option here is report filter fields per column. The default is zero. You can actually change it to whatever amount you like. Now let's choose two per column and press OK. So as you can see here, we have two report filters per column and we have the third one in another column. So say we drop in sales region into our report filter, it'll go into the second column and let's drop in customers into our report filter and it goes into our third column. So there's a couple of ways where you can play around with your report filter. Sometimes you may get error values in your pivot table, like the one shown here with the div or the name. Now we can fix that. Click in our pivot table, go to options and options. Now in the format, there's an option that says for error values, show. Let's tick that and we can put anything in there. We can leave it as a blank and press OK. Or we can put in there a zero and press OK. Or we can write in there error. So let's do that and press OK. As you can see, the changes have been made. Sometimes you come across a pivot table with empty cells, as you can see here. We can actually change that. We can go options and options, and we'll get under format, the four empty cells show. So we tick that box and in there, we can put in there a zero amount, and that fills in our pivot table blank cells with zero. Now, if you're an accountant or an auditor, and you go to your data table, you can see that in April, 
we had no transactions. So something's gone wrong there. So instead of having zero, which in accounting terms can be a credit and a debit summed up, so you can have a minus 10 and a plus 10, and that equals zero. But in this case, we have actually no transactions. So we can go back in there and click under options and options, and we can actually change that. Instead of saying for empty cell show zero, we can say no transactions and press OK. And then you can make sure that there are no transactions in there rather than zero values. One thing that really annoys me within pivot tables is that when you refresh your pivot table, the column widths go back to where they were previously. Now there's a way around this. Under the option tab and options, there's an option at the bottom here that says auto fit column widths on update. So upon refresh, it auto fits it back to where it was previously. Well, let's uncheck this and press OK. And now what we can do, we can move our columns to how we like them. And let's refresh again, right click, refresh, and hey presto, they haven't moved. Now say so that you have a shared workbook that you and your colleague keep updated. Now say you open this shared workbook and you need to refresh the data, you would go into the options and, and refresh. And sometimes you may forget. Now that is usually the case when you're sharing with a colleague. So to avoid the mistake of working with pivot tables that haven't been refreshed, a quick tip is to go into the options tab and under options, choose the data tab and then select the refresh data when opening the file. So next time you open this file, your pivot table will be automatically refreshed. Now to print a pivot table, click anywhere in the pivot table and go to options, select the entire pivot table and then in the page layout, Print area, set print area. And go to the file, and then under print, you can see that it's in there. Now let's go back. Say that you wanted to put in a page break in here, in between the years. We just click in there, and choose breaks, and insert page break. We'll do the same thing for 2014. Now, let's go back and to print. You can see our view here. If we press right, you can see the different pages. But we don't get the titles of the pivot table. Now let's go back again and go in our pivot table, go to options and under options and printing, there's a set print titles option there. Choose that, press OK. We'll go back to our print preview. And you can see that in each page we have the Pivot table titles. We have our sales results from 2012 to 2014 showing for each month. And in our report filters, we have our products and salesperson. And all we can do is show each salesperson's values into separate tabs. Now, to do this, you go onto the options tab and then under Options drop down box, choose show report filter pages. In here, you get a dialog box to choose which of the two report filters you want to show. Let's choose the salesperson and press OK. And then, when we press that, you'll see at the bottom of the tab here that we get the different salespeople's names in there. See that? We get Homer Simpson, Ian Wright, John McAlutis, and Michael Jackson. They show their values for each of the years. We're in Michael Jackson here. Hold down the shift key and go all the way to Homer Simpson. And we grouped our sheets there. We know that because on the top of the page, it shows the group in there. What we can do now, while they're grouped, we can actually make a change into one. And then every one of them will get 
amend it as well. So you can see there, we'll go to there. So you can format each one of them. Okay, now they're still grouped. We can go to the file and print. And in here, because they're grouped, we have the four different salespeople in there. And we can print to PDF. So let's choose your PDF and then press print. We can call it individual sales person reports. Press save and it brings it up in here. We'll go to the second page, third page and fourth page. Okay, let's get out of here. And then make sure when you're back in your pivot table, you right click and ungroup the sheets. So that's a quick way where you can see a report filters items on separate sheets with their filtered results. Now there are different type of subtitles that you can include in your pivot table. You're not only limited to a sum. For example, you can include the count of transactions, the average sales, the maximum amount, the minimum amount, the product, and so on. Let me show you. What you need to do is go into your pivot table field list and into your row labels area. Let's choose products and the drop down and go into field settings. And now we get our subtotals and filters tab. Now it's set at automatic and we can change that. Choose custom. We can click on sum. We can also click on count on average maximum minimum and we have a few other subtotals that we can include there but let's just include these and press ok and look what happens each field item has its own subtotal for 2012 2013 and 2014 and let's scroll down you can see for bottles here we have the sum count average maximum minimum the same thing for ice cubes the same thing for soft drinks and the same thing for tonic. Now a pivot table has all that information summarized in a few rows. And it's fantastic to have if you want to do some quick reports, quick metrics, all in one page. We can summarize value fields by different calculations. Now to do that, we need to go into our pivot table field list and under sales, grab it, drag it and drop it again into the values area and let go. So we get a second calculation called sum of sales with the same results, but we can change that. Instead of sum, we can change that into account. So click on the drop down box and the value field settings and we have summarize values by tab. And in here, we can summarize value field by different types of calculations, as you can see in here. Now there are 11 different types of calculations, and now I'm gonna talk about the count calculation. So let's double click in there, and as you can see here in our values area, we get count of sales, and in our pivot table report, we have our count of sales. So what the count of sales does is it counts all the sales that include text, numbers, and error sales. Now one thing that it doesn't include are blank sales. So watch out for that. If you have any blank sales, then it's not going to count that in there. Now let's check our numbers. So we have 48 transactions in bottles for 2012. So let's go in here. Now I've filtered it by bottles and 2012. So if we go down here and we do our count, we'll get 48. Now let's manually count this, go all the way up. And as you can see here, count, we get 48. Now, if we have any blank cells in there, then it's not going to include that in its total. So let's check that. Let's highlight a few cells and press delete to clear it. So we've cleared four cells in there. Now we'll go back to our pivot table and right click and refresh to update what we've done now. And you see there, 44. Now the count calculation will include all the cells except the blank ones.
The average calculation is like your normal average function. What it does, it takes the totals of all the values and it divides it by the number of values. Now we use the average calculation for sales, for days to complete a project, for overdue days, or for accounts payable, or accounts receivable days. Now, to include the average calculation, we have to grab our sales and drop it into our values area. And in the drop down triangle, choose the value field settings, and then choose the third option, average, and press OK. Now, as you can see here, we have our average values. To customize the numbers, we need to go into our average of sales field and in the value field settings and on the left hand corner, we choose number formats and then we can choose the number, put in zero decimal places and we can use a separator for the thousands and press OK and OK. So as you can see, our results are much neater. So we have our average sales for each of our products and each of our salesperson for their respective years, as well as the grand totals down here. And then we have the average sales from 2012 to 2014, which is $55,667. Now we can also get the average for the order dates. So in our data table, we have our order date in here. So what we can do is grab the order date, and drop it into the values area, and then choose the average from in there, okay? So now what we need to do is to change the format into a date and then press OK and OK again. Let's make this a little bit bigger. So we have the average date that the orders gets placed for bottles, for ice cubes, soft drinks, tonic and so forth. So you can do many things with the average calculation and it's a great metric to use when you're doing your analysis. The maximum calculation gives us the largest value from the values area. The things that you can calculate the maximum function with are sales, quantity units sold, salary, and cash position. Now to get our maximum sales, we need to get the sales and drop it into the values area. Now from the drop down arrow, choose value fill settings and then choose maximum and press OK. So as you can see here, for each product and each salesperson, we have the maximum sales transaction that they made for that year. So Homer had his largest sale as being 96,209. Ian Wright had 99,220. John Michaludis had 98,116 being his largest sale out of all his sales in 2012 for bottles and Michael Jackson had 95,527 as being his largest sale. So obviously in here we have Ian Wright having the largest sale so bottles will have the same amount as Ian Wright. So we can see here that from 2012 to 2014 that the largest sale amount was 99,878. So you can also go in and analyze and see which of the sales person had the highest sale for each particular year and give them a bonus. So the maximum calculation highlight the extreme amounts from your data set and you can do some pretty meaningful analysis from it. The minimum calculation gives us the lowest value from the values area. The things that you can use to calculate a minimum are sales, quantity units sold, salary, and cash position. Now to get the minimum sales amount, what we need to do is grab the sales and drop it into our values area. 
And from the drop down box, choose value fuel settings. And then choose minimum and press OK. In 2012, for bottles, Homer's smallest sale was 10,780. In rides was 20,650. John Michalutis' was 14,378. And Michael Jackson's smallest sale was $17,030 out of all his sales in 2012 for the bottles product. So from this information, you can see who made the smallest sale throughout the three years, and then go to that person and ask them why the sales were low for that period and find out ways you can improve your product. The product function multiplies all the numbers given as arguments and returns a product. For example, let's type in the product function and choose our first number, which is 25, and a comma. So it multiplies 25 by 0.4, press comma, and then it multiplies that result by the number 2. Close brackets, and we get our number 20. So, in our analysis here, we want to know which month has products that were sold with no defects. So I want to know which month had a flawless defect rate. So we're going to show a defective product with the number one and a non-defective product with a blank. Now, we've got a little example here that I can show you. So the first of the first 2012, the day later, and on the 3rd of the 1st, 2012, we had a defect, we had a defect, and we had a defect. Now down here, we have another example with a defect, not a defect, and not a defect. And then the third example, we have three days with no defects. So let's do our product function here. And let's choose these cells. So if we have three defects, and then we get the number one. So obviously our result will be a defect. Now let's copy this formula, right click and paste it in here. So if we have at least one defect and the rest are all non-defects, then we are gonna get a result of a one. So that means that we have at least one defect during that period or that month. So that month, wasn't a good month. We want to have zero defects. So let's copy this formula into our next example and we'll get a zero. So what it says here is that during our three days we had no defects and we get a return of a zero which means a great result for our company. Now let's go to our data table and what I've done is I've included another column here with blanks and ones. So as you go all the way down here, these random numbers, and we have defects and non-defects. So what we're going to do is get our defects from our pivot table and drop it into our values. Now we don't want to count of defects. What we want to do is choose value field settings and go to our product and press OK. So what this has done, it has multiplied all the defects with all the non-defects during that particular month. So if we get a zero, that means we had a flawless month and that's a great result for our company. Now we can check this. Let's go to one of the zeros in here and double click. And as you can see on the defects column here, it's all blank. So we had no defects. This is fantastic for product managers and quality managers because zero defects means a great product and a happy customer. In our example here, we want to find out what percentage of our total transactions are overdue. Now let's go over to our data table. And in here we have our overdue days column, which shows us the number of days elapsed from the customer payment date. So we have here lots of overdue days and also we have 
a comment here which says paid when our customer has paid. So we have a few paid customers and lots of unpaid customers. Okay, so let's go up and go to our pivot table. So let's click in our pivot table here. On the left, we have our financial year. And let's grab our sales and drop it into our values area. And from our drop down, we choose value fuel settings and choose count. So it's going to count all of our transactions. And we have 576. Now let's rename this to instead of count of sales, we'll name it to total transactions. Okay, so let's get our overdue days and drop it in here and choose count numbers. Any customer with a number means that they're overdue. So this is gonna return us the number of overdue customers. Let's press OK. Okay, so we have our numbers here and we can change this to overdue, overdue and press OK. So let's go to our formula. Let's choose our number of overdue transactions, which are in here, and divided by the total transactions in there, and we get 55%. So 55% of our total transactions are past due, which is a bad result. In statistics, the standard deviation shows how much variation from the average exists. So in our graph here on the top, we have our x-axis, which shows the values, and our y-axis, which shows the number of data points. So in our graph here, we have a normal distribution, and our average is right up in the middle. So this indicates a low standard deviation which means the data points tend to be very close to the average and we get this bell-shaped curve, which is steep. An example of this may be the daily high temperature for a coastal city will be less than that of an inland city. Now, high standard deviation will indicate that the data points are spread out over a large range of values, which shows volatility. An example may be in money. So a standard deviation may mean the risk that a price will go up or down. Here, the bell curve is relatively flat. So what we're gonna get is something like a straight line here. Now in Excel, we can also do a standard deviation graph. As you can see at the bottom here, we can represent it by a column graph, and then we can get a, a shape similar to the one shown here if we have a normal distribution. Now, let's create a graph using our data table. We'll go into our data table and insert pivot, and we'll go into our existing worksheet, and let's put it into here, and press OK. So what we're gonna do now is find out the units sold, and group them, and then find out by using the count of units sold, how our data will be distributed. Let's get our units sold and we'll put into our row label. Now, let's group this. Now in our next chapters, we're gonna talk about grouping. Okay, let's right click and click on group. And we have our dialog box that comes up. And we can start at our predetermined minimum level, which gives us as being at 1011 and ends at 79,902. But we can start at any point, let's say zero, and end at 80,000. And increments of 10,000, we'll keep that, and press OK. So we have our groupings in there. Now the next step is to get our units sold again, and drop it into our values area, and we get our count of units sold, which is what we wanted. Now from in here, we can create our graph to see whether we're gonna get our normal distribution or whether it's gonna be volatile and have a flat graph. Now, pivot table here says that 17 transactions lay between zero and 10,000 units sold. 79 transactions are between the 10,000 and 20,000 
units sold mark and so on as you can see here so let's insert a graph go to pivot chart and let's in insert an area graph because this will show much better and press ok let's customize a couple of things let's take out all the field buttons on chart and we can just click on there and get rid of the chart name so let's just put up here and we can click on the axis name and get rid of that so as you can see we have a pretty flat distribution we don't get the bell curve as per our chart on the left here and the reason is our standard deviation is high now let's check that let's create another pivot table go to insert pivot and go to an existing worksheet and we just put it down here okay so now what we're going to do is we're going to grab our unit sold and we'll get our average of all the total units sold now to get that we just click on the drop down box value field settings and get the average now the next thing we can do is again drop in the unit sold now instead of choosing the drop down box we can actually go and fill settings in here and from there we can make our selection so let's can let's get our standard deviation now the p signifies that we're using a whole population so that's true because we're using all of our data we're not just sampling 10 transactions we're using everything now if we're sampling a few transactions we'll use a standard dev so for our purpose we use a standard dev p which means population and press ok okay so now we can get our values here and from column we can move it over to the labels so we can see it much better and then we can format this but one thing we haven't done is the average get the average okay there you go okay so what it says here our average is 44,500 which is around here in the middle point okay and our standard deviation is 20,689 so what it means is you can go either way to the left or right of 44,000 by about 20,000 so we have a high volatility there so therefore as you can see our graph is pretty flat now if our standard deviation was somewhere between 0 and 5,000 then we would have got a graph similar to this let me get my squiggly line and it would have been something like this okay would have been about there and then like that and then over there we've got a normal distribution okay maybe i can format the shape in red so you can see it better so we would have had this if we had a low standard deviation but as we have a high standard deviation we get this graph which is pretty much flat as you can see there and which means that our units sold can vary it can be from 0 to 10,000 or it can be from 70,000 to 80,000 so we have a high volatility there so by using the standard deviation you can see the variation that you get from your average and determine whether your product is volatile or not so it's, it's a pretty great tool to have when you're analyzing your products The variance calculation measures how far a set of numbers are spread out. A small variance indicates the data points tend to be very close to the average. A high variance indicates that the data points are very spread out from the average and from each other. So let's create a pivot table to highlight the variance. So let's insert pivot table and go to our existing worksheet and we can put it in there and press OK. So, in our rows labels, we're going to put in our products and our sales month. And in our values, we're going to drop our units sold. And from the drop down box, we're going to get our average units sold. So we can see where our average is at for each product. Now, let's right click in there so we can format the numbers. And let's use a number with 
no decimal points. Now, the next is we'll get our standard deviation. So let's put in the unit sold again. And then let's choose a standard deviation population and press OK. So we have the one here. And again, we can format our fields in there. And finally, let's get our unit sold for the third time so we can get our variance from the drop down box, belly fuel settings. And let's use the variance P. Variance P means variance population. It means that our data set is a whole data set and we're using all of our population. If we're using a few rows of transactions within all of our population, then we use the variance sample, which is indicated by VAR. So let's format the fields here again. Okay, so as you can see here, we have a very high variance and also a very high standard deviation. Now, if you note in here, we get one value here which is very low. So if we drill down to here, then we'll see that our units sold for ice cubes in June was pretty close to the average. So we test that. Let's get our units sold here and let's see what our average is. Now our average is about 34.739. So let's see our transactions. So our transactions are pretty much around that 34, 40,000 mark. So our variance is, is very, very low. So that's the only, the only value here that we have a pretty low variance or standard deviation. We can actually use this table to highlight months where we've had a low variance and that means that our product sold a consistent amount of units. In chapter 2.1, we created multiple subtotals by going into our road labels and then choosing products, field settings, and then under subtotals and custom, selecting the sum and average. And as you can see in our pivot table, it's shown here under bottles, ice cubes, soft drinks, and tonic. Now, another way we can do this is right click in there and press fill settings and we can change it from in there. Okay, so now the grand total doesn't show us an average or a maximum. It only shows us the sum. So what we want to do is put in there some extra grand total. Now there's a way around this. First of all, we need to go to our data table and in our table, just add another column field named grand total, press enter. And because we're using a table, it's added automatically. So. That's all we need to do. We don't need to add any details in there. We just need the field header. Let's go back to our pivot, right click anywhere in here and press refresh. Now on the right hand side, you'll see that the grand total has been added in there. Now let's grab the grand total and drop it on top of the row labels. Okay, so it's shown up here. So the next thing we need to do is press the space bar and press enter so we get rid of the name in our new blank field we right click and then choose a field settings and in here we can use a custom and we can have sum we can have account average maximum minimum and press ok now as you can see it has gone all the way down here it's added that information at the bottom of the group so what we need to do now is get rid of the grand total, click in the grand total name, right click and choose remove grand total. Now we have our different grand totals summarized by sum, count, average, maximum or minimum for the whole data set. Now 
Now there are a few ways to access the field settings and value field settings. Now let's talk about the field settings first. In our pivot type of field list under row labels, under your first field, in the drop down box, choose field settings and then custom and choose from in there sum or count. Now for this to work, you need to have at least two fields in your row label or in your column label. Now the other way is to choose anywhere in our pivot table and make sure we select one of our items, so ice cubes, right click and then choose field settings and we can add in there. So let's add the average in there. And the third way is to go into our pivot table tools tab under options and field settings and now we're under products and choose that and we can put in there maximum and minimum. Now let's talk about the value field settings. In our pivot table field list, under the values area, drop down box, choose value field settings. And we have it as sum, but we can change that to count and press OK. The other way is to right click anywhere in the pivot table and choose summarize values by. And we can change it from there. Let's choose average. The other option is again, is to right click anywhere in the pivot table and choose value field settings. And then we can choose a maximum. Another way is to go into our pivot table tools tab in the ribbon under options, field settings, choose there. And we can change from there. Let's put minimum. And again, in the options tab under calculations, we have summarize values by, we can click that and we get our different options. And we can click on more options and we can count the numbers. So it depends on what you're more comfortable with. You decide what's best for you. In our example here, we want to find out what bonus you pay per zone and per year based on the channel sales made. And to do that, first let's go to our data table and what we've done is we've included zone numbers, zone one, two, and three. And also we've added a new column called channel sales. So we have our channel sales that pertain to each particular zone for each transaction. So let's create a pivot table, go to insert and pivot table and existing worksheet. And let's choose A1, press OK. So in our pivot table field list, in our row labels, we're going to put in our months and our zones. In the column labels, we're going to drop in our financial year. In our values area, we'll grab our channel sales and our report filter will have our sales quarters. Now, one thing is let's get rid of the grand total. Click in there, right click and then remove grand total. And we want to choose only Q1 example. So we need to do a formula that shows us the sales for 2012, zone 1, 2 and 3, and multiplied by the bonus to be paid in the respective years. Now to do that, we need to have each zone 1, 2 and 3 in each month. Now we don't have that because in February, zone 3 there weren't any sales and in March in zone two, there weren't any sales. And we need to bring that up regardless of any sales being made. Now to do this, we need to click anywhere in the row labels and right click and choose the field settings. Then under layout and print, choose the show items with no data. So if we check that box and press OK, we're going to show the items that don't have any channel sales. And now we can make our formula. Let's put in some product and choose 2012 January. Press comma and then choose the respective bonus to be paid year, which is 2012 for zone one, two and three, close brackets. Now we're gonna move this formula down and we need to make sure that the rows in here are an absolute reference. So number six and number eight should have a dollar sign in front of them. Now, quick tip is to click anywhere in there and press F4 twice, and that makes 
the row six an absolute reference or we can just put in our dollars and press enter so we can move this across so now let's grab this formula and drag it down so we can fill in the february month double click and let's just drag this all the way down and as you can see because of the absolute reference the cell reference doesn't move in there okay and press enter and then we can move that across and double click 2014 with 2014 perfect now let's finish off by dragging down to march double click and grab that up. and then go all the way across okay so we have our three months now let's put in our subtotal and to do that we just need to highlight at the bottom there and press the auto sum and it'll automatically sum it up so let's make this bold and in here we can just put a comma and get rid of the decimal places so now finally let's put in our months we just press the plus or the equal sign and then reference it into cell a5 and press enter and the same thing for february and the same thing for march now let's put in our total name in there plus we can actually reference the filter and then put in the and and then reference the name there bonus to be paid and press enter so we'll have q1 bonus to be paid now let's fix this up a bit and put in a space now to do that we can actually put in a an and in there and then in brackets and have a space so that will give us the space so we have our q1 bonus to be paid right click and make that bold so now we can make this interactive let's choose q2 so everything changes, the months, the title, and our bonus to be paid. And one thing we need to make sure is go into options and then get rid of this auto fit column widths on update. So every time we make an update, these column widths stay the same. So the update being by making a change into our filter selection, Q3. As you can see there, it stayed put. So Q3 gets updated automatically, and then Q4 as well. So here we have uh, an interactive channel bonus to be paid per quarter. We want to show you here the unique occurrences between the channel partners and the products. To show a unique count, between our products and our channel partners, it's impossible to do with a pivot table. But what we need to do is insert a sum product formula in there and then pivot that information to give us our results. So a formula here says to look up in column B and in column C. And by using the sum product formula, it will give us trues and falses. So if we get one true in here and another true in here, then a true and a true equals one anything else is a zero so if we get two matches of the same channel partner and product then that's going to be two trues so obviously that's more than one so if it's more than one then we want to show it by a zero so that means it's not unique if there's only one unique combination then we want to show it as a number one which means a unique combination now let's escape here and as you can see here, the first couple of values, because it's the first time they're being purchased, they're all unique. So they're all depicted by the number one. And if we go all the way down here, and you see Acme purchased soft drinks, well, Acme purchased soft drinks up here. So it's shown as a number one here, because it was the first time it was purchased. And then down here, number zero, because it was the second time it was purchased. So it goes all the way down here, and it does the same thing for each row. Now let's go to our pivot table. And what we've done here is we've put in our 
some of unique combinations in here. And then we've dropped in our products on the left hand side. So in here we can see that, that there are 54 unique customers that purchase bottles. There are 63 unique customers that purchase ice cubes. There are 63 unique customers that purchase soft drinks. And there are 57 unique customers that purchase tonic. Now to see which customers are part of this number, then we can just grab the channel partners here and drop it into the row labels and we'll get our list here. So we get all our list of unique customers that purchased the products. The percentage of grand total calculation displays values as a percentage of the grand total of all the values or data points in the reports. So what it means is that each individual data point in here will show as a percentage of this grand total here highlighted in a red border of $32 million. So to include the percentage of grand total we need to activate our field list, right click and show field list. Now let's grab our sales and drop it into our values area. And in the drop down arrow, value field settings and choose show values as. And in the drop down box, choose percentage of grand total. Now let's change our name to percentage of grand total total and press enter. So we have our percentages in here, as you can see. So each individual percentage will sum up to 100%. So our filled items here sum to 8.26%, which is up there. And if we sum across the columns at 7.32 and that's confirmed in there. So if we sum the 26%, 25, 25 and 23, that equals to 100%. And if we go down here and sum these three amounts, then that equals to 100% as well. So each value item is divided by the grand total to give us the percentage of grand total calculation. The percentage of column total calculation displays all the values in each column as a percentage of the total for that column. So we have our years in our columns here, 2012 to 2014. And in the bottom, we have our grand totals and they're highlighted in a red border. So each individual field item here will be a percentage of its grand total. So what we're going to get is our proportion of sales for each sales rep in each quarter in 2012, in 2013 and in 2014 respective to their totals. So to include the percentage of column total calculation, we click in our pivot table and grab our sales and drop it into our values area. From there, drop down arrow, we choose value field settings, and then we show values as, and from the drop down, we choose percentage of column total. And then we rename this to percentage of column total, and press enter. So as you can see here, we have the percentages that make up each column total. So we can check this. If we highlight the 2012 Homer Simpson sales, they add up to 25.49%, which is up here. So if we hold down our control key, and then with our mouse button, choose each subtotal, they should equal to 100%. As you can see here, 100%. And we have here 100%. And the same thing is done for our 2013 and 2014 numbers. The 
percentage of row total displays the value in each row as a percentage of the total for the row. So everything here highlighted in red will be 100%. And we are going to get the percentages over the three years for each sales rep and each quarter. Now to include our percentage of row total, we click in our pivot table. And in our pivot table field list, we'll grab our sales and drop it into our values area. From the drop down arrow, we choose value fuel settings. And in show values as, we select the drop down box and choose percentage of row total. And we can change the name here to percentage of row total and press OK. We can see that we have 100% in each of our rows and in our individual rows, if we hold down the control key and choose 2012, 2013 and 2014 for Homer Simpson, we get 100%, which is correct here. So we can see the proportion of sales that have occurred over three years. And the same thing can be broken down into Q1 for each respective sales rep. So let's get Homer Simpson again and press down the control key and choose 2013 and choose 2014. And again, we get 100%. The percentage of calculation displays the value of one item, which is also called the base field, as a percentage of another item, also called the base item. Now to put this into an example, we want to find out the change of sales from year on year. So we want to see the change in 2003 versus 2012 and also the change in 2014 versus 2013. So to do that, we click in our pivot table and we grab our sales and drop it into our values area. And from the drop down arrow, choose value fuel settings and show values as in the drop down box, we choose the percentage of calculation. And in the base item, we choose previous and the base field we choose financial year. So the way to read this is we're showing values as the percentage of the previous financial year. So percentage of previous financial year and press OK. And now we have our percentages. Now obviously 2012 doesn't have a previous year, so it will always be 100%. And if we look at 2013 here, for Homer Simpson's subtotal, we can see that in 2013, it was 112% of the 2012 value. And in 2014, it was 90% of the 2013 value. So from 2.9 million, it went down to 2.7 million, and that's correct. And you can also see here in the grand totals, in 2013, we had an increase of 6.06%. So from 10.3 million to 11 million. And in 2014, our sales reduced to 96.73% from 2013. Or you could say it was a drop of 3.3%. So one minus 96.73%. Now let's do another example. And here we have our sales regions over the three years. And we want to compare our sales to the African sales. So we're comparing the American sales to the African sales, and then we're going to compare the Asian sales to the African sales, and also the European sales to the African sales. Now to do that, we click in our pivot table and we'll grab our sales and drop it into our values area. From the drop down arrow, go to value fuel settings, show value as percentage of. And what we're gonna do now is we have our sales region as our base field, and we want to put our base item 
as Africa. So we're going to show the percentage of African sales. Press OK. So obviously African sales will be 100% always. So what it says here in 2012 is that Americas is 94% of the African sales and Asia is 96% of the African sales and Europe is slightly higher than the African sales for 2012. We have the same calculations for 2013 and then 2014. And we can also put in here products and we can compare that to one particular product being your best product and see how the other products relate to it. The percentage of parent row total is a new calculation in Excel 2010. It shows us an item's percentage based on its parent's subtotal. So the calculation is the value for the row item divided by the value for the parent total row item. So in here, for Homer Simpson in Q1, what it will give us is the percentage of 776 into 2.2. Six million dollars, and then we'll do the same for Q2, Q3, and Q4. So to give us a percentage of 100% here, which is the total of its parent total, which is 2.6 million dollars. Now, to do this, we grab our sales and drop it into our values area from the drop down arrow, choose the value field settings, and under show values as tab. In the drop down, we choose percentage of parent row total and press OK. So, as you can see here, Q1 is 29% of the total, Q2 for Homer Simpson is 24% of the total, Q3 is 22% of its total, and Q4 is 23.6% of its parent total. So, if we sum all this up you can see it's 100 percent and also the homer simpson subtotal and the subsequent salesperson's subtotal if we sum those up by holding on the control key they too will equal its parent total which is the grand total which is 100 percent as you can see here 100 percent the same calculation is done in 2013 and 2014. Now let's go on to another example. So all we have now is our years and our months in our row labels. Let's scroll down to see that. And we want to get the percentage of each month into the parent total, which is 2012. And in here it will be 2013 and 2014. So once again, Let's grab our sales, drop it into our values area, and let's choose our percentage of parent row total and press OK. So here we have our percentages. So once again, January sales are 7% of the whole 2012 sales, February sales are 8% of the whole 2012 sales, and so forth. Now let's check by highlighting all of 2012 and that should equal to 100% of the parent row total which is 10.3 million. Now this is a great feature and once again it's new in Excel 2010 and you should give it a try. The percentage of parent column total shows an item's percentage based on its parent's subtotal. So the calculation is value for the column item divided by the value for the parent total column item. So in our pivot table, we have our sales reps and in our columns, we have, let's show our field list. So in our columns, we have our sales quarter on the top and then at the bottom, we have our sales years and we have our subtotal for each quarter. So the percentage of parent total column will give us the percentage for Homer Simpson in Q1 based on its parent column total, which is 2.3 million. 
and so on for Ian Wright, John McAlutis, and Michael Jackson. And this will happen in Q1. It will also happen in Q2, in Q3, and then in Q4. So let's put in our parent column total. So to do that, we we'll grab our sales and drop it into our values area. From the drop down arrow, we choose a value fuel settings. And in show values as, we select the percentage of parent column total and press OK. So as you can see, we have Homer Simpson, 33%. Let's hold down the control key and press the 2013 amount and then also the 2014 and that equals to 100%. So we have 100% of Homer's parent column total, which is 2.3 million. And the same thing happens for the rest of the sales reps. And if we go on to Q2, let's grab Homer's again for 2012, 2013, and 2014, and that's 100% of its parent column subtotal for Q2. And then for Q3 and Q4, the same calculation. The percentage of parent total calculation shows a sales percentage based on its chosen parent's base field item total. So the calculation is value for the item divided by the value for the parent item of the selected base field. Now to include the calculation of percentage of parent total, we click in the pivot table and right click so we can show our field list. And in here, we can see that in the row labels, we have products, salesperson, and sales quarter. So our selected base field will be the products. Now let's grab our sales and drop it into our values. And from there, drop down arrow, choose value field settings. And in show values as, from the drop down arrow, we choose percentage of parent total. Now from in here, we have to choose a base field. Now our parent base field is products because it's right on top. So we have to choose products. And before we do anything, let's rename this to percentage of, we can call it parent total or we can call it product total. We can say parent and put here product so we can distinguish it and press OK. So here we have the values. So if we highlight Homer Simpson's values for bottles, they equal to 25.19%, which is the sum here. So all these, we hold down the control key. Now all these different sales reps totals will equal to 100%. As you can see that 100%, which is the 2.7 million. And the same thing happens for ice cubes. So let's highlight it. And that will equal to 100%. So it's 100% of 10.4 million. And for the soft drinks, we have 100% of 2.6 million. And finally, for tonic, again, that should be 100% of the $2.5 million of sales. And the same thing, let's scroll up, and the same thing happens for 2013 and 2014. The difference from calculation calculates a difference of one item from another item. So what we're going to do here is get our months and see the difference between one month and its previous month. And we're going to also do another calculation where we see the difference between one month and the corresponding month from the previous year. So let's click on our pivot table and we'll go into our sales and drop it into our values area. And from the drop down arrow, we choose value fuel settings and show values as and the drop down arrow we choose difference from our base field will be the sales month 
because we're comparing sales months and the base item will be previous so the previous month so the way to read this is the difference from the previous sales month now let's change the name here to call it diff from previous month and press OK. In our pivot table, we have the difference from the previous month. So the 96,000 is the difference between January and February. And then you see from February to March, we have a drop of 83,000. Now let's format the numbers here. So we can right click and number format. We can go to number, no decimal places, a thousand separator, and then we'll put in the red for any negative values. It just stands out better. You can see that, that's much better. Now let's do our another calculation. We'll put in our sales and we'll get the difference from the previous year. So again, the drop down arrow, show value as, choose difference from and now we're going to get the financial year and previous so we're going to get the difference from the previous financial year and press ok and in here again we can format the numbers so what it says here is comparing January 2013 with January 2012 so the difference is 100,000 increment. And then it's getting February 2013 and comparing it to February 2012, and that's a $42,000 increment. As you can see in 2012, it's all blank because there's no sales in 2011. So it starts in 2013. And then in 2014, it compares the January 2014 amount to the January 2013 amount. Okay, let's go into our second pivot table example. And now we have our sales person on our row labels and our years. So what we want to do now is compare our sales to one sales person. So we're going to compare Homer Simpson. So to do that, we'll grab the sales, drop it into our values area. Drop down box, value fuel settings, show values as, then choose difference from. And we choose a salesperson, and our salesperson will be Homer Simpson. So we're going to see the difference that each salesperson has on Homer Simpson. And press OK. And let's format the numbers and press OK. So what it says here is that in right in 2012 had $26,000 more sales than Homer Simpson. John Michaelides had 80,000 less sales than Homer Simpson and Michael Jackson had 148,000 less sales than Homer Simpson. So the same thing in 2013, it's comparing in right 2013 to Homer Simpson 2013. John Michael Lutus 2013 to Homer Simpson 2013 and Michael Jackson 2013 to Homer Simpson 2013 and the same thing for 2014. Just like in chapter 3.8 where we had the dollar difference from calculation, now we have the percentage difference from calculation. So what this is it calculates the percentage difference of one item from another item. So in our example, we're going to get the percentage difference of one month to its previous month. And then we're going to get the percentage difference from one year's month to its corresponding previous year's month. Now, let's click in our pivot table and in our sales we grab the sales and drop it into our values area from the drop down arrow we choose value fuel settings and under show values as tab we choose the percentage difference from calculation and then we 
have the base field as sales month and then the base item as previous. So this reads as percentage difference from the previous sales month. And let's get the, let's change the name to percentage diff from previous month. And press OK. And we can format the numbers by going on to custom and choosing in here. And then we just put in a percentage at the end of this. So if it's a positive number, it'll be in black. If it's a negative number, it'll be in red and press OK. So we have the percentage difference from the previous month, which means that there was a 12% increment from January 2012 to February 2012. And then in March, we had a 10% drop from its previous month. Now let's put in our new calculation, drop in our sales value there, and then we can choose the percentage difference from. And now we're going to calculate the percentage difference from the previous year. So we choose financial year in our base field and our base item is previous. So this reads as percentage difference from the previous financial year. And then press OK. And in here we can, can format the numbers. And because we had our formatting done before, we can go to our last option and choose that. So this says that in January 2013, we had a 13% increase from January 2012. And then in February 2013, we had a 5% increase from February 2012, and then so on. Okay, let's go on to our next example. So we want to calculate the percentage difference from the sales of Homer Simpson. So to do that, we'll grab our sales and drop it into our values area. We choose value for settings, show values as, and then percentage difference from. And we have salesperson as a base field. And then we're comparing our sales just to Homer Simpson. And then press OK. And then we can format the numbers again. We go to custom all the way to the end. We have a previous selection. So what it says here is that Ian Wright had uh, had 1% more sales than Homer Simpson in 2012. John McLeaders had 3% drop in sales compared to Homer Simpson. And Michael Jackson had 6% drop in sales compared to Homer Simpson. And the same thing is analyzed in 2013 and also in 2014. The running total in calculation displays the value for successive items in the base field as a running total. So what that means is it will show you your year to date values. So what it will do is it will sum January and February and put it in here. Then it will sum the February year to date total with March and then put it into the next column. And then it will sum the March year to date amount with April and then all the way to the bottom where it will end up having the total amount for 2012, which is $10.3 million. So let's go and put in this calculation. We'll grab our sales and drop it into our values area. From the drop down arrow, we choose value field settings and under show values as, we choose the running total in. Now we have to choose the base field and because we are doing the running total in for the months, we keep it selected as sales month. And then we can change the name here to year to date and then press OK. So in our pivot table, we have January as 771,000. Now February is 1.6 million, which is the sum of Jan and Feb, as you can see there, 1.63 million. In March, we have 2.4 million, which is the sum of January, February, March, 2.4 million. 
and so on and so on. So in December, we're gonna end up with 10.3 million, which is our total for 2012. Now in 2013, again, it starts from January, it adds February, and then it adds March and April and so on to end up at 11 million, which is a total for 2013. And the same thing happens in 2014. Now this calculation is fantastic to have because it shows you your annual sales on any given month. In chapter 3.10, we had the running total in, and now we have the percentage running total in, which calculates the values as a percentage for successive items in the base field that are displayed as a running total. So here we're gonna get our year-to-date percentage. So we're gonna see here the proportion of the January sales to 2012, and then we're gonna move on to see the February year-to-date sales as a proportion to its total 2012 sales. Then we're gonna see the March year-to-date sales as a proportion to its total of 2012, and then so on until we reach 100% in December. Now to add this calculation, we click on our pivot table, and then we grab our sales and drop it into our values area. From the drop down arrow, we choose a value fill settings. And then under show values as, we choose the running total in percentage. And in the base field, we have to choose the sales month because it's the field where we're going to get our running total in from. And we'll press OK. So what we've got now is January, which is 7% of the 2012 sales of 10.3 million. And in February, it shows here the February year-to-date sales as a portion of 2012. And in March, we have the March year-to-date proportion of 2012 sales. And then it goes on and it increments each month until we reach 100%. So we can see here that in June, for the first six months, we had achieved 48% of our total 2012 sales. Now if we move on to 2013, the same thing happens. So we have our January proportion on 2013. Then it adds the February sales to give us the February year to date sales proportion on 2013, and then so on until we reach 100%. So we can see that in June for the first six months, we achieved about 51% of the total 2013 sales. And in 2014, the same thing happens. And as you can see, you can do a lot of great analysis to see how your sales are tracking on a year-to-date basis. And you can also compare it to the previous year's running total in percentages. The rank smallest to largest calculation displays a rank of selected values in a specific field, listing the smallest item in the field as one and each larger value with a higher rank value. Now in our pivot table, we have our sales people in our row labels and our dates on the column labels. So what we're gonna get is a number one value for the lowest sales in 2012 and a number four value for the highest sales in 2012. And the same thing will happen in 2013 and 2014. So to do this, let's grab our sales and drop it into our values area. From the drop down arrow, we choose the value field settings. In show values as, in the drop down arrow, we go all the way down and choose the rank smallest to largest option. And in the base field, we're gonna choose which field we want to rank. Now we want to rank the salespeople, so we choose the salesperson. And in the custom name, we can change the name to rank small to large. And then press OK. So we get here number one being the lowest value of 2.4 million. And then the second lowest is 2.5 million. 
the third lowest is 2.6 million and the largest is 2.67 million for Ian Wright. Now if we go to 2013, we have a ranking for that year as well. And 2014, we have a ranking just for that particular year as well. So you can quickly see here that Michael Jackson in each of the three years has the lowest rank. And you can go and, and find out why he sales are the lowest amongst his peers. The rank largest to smallest displays a rank of selected values in a specific field, listing the largest item in the field as one and each smaller value with a higher rank value. In our pivot table, we have our months in our row labels and our years in our column labels. And what we're going to get is a ranking value in each of the years and where one will be the highest sales and 12 being the lowest sales because we have 12 months. So to do this, let's go into our pivot table field list. We'll grab our sales and drop it into our values area. From the drop down arrow, we choose value field settings. And then under show values as, we go to the drop down arrow and all the way down and choose rank largest to smallest. And in our base field, we have to choose which field we're going to rank. Now we have our months in our row labels, so we're gonna rank our sales month. And finally, let's change the custom name to rank large to small and press OK. Okay, so we have in 2012, number one being July with $1.05 million dollars and the lowest being January at $771,000. So you can quickly see which items are ranked highest and which items are ranked lowest. Now in 2013, we can see that December had the highest sales and November had the lowest sales. And in 2014, we can see that January had the larger sales and August had the lower sales. You can see there's a big variance in each of the years. There's no consistency in the values. So you can make some quick analysis with these numbers of rank largest to smallest. The index calculation shows us the relative importance of a cell within a column. So in our example, we have our products on the row labels and our regions on the column labels. So the index will show us how important a product is to its region. The higher the number, the more important that product is to that region. Now to show you an example, let's grab our pivot table by clicking in the top left hand corner and pressing Ctrl and C in your keyboard. And then in here, we can right click and paste everything in there. So let's go on to our pivot table field list and grab our sales and drop it into our values area. From the drop down arrow, we go to value field settings and choose show values as. And in the drop down box, we go all the way to the end and choose index. And we can change the name to index and press OK. So now let's get rid of the sum of sales just so we can have the index values. Now finally, right click and format the numbers and we can put in two decimal places and press OK. So now we have our index on the bottom and our sales on the top. So for the bottles, you can see that America's has the highest amount compared to its other regions. So what that means is that if there was a price change in the bottles product, then Americas will have the biggest effect because they have the higher index amount. Now we can see this, that Americas has the largest sales all across the regions and also in its column grand total. So it calculates it 
based on the row total and grand total and also the the grand total which we have in the bottom right hand corner now let's calculate this we have the calculation here of how the index is calculated so let's grab the value in sales in our example we choose the americans bottles so press plus and we can reference americas and then multiply by the grand total of grand total so it's the 32 million there and press enter so we have our amount there now next let's grab our grand row total grand total here and multiply by the grand column total which is the 7.9 and press ok and finally l4 divided by l6 which gives us 1.1 which you can see there and the same calculation happens for each of the other values within the regions and the products and they're all depicted here and the grand total will obviously be one so we see for ice cubes that that the african region has the most important value in soft drinks we have europe and in tonic we have asia so any price change in those products then the biggest effect will be in the regions which have the higher index. Now there are a few ways to get the show values as dialog box. In our tutorials, we've been using the pivot table field list and going from the drop down box and value field settings and show values as. Now the other way is once you're in the pivot table, so anywhere in here, you can just right click and choose show values as, and you can choose one of the calculations here. Now let's choose percentage of grand total. And you can see that changes for all the cells. Now the other way is to go on to the options tab in the ribbon and under calculations, you have the show values as so you can change it from there and finally you can go into the field settings and you can make your change from in here so you've got a few different ways where you can show values as option in the pivot tables in chapter 8 we created a pair now where we use calculated items to see the difference between the revenue and the cogs which gave us the gross profit and then also the difference between the gross profit and the expenses that gave us the calculated item called operating profit now what we want to do is use the PL types to determine what percentage of revenue they have now under row labels drop down box we have the PL type chosen there and we have our different PL types and want to see what percentage of revenue is associated with COGS, gross profit, expenses, and operating profit. Now let's cancel to get out of that. To do this, we click in our pivot table, and then from the sum of actual dollars, we choose the value fuel settings, and then under show values as, from the drop down arrow here, we choose the percentage of option there. Now for the base field, we we'll need the PL type and the base item will be revenue because we're going to show you the values as a percentage of the revenue for each PL type. Now let's press OK. Now the items within the PL type will not get a percentage allocation and that's fine. We can see that in each of the totals we have our percentages in there. Now to get rid of this, all we've got to do is just click on the minus button and we'll get rid of that and we can do the same thing for the revenue. So now we have a quick snapshot that shows that, for example, in 2012, COGS is 2.5% of revenue, gross profit is 97.4% of revenue, and if we add gross profit and COGS, that'll give us 100%, as you can see in our total there, which is correct. And then expenses accounts for 
nearly 36% of the revenue, and our operating profit is at 61.58% in 2012. Now you can see the same calculations are done for 2013 and 2014. So this is a quick way to show your margins for your P&L. In our data set, we've added another column called status. And in here we have the actual and the planned status stages. So for each transaction, we have an actual and also a plan. Now we have the order dates here, and this can be also transaction dates, or they can be sale dates. But what we're interested in is the actual and plan. So what we're gonna do now is create a pivot table where we show the actual versus the plan for our products. And then we're gonna create a variance report to see whether we have met our plan or not. Now to do this, let's go to our pivot here. And in the pivot table here, we're gonna add in the following items. On the row labels, we're gonna add in the financial year and the products. In the column label, we're gonna put in the status. So as you can see, we have the actual and plan status. And in the values area, we're gonna put in there our sales. So we'll grab that and drop it in there. Now let's go in here and just change the number format by going to value fuel settings and then choosing a number format. And we'll do a number with a thousand separator and no decimal points and then press OK twice. And in here we can just center it like this. So we have the actual and plan for our products for 2012, 2013 and 2014. And now we're gonna add in another column here to get the variance between the actual and plan. And also we're gonna add another column that's gonna show the percentage variance. So to do this, let's click back into our pivot table and grab the sales and drop it again into the values area. From the drop down box, we choose value fuel settings. And under show values as, we choose the difference from. Now, the base field is gonna be the status because we wanna see the difference between actual and plan. And the base item is gonna be the plan. So it's gonna be the difference from the plan. Now, let's press OK. And as you can see, we have the difference here. Now let's make a few cosmetic changes. Let's go back in here and value fuel settings. We can change the name. Instead of summer sales two, we can change it to dollar variance. And then number format, we can go into number, separator, no decimals, and we choose the red font for the negatives and press OK and then OK. The next thing is let's drop in our sales so we can get the percentage difference from the actual versus the plan. Drop it in there. Drop down box, value field settings, show values as, drop down box, percentage difference from. The base field again will be status and the difference from will be the plan. So we get the percentage difference from the plan. Let's change the name in here and call it percentage variance. And the number format, we can go to custom and then let's choose in here one of these. Now to make it a percentage, just go next to the semicolon and press the percentage. And then for the red, it'll be at the end, a percentage. So if it's red, it'll be negative percentage. And if it's positive, it'll show in a black color. Press OK and then OK. Now finally, we have the plan here. Now the difference between the plan and the plan is zero. So that's all we get no values there, but we can get rid of that. We just click in there, right click and hide. The same thing for column G, right click and hide. Now finally, we can go back into our pivot table and then right click and show the field list. Now we can also drop in some more fields in here. Let's drop in our sales region into the row labels. And as they're being included in there, we can see that our calculation has also picked up the sales region. So you can add in as many fields as you want. The calculations are gonna to extend to those fields as well. So there you have a, a quick report where you can see the difference between the actual versus the plan on a dollar basis and also on a percentage basis.
In our example here, we have our order date in our row labels. And as you can see in our pivot table, if we scroll down all the way, we have lots of order dates ranging from 2012, 2013, and 2014. So it goes all the way up to row 259. Now, say we want to group these dates, we can do that. All we're going to do is just click anywhere in the pivot table, right click, and choose group. And we get the grouping dialog box. Now, in the first part, in the top part, we have the starting at date, which is automatically added in, which is our first date, the 3rd of the 1st, 2012. And the ending date is the 1st of the 1st, 2015. In here, by, we can group by seconds, minutes, hours, days, months, quarters, and years. What we're going to choose is days. Now, let's click on months so we can uncheck that. So we have checked on days. And now we get the number of days here. We get the scroll box and we can choose the number of days to group by. And let's group it by seven days or a week. And then we'll press OK. So we can see here that our information is grouped by seven days, started from the third or the first, and going all the way down to the first of the first, 2015. We can drop in our sales, and then what it will do is group those sales that fall between each of the ranges. So for example, the 3rd of January 2012 to the 9th of January 2012, it will sum up the sales that fall between those ranges. And we'll do the same thing for all the grouped dates. So let's grab our sales and drop it into our values area. And you can see there we have our sales. And let's scroll all the way down. And you can see that as well. Okay. Now we can also drop in the sales again. Instead of using sum of sales, by choosing the drop down box, we we'll go to value fuel settings and we can count. So we can we can see the number of transactions that happen between those group dates and press OK. So we have the different transactions as well. So now you can go in and do some meaningful analysis with your data. We have our order date in our row labels and now we want to group by months. To do that, we click anywhere in our pivot table, right click and choose the group option and we'll get our grouping dialog box. Now we need to choose months, which is already selected. We know that because it's in blue. If we click again, that means it's deselected. So let's click on that again to activate it and press OK. So we have the 12 different months where our orders have been grouped into. And we can analyze the sales that relate to those different months. Now we grab our sales and drop it into our values area. And we can see the different sales that pertain to each month. Now just make a note that our data ranges from 2012 to 2014. So that's three years of data that's grouped into each month. So if you send this report to your boss, then you're gonna make a note that this information includes three years of data, so it's not just one year. Now to avoid confusion, you can just right click again in the row labels and choose group. Now we can also select the years. So just click on the years. Now it's in blue, so now months and years are selected and press okay. So we can see here that it's broken down into each year. So when you send this report to your boss, then you won't have any issues. Now say they want to group our order dates by quarters and years, well we can easily do that. In our row labels we have our order date. So let's go into our pivot table and right click and choose group. We get our grouping dialog box. Now in the starting and ending dates, we can leave that as selected automatically. In by, we're going to choose quarters and years. So quarters, years, and unselect months. 
So let's press OK. And we can see that the quarters and the years are depicted in our pivot table. Now on the right hand side, make a note that the years has been added in our pivot table field list in here. So what that means is that a new field has been created in the pivot cache called years. Now this has not been added into the original data set. So if we go in here, you are not going to see a field list called years. Now all we can do is grab the sales and drop it into our values area to analyze the different sales that occurred in the order dates that have been grouped by quarters and years. Now the years field that has been newly created, we can actually move that if you want from the row labels to the column labels just by dragging and dropping. And you can see we can analyze the information in a different view. We can actually group by sales ranges and then get our sum of sales that belong in our ranges that we depict. And also we can get the number of transactions that belong to the ranges that we choose. So to do this, we'll grab our sales and we'll drop it into our row labels. So we have all of our sales that have occurred starting from $10,000 and $14 all the way to our maximum sales, which was 99,878. So we can go up again. Now in our pivot table, we right click and choose group. And we get the grouping dialog box, the starting being the minimum value that we see there, and the ending being the maximum value that we saw before. The buy means the amount that we want to group our sales by. Now we have 10,000 in there. So let's leave it as that and press OK. As you can see, our sales are grouped by $10,000 increments all the way down there. And now we can do some further analysis. So let's grab our sales and drop it into our values area. And from in here, we can choose the sum of sales and press OK. So what it says here is that between the sales ranges of 10,014 and 20,013, we had total sales of $1,011,401. Now we can check that, we can just double click in there, and we can see our sales ranges in there are between what we've chosen before, from 10,000 all the way to the 20,000 amount. Now press Ctrl Z and go back. Further, we can see the number of transactions that occurred between each of the sales groups. We can grab the sales again and drop it into our values area and we get the count of sales. So we had 67 transactions between our sales ranges 10,014 to 20,013 and then 57 transactions between our sales ranges 20,014 and 30,013 and so on. So we have our total number of transactions being 576 and our total sales being $32,064,332. Now if you want to round these groups, then you can just right click again, go to grouping. Now instead of starting at 10,014, we can start at 10,000 and we can end at, we can say 100 thousand and the increments we can leave at 10,000 and press OK. So we have our groupings which look a little bit better and then our sales and our number of transactions. We can actually group our data by text fields. In our row labels we have our sales region. So say that we want to create some new regions. Now we want West, including Americas, East, including Asia, and Central, including Africa and Europe. So let's start off with the Central. Let's click on Africa and then hold the control button in our keyboard and choose Europe. So we have Africa and Europe and we want to name that into our new group. 
or into a new region called Central. Right click and choose Group. So Africa and Europe are included into Group 1. Now we can actually change the name of Group 1. We can call that Central. Americas, we can call that West. And Asia, we can rename that to East. So we have renamed our regions. Now on the right hand side, you'll notice that we have a new field list that's been created called Sales Regions 2. This is created in our pivot cache and not in our original data set. Now let's rename this by clicking on the drop down arrow, go to Field Settings, and instead of Sales Region 2, we can call it New Regions and press OK. So let's change there. Now, what we can do, we can also drag this newly created group from the row labels to the column labels, just like this. And on the top here, we can see that our newly created region called Central includes Africa and Europe, which is correct. Our West region includes Americas, and our East region includes Asia. So we've added a new column in our data source called Time of Sale, where it shows us the time that each sale was made throughout the day. And the format is in a 24-hour time format. And what we want to do is find out at which time of the day we have the most sales and which time of the day we have the least sales. So let's go on to our pivot table. And what we need to do is grab the time of sale field and drop it into our row labels. So you can see we have our different times that the sales were made. And now what we need to do is right click in our pivot table choose group and we get the grouping dialog box with the starting time and the ending time being the minimum and the maximum time in our data source and what we need to do is choose hours deselect months and press ok so now we have the different hours grouped and finally we need to grab our sales and drop it into our values area so we can see now that the sales that we've made throughout the different times of the day. So during 1 a.m. we had 1.1 million of sales, during 9 a.m. we had 4.1 million of sales, and so on. So you can see here that at 11 p.m. that's where we have our most sales. Now with grouping, there are a couple of things to know. If you have numeric or date fields, then all you need to do is just click on one of the cells and then right click and press group and you can group like that. Another way is to go to the options tab and you have under group, your group and ungroup options. So you can group from there. And the third way is to go to the group field. And what this says is you can only group numeric or date fields. And you can also group from there. Now, if we put in there text, for example, sales month, and we try to click and right click in one cell and try to group, we get an error message. You cannot group that selection. Press OK. You need at least two items selected to activate the grouping in a text field. So now we can group and we can start grouping from there. Now to ungroup, we got to select the group heading, right click, and then ungroup, or we could do the same thing from the options tab and the ungroup selection there. So let's group again, right click, group, and by pressing Control Z on your keyboard, you can ungroup. So we want to analyze our sales on a biannual basis. So 
we want to see the first half of the year and also the second half of the year. Now we can group this. We can click in our pivot table and select January to June, right click and group. So we have group one and we can call the first half and then to group the second half, we just click on our items there, July to December, right click and group again. And we have the name group two, we can change that to call it the second half. So now we've created our two groups and on the right here, we have our new field called sales month two and that's in the pivot cache. So we can get rid of the sales month in there. So we've got the first half and second half. Now let's put it in our sales in our values area to see our results. And also what we can do now is put in our financial year and drop it into our row labels. And we can see our results from 2012 to 2014 on a biannual basis. Now you can also do this if you had customer names. For example, if you had over 100 customers and you wanted to group them into groups of customer names, starting from A to K and also from L to Z. So you can have two groups of customers and you can analyze their sales over the years. When you're grouping dates, it automatically takes the first date in your source data and groups it starting from that date. Now that date could be a Tuesday, it could be a Sunday, it could be anything. But say you want to actually start on a Monday. Now we can change that when we go into our grouping selection. So first of all, we need to find out what our first date is. So we have the third of the first, which is our first date. Now by doing the formula weekday, weekday, it returns a number from one to seven, which identifies the day of the week of a date. Now number one is Sunday. So let's choose the third of the first. So if one's a Sunday, two is a Monday, three is a Tuesday. So we can find out that three is a Tuesday. Another way to find out what day fell on the 3rd of January, we can actually go into our calendar and click in 2012. And in there, we can choose the 3rd of January 2012, which was a Tuesday. So we want to group it on a date starting on Monday. So let's do this, which is the second. Right click anywhere in your pivot table and choose group. Now in the grouping dialog box, we have this automatically starting at the first date, but we're gonna change this, we're gonna override it. I wanna put the, the second, okay? So we want the grouping to start on a Monday and we want to group it by days and then we can put in there seven, so a whole week and press okay. So that's a good tip to know if you want to group dates starting on a Monday. If you want to isolate dates and do further analysis for your reporting or auditing purposes, then you can certainly group those dates depending on which ranges you're looking for. So just an example, click in our pivot table, right click and group. So we have our data from 2012 all the way to the end of 2014. And say we want to just look at the first six months of 2013. So we're gonna have the starting date being the first of the first 2013 and the end date being the 30th of June, 2013. And then we want to group by months and then press okay. So. You can see now that anything before the first of the first 2013 is grouped into one amount here, the 10.3 million, and anything after the 30th of June 2013 is grouped into another amount here, which shows 16.6 .6 million. And then you have the six months isolated in there. You can do your analysis by double clicking and seeing your transactions from there and then press Ctrl Z and delete to go back. Or you can 
if you want click on any transaction after the 30th of June 2013 double click on that and that will give you all the transactions that occurred after that date control Z to go back so you have a lot of flexibility when you're grouping dates in a pivot table In Excel, you can group by a calendar year and also a calendar quarter. Say you want to group by a fiscal year or a fiscal quarter. Now that's a little bit difficult and you need to create some formulas and put that in your data source. And from there you can create your grouping in your pivot table. Now, a fiscal year, for example, in Australia starts in July and ends in June. In other countries, it starts in October and it ends in September. And you can also have situations where the fiscal year starts in April and ends in March. So I have an example here of some dates from July all the way to June. So this is a typical fiscal year that starts in July and ends in June. So what we need to do is do a formula where it gives us the year and then it adds on to that a one if the month is equal to or more than seven. And if it's less than seven, then it will return a zero amount for the month. So let's do an example to show this in here. We can do an equal or a plus sign and let's put in year and let's get our example date there and put in brackets so that will give us the amount 2012 and then let's add in here in brackets month and choose the same date and what we're saying here if it's bigger than or equal to seven close brackets then it'll give us a amount of one so 2012 plus one is 2013 so any dates from july to december will give us a 2013 value which means the fiscal year 2013 and if we drag all the way down it'll be 2013 all the way to december so our fiscal year is 2013 now once we drag into january well our fiscal year is 2013 because it's counting 2013 and then it's adding a zero because it doesn't meet the criteria of equal to or bigger than seven and let's drag all the way down here so we have our fiscal year of 2013 which is correct for a july to june calendar and now we can do the same thing for the fiscal quarter so in here we're going to use the choose and month functions so what we're going to say here is it's going to return us a value for the month so for first of july 2012 it'll return us a value of seventh so what it means here it'll choose from these amounts here that we've depicted it'll choose the seventh value so one two three four five six seven so the seventh value is a one so that means quarter one so that's how this formula works so let's put it in here so choose the month number from our date here close brackets and then return the value from our predetermined values that we've entered here for a july to june fiscal year so this number three means that january is three february is three march is three april is four may is four june is four july is one august is one september is one october is two november is two December is two. So the seventh value in here is a one. So it will return us a one. And then we can just drag all the way down and we can see we have our fiscal quarters in here. So now we can grab this formula here, control copy, and then go into our data table where we've put in another column called fiscal year and we can paste it in here and then we can move the 
cell references to the order date and then press enter and it automatically fills all the way down and it gives us our fiscal years. Okay, let's go back and grab our formula in here instead of writing it again. And let's go to our data table, our fiscal quarter, control V, and then let's reference it to the order and again enter. So it returns our values. So let's update our pivot table and then do the grouping based on the fiscal years and quarters. So first we need to refresh the pivot table. So we can right click in there and press refresh, which will give us our fiscal years and fiscal quarters. Let's grab them and put them in our row labels and let's put them in our row labels again, our fiscal quarters and our sales we can drop into the values area. So now you can see we have our fiscal years and our fiscal quarter. So uh, a new year was created 2015 and the Q1 and Q2 quarters there. So this is a great tool to use if you're not using a calendar year for your accounting or company purposes. Now what I've done also is I've created a fiscal index where I've got the July to June fiscal years and October to September fiscal years with the different formulas in there for you to copy and paste into your workbooks. And also for April, I've done the same thing. I've changed the formulas. So you have the different formulas to use depending on what fiscal year your company is using. Let's try and group our order dates by right clicking and pressing group. Well, we get an error message. Cannot group that selection. Now, when you get that, it means that your data source has some error values in your dates. So you may have some NA values in there when you've imported your data, or you may have some dates that are not entered incorrectly. For example, you may have month 13, or you may have a date number 31 in February. Now we can check that. We can go into our data table and into our order that we can select everything and press Control G, which is the go to special, or you can go under find and select and go to special from there. Now let's select constants and we want to find out any errors or any text, okay? So if we have any dates with 31st of February, then that reads it as a text. Let's only select text and errors and press okay. So it's made a selection, we cannot see it, but it's in there. Well, now we're scrolling down, we can see that. Now let's highlight that in yellow and it's also highlighted our text up there. That's fine. Now let's filter by color. So it gives us all our text or our error values. So in here, we can make our changes, highlight all this. Again, we can go to Control G, go to Special and Visible Cells Only. And if they all have the same order dates, we can just put in 28th of the second. 2012 hold down the control key and press enter and that will fill in the selection and then for the na if that's an error then you can delete everything or you can go back and find out what the date is and now let's for our purpose we can just put in 14th of the second 2012 now we can go back to our pivot table what we need to do first is unselect the order date and then what we need to do is refresh our pivot table. So right click, refresh. So that updates the pivot cache with the new information. And then we need to put back in the order date into our row labels. And from in there, right click and group. So now we can do our grouping. Okay, I want to group our order dates in two weeks and then I want to do another pivot table and then group it into months and quarters. So let's group this into 
weeks of seven and press OK. So we have that. So what I'm going to do now is go to options and select entire pivot table, control copy, and in here, control V to paste it. And now what I want to do is group this into months and quarters and press OK. Well, see what happens. The first pivot table gets updated as well. That's because we're using one pivot cache. Now that's annoying, but there is a workaround. Let's press Control Z to go back. What I need to do is grab this and then cut it and paste it into another workbook. Let's go to File, New, Blank Workbook, and then in here, right click and paste, okay? So in here, I can group it into the way that I want, into months and quarters, and then I can select everything, Control X, I can go down into my book where I was previously, and in here, right click, and paste. So now we have two separate pivot caches and we can group each individual pivot table independently. So if I go in here and say group again by months, quarters and years, well, that happens and then this doesn't change. Now there's another way we can do this. We can go to our data table and what we need to do is bring up the old pivot wizard by pressing Alt D P and then what we need to do is press next and then that chooses our whole table and then that's fine press next and then we want to put this pivot table into our new worksheet and press finish so in here let's put our order date and then, then let's put our sales and then we can group this by days and put seven and press ok now let's go back to our data source and then press Alt D P again to create another pivot cache and then press next. It selects it, press next. Okay, now we get a message here. It says your new report will use less memory if you base on your existing report, which was created from the same source data. Do you want your new report to be based on the same data as your existing report? Well, no, we don't want that. We want a new pivot cache. So we press no here. If you click no, the two reports will be separate. That's what we want. Press no and go into our existing worksheet, sheet one, and we can place it there and press finish. So in here we can do the order date and sales, and then we can group, right click in there, and group by months, quarters, and years. So there you have it, two ways where you can group pivot tables coming from the same data source independently. We've grouped our sales here by increments of 10,000. And we have our sum of sales here that show the results per group. And so we take this out and then we want to drop in the sales again, what happens? We get a count of sales. That's because once you group sales, then it reads that as text. So it automatically shows us a count of sales. To fix this, all we're gonna do is right click and ungroup the sales. And then if we drop in our sales once again, then we get some of sales. We've got our order dates here and we want to group these. So right click anywhere in there and press group. And then we choose days of seven and press okay. So this is grouped by seven days. But as you can see here, there's data missing. So from the 16th of the first, it goes to the 24th of the first. Now I wanna show all the group dates, even if they don't have any transactions in there. So let's right click in there once again and go to fill settings and under layout and print, Let's choose the show items with no data and press OK. So it shows all the weeks here, even if they don't have any information in there. Now finally, we can go to the Options tab and Options 
and for empty cells, show zero and press OK. We have our PL report that we created in Chapter 8 using calculated items. What we did there is get the difference between the revenue and COGS to give us the calculated item called gross profit and then get the difference between the gross profit and the expenses to give us the calculated item called operating profit. And here we have the P&Ls for 2012, 2013 and 2014 with our sales here. And now what we're going to do is drop in our months into our column labels and then group those to get the quarterly reports and from there get the difference between the previous quarter. Now let's get our month and drop it into our column labels and let's escape from there. So we have our months on there. Now to group these into quarters, you just got to highlight the months that you want to put into quarters and then right click and group. And where it says here group one, we can actually change that and call it quarter one. The same thing for April, May and June. Right click, group and call it quarter two. Now, depending on which part of the world you are, each quarter will be different. Now, in Australia, the Q1 starts in July, but in America, it starts in January. Now, let's continue here. Right click, group, and call it quarter three. And then finally, let's put in there quarter four. Okay, so we've done that. Now let's right click and show the field list. As you can see here that we have the month two field that's been added here, which shows our grouped months. Now let's click in the drop down arrow and choose field setting. And let's change the name here. Instead of month two, let's call it quarter and press OK. So you see that's changed there and also in our pivot table field list. Okay, now we want to drop in our actual sales into the values area and do a calculation to get the difference from the previous quarter. Now, if we grab the sales and drop into the values area, we'll get this warning here. It says multiple data fields of the same field are not supported when a pivot table report has calculated items. So because we have calculated items here for gross profit and operating profit, we cannot drag it in there, but there's a workaround for that. Let's get out of this. Now what we can do is click in here, go to the options and select entire pivot table. Press control copy in your keyboard and down here let's paste it by pressing control V. Okay, so what we can do now is just group these into the quarter just by clicking into the minus box there. Well, a quick way is to go to the options once we have selected that area and go to the minimize entire field. Now let's highlight this and double click between the columns just to center them. And then we can press the center twice there. Okay, so we have our quarters. Now what we can do is right click to show our field list again. And now from in here, from the drop down box, We'll go to value field settings and show values as. We choose the difference from. Now the base field will be the newly created quarter field. And the base item will be previous. So we're showing the difference from the previous quarter. And finally, in the custom name, let's call it variance per quarter. And then the number format, we can just keep it as currency and the negative font there and press OK. And now OK. And we can see here that we have the variance. Obviously Q1 will be zero because there's no previous quarter to compare it to. And we have the Q2 difference from Q1, the Q3 difference from Q2, and the Q4 difference from Q3. Now we can just go up here and we can see and compare this to the top chart there. Okay, let's click in there, options, and we can just minimize that. Okay, so we have the actual values there and we also have the differences at the bottom. So that's a quick workaround when you have 
calculated items within your pivot table. Now I'll show you another example where we're going to include the variances between the quarters. So to do that, we're going to use a pivot table that doesn't have a calculated item in there. So let's go to our new workbook here. Okay, so in here, we don't have the calculated item for the gross profit and the operating profit. So to drop in the variance, just get the actual dollars again, and then drop down box, we can go again and choose the difference from. The base field will be the quarter and base item will be previous. So the difference from the previous quarter, and then in here, we're gonna pull variance per quarter. And then number format, we can just put in the currency and we'll use the dollar and the negative red font and press OK and then OK. Let's close down the field list and we can see in here, let's just make this a little bit better to see. Okay, so the variance, first variance we don't have, so we can get rid of that. Click on the column C, right click and hide. And here you can see the variance per each quarter, the Q2 versus the Q1 variance, the Q3 versus the Q2 variance, and the Q4 versus the Q3 variance. So with the grouping and show values as calculation, you can do some pretty good analytical pivot tables for your clients. We have our data set here with the bank balance date and the actual bank balance for each date. Now we have each transactional date up until all the way 2014, 31st of the 12th. So let's go back up again here. And what we want to do is we want to show the minimum and maximum bank balances for each month in each particular year. Now let's go to our pivot table here and click in our pivot table. Now to do this, we have to grab our bank balance date and put it into our row labels. And from in here, just choose any of the items in there and right click and press group. And we're gonna group it into the months and years. Now the starting and ending point is automatically entered in there and we just leave it like that and we press OK. So we have our months and years for 2012, 2013, and 2014. As you can see here in the row labels, the years field has been created now that we've grouped our bank balance dates and also it's been created here in the field list. The next step is to drop the bank balance into the values and get the minimum and the maximum amounts. So grab the bank balance, drop into the values. From the drop down arrow, choose value field settings. And in the summarize values by, we choose the minimum. And in here, we can just leave a minimum or bank balance. That's fine. And the number format, we can go to number and we can just put a separator and use the negative red font there and press OK. Now, we'll do the same thing for the maximum. So get the bank balance, drop it into the values area, drop down arrow, value field settings, and do the maximum this time round. And number format, again, we choose the same. And press OK, and then OK. So we can see that for January 2012, the minimum bank balance for the whole month was at minus 8,306 and the maximum bank balance during the month of January reached to 9,662. Now let's go to our data table just to confirm that. And from the drop down arrow, we can choose in here only 2012, January, and press OK. And from in here, we can see that the minimum amount was 8,306 and the maximum amount was 9,662. Go back in here, that matches. Now let's get out of the pivot table field list. Another thing that we can do is put in a graph in there so we can see how the movements have tracked over the months and the years. Now click in the pivot table, go to options and choose pivot chart 
and just put in a line chart in here and press OK. Now let's expand this to make it a little bit bigger. Now from in here, right click and let's hide all the fuel buttons on chart because we don't want that because it clogs up the screen. And in here, we can change the color, right click and then choose the red in here. And from in here, right click and we can choose a dark blue color there. So we can see here that the minimum bank balance for each of the months throughout 2012 and 2014 is around 10,000. So it doesn't go below the 10,000 mark. And also the maximum bank balance for the years was trending about the 10,000 mark. So in this situation, your bank overdraft limit will be around the 10,000 mark. But as you can see, there's not much margin that you can play with. So by grouping the transactional dates and also showing the values by a minimum and maximum, you can do some in-depth reporting and graphical representation of your data. And it's not only limited to bank balances. This can also be a situation where you have sales, units sold, or the amount of time you took to repair a product. There are a few ways where you can sort your pivot table. One of them is to go to your pivot table field list. And in here, you just click and you get the drop down arrow. And you have your sort options there. The other way is to go to the options tab in the ribbon and under sort and filter, you have your sorting from there, A to Z or smallest to largest, Z to A, largest to smallest. And then you have your more sort options in there. And another way is within the pivot table, right click and you have your sort in there. And you can also go into your values and then you can sort from there as well. So let's use the ribbon to sort. So we want to sort by largest to smallest. Now, when you create a pivot table, it automatically puts the row labels into alphabetical order. So say we want to put it from Z to A, we can click there and all the values change. And A to Z, it goes back to where it was. Now, if you want to change the values, we've got to click in the values area there. And then say we want smallest to largest, we click A to Z. If you want to say largest to smallest, we click Z to A and the respective items change as well. Now, if you want to do the same thing for the subtotals, we've got to click in the subtotals area and we can show smallest to largest and then largest to smallest. If you want to sort an item row from left to right, then we can certainly do this. For example, tonic, we have our values from 2012 to 2014, and we want to show the highest value first, and then on the right, going on to the lowest value. Now to do this, you're gonna click into the values area, right click and sort, choose more sort options, and we want to show the largest to smallest. And then in the sort direction, it's left to right. So in our summary, it says sort financial year by sum of sales in descending order using values in this row, tonic. And press OK. And we'll see that tonic has the highest value. And then on the right, it goes all the way to the lowest value and the years change there as well and also the other items have been moved accordingly based on the 2013 totals so you can certainly sort from left to right as well as top to bottom there are a few ways where you can sort manually in a pivot table one of them is to click in your row labels and on the border, 
you get your four pointy arrow and then click your mouse and you can move it up or down and you can see the bar there so you can move it all the way up like that so that's one way another way is that you can actually write in the items that are in the row label so say we want to move tonic from the bottom to the top well we just write in to and then he knows that we're going to type in tonic and then press enter so it moves tonic to the top and the same thing in here anywhere we can put in there you can say okay soft SLF and then it automatically puts it in there now if you make a mistake in there instead of putting ice and then pressing delete and enter you'll overwrite the item that you had there so just make sure you don't make that mistake press ctrl z to go back and finally we can right click in the item and then we have the move option there so we're going to move bottles to the beginning up down or to the end and it just depends on which position it's at we can make those moves so if we go to bottles right click obviously we can only move that down or to the end so there's a few different ways where you can manually move around your pivot table item list We have our data on the left here sorted alphabetically but sometimes you want to create a custom list you want to have for example Americas first and second you may want to put in Europe Asia then Africa so you want to set up a list where every time you refresh a pivot table then Americas is first all the time now we can do this first let's create our list the way we want to see it every time we update our pivot table so we want americas let's copy and put it in here and then let's put in europe then asia and then africa okay so that's the format where we want to see our pivot table each time we sort it from a to z now what we need to do to activate this is we need to go to file in our ribbon go under options on the left hand side in the excel options dialog box on the left hand side we choose advanced and then we scroll all the way down and under general there's an edit custom list option there now we click on that and now we can create our new list let's go into this box here so we can choose our newly created custom list highlight and then press import so you can see there it's been imported now you can also see that the custom list that have been created by excel for the dates and the months and we have our custom list here all we need to do now is press ok and then again ok twice to activate this we need to refresh our pivot table so right click anywhere in our pivot table refresh and you can see that americas is first europe is second asia is third and africa is last now if this wasn't in that order you can right click sort a to z and it will put into that order if your custom list doesn't work when you refresh and then sort from a to z and then you need to go to another place to activate it right click sort and more sort options and then on the bottom left hand corner click again more sort options and if your custom list didn't work that means that this was unchecked okay so make sure that the auto sort is always checked so next time you refresh then your custom list will be as per the way that you created it so you can create many lists for regions for products for salespeople whatever you like it's a great way to get a custom list on your pivot tables where you can analyze as per your company's preferences
We've added a new column here called managers where we'll put in a manager's name. For example, Jan, April, Adam and Scott. Now Jan is a name as well as a month. It's short for Janine, for example. April as well is a woman's name. And a nice one added. So when we put this in our pivot table, it'll sort by month names because it'll think that the manager's names are months because of Jan and April. Now let's have a look at this. Let's go to the pivot table. We can right click and refresh. Now the managers, we can drop it into our row labels. As you can see there, Jan is first, then April, then you get Adam, and then you get Scott. So it's not in the correct order. Now to override this, you got to right click in the pivot table, go on to pivot table options, and under totals and filters, the last option under sorting says use custom list when sorting. And then we've got to uncheck that, okay? And then press okay. And as you can see, that has been updated. So we'll have Adam first, April second, Jan third, and Scott last on our list. Now we have our regions and months in our row labels and our sales in our values area. Now what we want to do is sort the sales from highest to lowest and then sort the regions alphabetically. And to do this, we click in our sales, right click and sort largest to smallest. Okay, and we have the largest to smallest values for Africa, for Asia, for Europe, and for Americas. And now we want to put the regions into alphabetical order. We can right click, sort. There's two ways to do this. We can actually sort from A to Z, or we can go to the more sort options, and under the ascending, a to Z, we can choose the sales region and press OK. So we have Africa, Americas, Asia, and Europe in alphabetical order. And we also have the sales in descending order as well. We have our products on our row labels here. And want to add in a new product and then refresh it and see where it goes on our pivot table. So let's go in to our data source and add a new product called Cider. So we need to add this in our table. Let's go to the end of the table by pressing Control and down. And let's click out of here. And from the corner, we can just drag and add a row. Let's highlight the row and press Control D to copy down or whatever is directly above. Now what we need to do is we'll keep the same information. The only thing we're going to change is the product. So from tonic to cider and press enter. Let's go to our pivot table, right click and refresh. And as you can see cider has been added to the end of the list. Now we need to update that. To do this all we're going to do is just right click anywhere in the pivot table, sort and sort A to Z, and then we have our product list sorted alphabetically. Now we know that our pivot table is sorted by the arrow pointing down in our filter here. Now we can clear that by going to more sort options and then selecting the manual option there. If we press OK, then the sort has been cleared. We have our months going across the column in the pivot table, and we can actually sort by the grand total. If we click in there and right click, choose sort, and then sort largest to smallest. In our pivot table, on the left in the row labels, we have the order dates and we have our sum of sales in the values area. Now the order dates range from 2012 all the way down to 2014. So we have three years of data in there. Now we can filter that 
data. If we go to the row labels drop down arrow and then under date filters we have all these filters here. Now the date filters option is only available when your row labels or column labels have dates in there. So let's have a look at the different filters that we have. We have the equals, before, after and between. So let's choose between and we get this dialog box and we can choose a date here by clicking the calendar and today being the 5th of March so we can go back and say December 1st to today and then press OK. So you can see everything has been filtered there for our selection. Now we can clear that by clicking there and press the clear filter from order date. Now the next date filter, we've got some virtual filters here. For example, tomorrow, today, yesterday, next week, this week, last week, next month, this month, last month, next quarter, this quarter, last quarter, next year, this year, and last year. Now these are virtual filters. So what that means is when you put that filter and you open your Excel workbook next week, then those filters will get updated based on the date that you open your Excel workbook. So it's a live filter. Now let's click on tomorrow and have a look if there's anything in there. Well, there's nothing in there in our selection. And that's okay, that's normal, it can happen. Now if I open this file in a month's time and then I choose tomorrow, then I may have an order date there. So let's go back there and we can choose today. Well, I have no order date values for today and today is the 5th of March and we can go to date filters for yesterday and again I don't have any order dates there as well. Now if I come back there in a couple of weeks time and I do the same filter then I may have an order date in there so don't freak out if you don't have any values in there. Okay let's have a look at next week. So next week I have two order dates there and another thing that you can do here is instead of order dates, they can actually be due dates when the customer is going to pay you. So you can have this filter and then every week you can just open this workbook and the pivot table will get refreshed and then it will have the next week's dates. So that's a great advantage of having these virtual filters. Another thing we need to point out is that the weeks in Excel start from Sunday to Saturday. So if we have a look here in our calendar, so next week will start on Sunday the 9th of March and finish the 15th of March. So as we can see here, the 9th of March, that's correct. So it includes the 9th of March into the next week's order dates. Let's go to another one. Let's go have a look at this week. We just have one order date there. Let's go to last week and we have a few order dates there. We can go to next month, this month, last month, next quarter, this quarter, and last quarter. Now obviously this quarter ending in March, well last quarter will start in October and end in December. Now let's go to some more date filters. We're going to have a look at this here. So it has all our values there for 2014. And you can also go back to last year and have a look all the order dates for last year. So I have all these order dates down there. Now, another option here is year to date. So only show us the order dates that have started from the 1st of January, 2014 up until today's date, which is the 5th of March, 2014. So you can see there, this is year to date. And then another option we have here is all dates in this period. So what this means is it will get all the order dates they relate to Q1 for our data set. Our data set being 2012, 2013, and 2014. 
and see that all Q1 for 2012, for 2013, and 2014. Now the same thing for the other quarters. We can also go for the months. So to take all the February order dates for 2012, 2013, and 2014. Now we have the custom filter. So if we click on there from this drop down box, we can choose the different filters equal, does not equal, is before, is before or equal to, is after, is after or equal to, is between, or is not between. So you can choose one of these in here and you can apply a different filter that you like and press OK and it will come up there. So you have an array of filters which you can use and you can do your analysis. And the great feature about this is that when you do a virtual date filter, that the next time you open your workbook, then your data gets updated automatically based on that given date. And you can do some great reporting like due dates for payments and also for project management, you can have your due dates for your different milestones. So go ahead and spend some time on this. It's a great feature. In our pivot table, we have our sales months in our row labels and our sales in our values area. Now we can filter by labels, which means that we can filter by any text. So as our sales months are text, then we can filter by that. Now you can also drop in their products if you like. You can also put in their countries. And also if you had employee names, you can also apply a labels filter. So to filter by labels, we click in our row labels and we get the label filters there. And we have these 14 different filters. So let's choose equals. Now, if you're going to choose this option, then you got to make sure that the full name is entered in there. You can't just put in there a letter or a couple of letters. So we're going to put in there it equals January and press OK and we'll get that filter there. Now you can clear by pressing this clear filter there. Okay, let's go to the next one. Does not equal. We can put it does not equal July and get the rest of the items there. Now we can go to begins with. Now in here, you can put in a single letter. So we can say it begins with A and press OK and we get the months of April and August. Now we can say it does not begin with A and we get the rest of the months there. We can say ends with and put in there ER and press OK. And it'll give us the months that end in ER. So we've got September, October, November, and December. Now, once again, we can go does not end with and put ER, and we get the other months. And finally, we can say contains. Now in here, you can put in there letters as well. So let's enter the letter E and press OK. And it'll give us all the months that contain the letter E. and does not contain E, and then it will give us the rest of the months. So there's plenty of combinations there that you can do, and it's not only limited to months. You can apply it to products, countries, employee names, whatever text fields. If you have a column field that has a numerical and alphabetical sequence, then you can filter that by labels. Now, in our example, we have item numbers with three numbers followed by three letters. Now, that can actually be a product number or a serial number, or it can even be number plates. Now, let's go to our pivot, and we have our item number here on our row labels and our sales in our values area. Now, let's press on our drop down arrow and then choose a label filters. And we can filter by greater than. And in here, we can put in an amount, for example, 110 AAA. And we get all the values that are bigger than that. And you see there, you can go all the way down. Okay. 
Now we can clear the filter by pressing clear filter from item numbers. Now we can activate the label filter once again by going greater than or equal to. And in here we can put 110ZZZ and press OK. So it includes the 110ZZZ. We can say less than 110AAA and press OK. And we have all those there. And we can say less than or equal to 110ZZZ and press OK. So it includes the 110ZZZ item in there. And finally, we have the between and not between filters. So we'll say between, we can say 104 and 107 without putting any letters. So if it's 104, it includes 104A, AA, ABC, all the way to the top. And then if we say 107, well, it's only going to include 107. It's not going to include 107A or anything above that. So let's put it in there 104 to 107, and you'll see that. And there you have the results. And not between, well, let's put in there once again, 104 and 107, and we'll get the rest of the results. So there are certainly a few filters there that you can use when you have fields that include numerical and alphabetical sequences. In our pivot table, we have our order dates on the row labels going all the way down, and then we have our sum of sales in our values area. Now we can filter by values simply by going into the row labels drop down arrow and then choosing value filters. And in here, you have nine different ways that you can filter your values by. We have equals, does not equal, greater than, greater than or equal to, less than, less than or equal to, between, not between, and top 10. Now, let's choose the equals. In this filter, you will use it when you want to drill down and find only one value. Put in 24640 and press OK. So here we get two different order dates that have the sum of sales that equals to 24640. Now, let's go on to another value filter. We can simply go in here and choose does not equal to. Now you would want to use this when you don't want to include a certain sale amount. So you can put in here does not equal to 24640 and press OK. So it give you all the other amounts that do not include 24640. So again, let's go to our next value filter and we have the greater than. Now in here, you want to focus on a certain sales level. For example, if you want to look at the sum of sales that are more than $500,000. So let's put in there $500,000 thousand dollars and press OK and what you're going to get now are all the sum of sales that are above the five hundred thousand dollar mark now if you want to drill down and see what makes up these sales then you can just double click in there and you get a whole list of the amounts that make up those sales now to go back press ctrl Z and delete and you go back to your pivot table now you can also do the greater than or equal to if you want to make it equal to that amount and also be greater than. Now we can go on to our next filter which is less than and click on that. And again, in here you want to focus on a certain sales level. So once again, let's put in our example of less than $500,000 and press OK and we'll get all these different sales values that are less than 500,000. Now go back to our values filter and we can also put in the less than or equal to amount. The other filter that we have there is the between filter. Now in here you want to drill down on a certain range of values. So you can say between 100,000 and 200,000 and press OK. And you have all these sum of sales that are between that range. 
Let's go back and choose not between. And again, let's put in 100,000 and 200,000. So it's not going to include any values from 100 to 200,000. So what it will include is anything less than 100,000 and anything more than 200,000 and press OK, and you have all these values there. So there are a few filters there that you can use where you can drill down and analyze your financial data in a quick and easy way. In our data set, we've added a new column called Channel Partners. And in here we have 125 different channel partners. Now, what we've done is we've gone to our pivot table and refreshed, and we've put in the channel partners in our row labels and our sales in our values area. And what we want to do now is get our top 10 channel partners so we can see which are the best performing. Now, what we have to do is click on the drop down in the row labels and choose value filters. And the last option is top 10. Click on that. And you get this dialog box that comes up that says show top. Now you can also choose the bottom if you would like, but we'll do the top 10 for now. And then in here gives us a default number, which is 10, but you can go down or you can go up and you can also manually put in there the numbers, but we'll choose top 10 for now. And then we're going to analyze by items now and we're going to use the sum of sales so that's how we're going to choose and then press ok and now we get the top 10 channel partners from our data set and finally we can also sort this from highest to lowest just click anywhere in the sum of sales right click sort largest to smallest choose that and we see that abc telecom is the best performing channel partner and then you have the other nine best performing channel partners from 2012 to 2014. Now you can also do this analysis if you had lots of customers or if you had lots of salespeople or lots of products. So it's not only limited to channel partners, there's many different ways where you can use the top or bottom items filter. top or bottom percent filter gives us a list based on a percentage of items that make up the sum of sales. Now in our pivot table we have our channel partners here which is a new column that we've added in and we have our sum of sales. Now what we need to do is go to the row labels drop down arrow and choose value filters and then the last option top 10 we choose the top 10 percent Okay, and then instead of 10, we're going to choose the 25%. We can scroll up or down, or we can write in there manually. And let's press OK, and we get our list here, all the way down there, and we get our grand total as well. Now we can sort this from highest to lowest, click anyway in the values, right click, and then sort largest to smallest, and we have that there. So now we have our list of channel partners that make up at least the top 25% of sales. We can go and see the bottom 25% list by going on to the value filters, top 10, and show bottom, okay? And then press okay. And we have our list there. And we can sort from smallest to highest, sort from smallest to highest. And with this analysis, you can drill down to your best and worst performing channel partners, customers, salespeople, or products, and take the appropriate action needed. The top or bottom sum filter will give us the channel partners that make up a certain amount of sales. For example, we're going to get the top channel partners that account for $2 million of sales. Now to do this, we click in our row labels filter and choose the value filters and top 10. And in here, instead of 10, we put in 2 million. 
and then from the drop down box we choose sum and press OK. So now we have the top channel partners that account for 2 million of sales. And we can also sort this from highest to lowest. Right click, choose sort and sort largest to smallest. Conversely, we can choose the bottom channel partners that account for 2 million of sales. Let's go in the filter and choose top 10 again. And from show, we use bottom and press OK. And here we have our list of the bottom performing channel partners that account for 2 million of sales. And we can sort these from smallest to highest. Right click in the values, sort smallest to largest. This analysis can also be done on customers, on products, on item numbers, on any given metrics that your company is looking for. A report filter is used if you want to show a high level summary with multiple combinations of fields. In our pivot table, we have put in the salesperson, customer products, sales region and sales month in our report filter. And you can see in our pivot table, it's shown up here on the top left hand corner. Now we can choose the drop down and select one item and press OK. And you can see here Homer Simpson is selected. Or we can go to another one, to products, and select another item, soft drinks. And we can go to sales month and select January. Now our results are shown in here with our grand total. So it's a good way where you can drill down and analyze certain specific items within your data. Now to go back, you just click in there and choose all. Or you can press Ctrl Z if you like, and it'll go back to where it was before. Now we can also select multiple items. Now click down on our filter there and choose from the bottom left hand corner, select multiple items. So that activates it. And now we can select and deselect the all button. Okay. When it's not selected, we can choose individual items like this and press OK. Let's go to products and again select multiple items. And you can also deselect and keep the active items selected that way. Now press OK. And in sales month, we can also choose a couple of months, say Jan, Feb and March, and then press OK. And we have our results down here. Now let's press Ctrl Z to go back. OK. Another thing that we can do is use the search box up here. But first of all, to activate the search box for all the items here, we're going to select multiple items. So say we want to put in O, so any items that have the letter O will be selected. And let's add this in there. Okay. Next one to the products, select multiple fields. And then we can choose in there IC. You see IC has ice cubes and tonic has the letters IC. And let's choose that. And then sales month, again, activate the multiple items. And we can choose ER. And it gives us the months that end in ER. And then press OK. Now to add more items in our selection, what we can do is go into our report filter and start typing here. J and you get the option here to add current selection to the filter that's already there before with the ER. So what we can do is if we choose this box, then January, June and July will be added to the months that end with ER and press OK. And then let's check that and we can see Jan, June, July has been added with September, October, November, December. And this is a very powerful feature to have. Excel is smart enough and if 90% of your fields are text, then you'll get a label filter. If 90% of your fields are dates, then you'll get a date filter. And if 90% of your fields are values, then you get a value filter. 
Now, a quick way to activate the filter is to go to your pivot table field list, and then you get this hover box, and from the drop down arrow, you can choose your label filters, value filters, and search box filters. And then you can click on your channel partners, and also from in here, you can choose your filters. Another way is to go into your pivot table, right click anywhere in there, and then go to filter, and then you've got your three filters there. You've got your top 10 filter, you've got your label filters and value filters. Now if you click in your label filters, you will get the 14 different options there. And then if you click on the value filters, then you will get your eight different options there. And the third way is to choose your row labels and from in there, you can choose your label filters and value filters. Now, if your row labels don't have the drop down arrow, then you can go to options and the field headers would be off. So you just need to select that. So there are a few ways where you can activate your filters. You can quickly select items by going onto the pivot table and then with the mouse, highlighting your selection, right clicking and in the filter option, choose keep only selected items. So January to June has been selected and we can see this by going to the row labels filter that January to June are selected there. Now we can press control Z to go back and now we can also hide our selection by going onto the filter and choosing hide selected items. So now only July to December are shown, as you can see there as well. So it's a quick way where you can select and keep or hide your items. A text wildcard allows us to filter by many different combinations. An asterisk will return any series of characters before or after the asterisk. A question mark will return text that contains only one variable. Now let's go to our pivot table filter in our row label and choose label filters. Choose begins with. So in here, what we're going to do is put begins with GLO and an asterisk. So Anything that comes after the letters GLO will be included in our filter. So let's press OK and you can see we get Globex Corporation, we get Globo Gym American Corporation and we get Globo Chem. And you can see here in blue we have the GLO and the asterisk includes all these letters after GLO. Now let's go back and clear this filter. And we can go in and use another label filter that contains. So anything before the word tech will be included because we've put the asterisk before the word tech. And press OK and we get any tech and prima tech. And you can see here from our example. And let's go to another label filter and we can put equals. And now we're going to put asterisk, ink, and asterisk. So that means that it includes the word ink. So asterisk, ink, and asterisk. And press OK. And we get here our results. And you can see there, everything in blue has been included. So any items that have the word ink are shown in here. Now let's go on to another filter and put in contains and now we're going to use the question mark filter so in here we're going to say a question mark and c so the question mark means any one variable so it could be a b c it could be a r c or it could be a a space and c so the question mark means any variable and press ok and we'll get our results here in blue here we get abc telecom we get Monarch Playing Card Company because he has the IRC R uh, being the variable. In Sombra Corporation, the space between A and C is the question mark. And Spade and Archer, 
Well, the R is their question mark. So you get different combinations based on the question mark. Now also you can do this in the search box. So in the search box, for example, let's type in ink. And in here we have the results that include the word ink and put an asterisk. Then anything that begins with ink will be included. So you can also do this in the search box. We can also filter by multiple fields. In our row labels, we have the sales region and products. So if we go to our pivot table from the filter dropdown, we have the select field option there. And we can choose sales region or products. Now let's choose sales region. And then in the value filters, we're gonna put in that greater than 8.1 million. So it's pull. Okay, and then press OK. So we only have Asia and Africa because the subtitles are greater than 8.1 million. And now we can do another filter for our products and say values that are greater than 2,100,000. And we get the items that are bigger than 2.1 million. So you can do two filters when you have multiple fields in your row labels. Now we can apply multiple filters in our pivot table. Let's choose the filter button here. And for sales month, we're going to use a label filter, anything that contains ER and press OK. So we'll get all the months that end in ER. Now what we're gonna do is apply a values filter for any values that are bigger than 800,000. We choose the sales month and let's choose value filters greater than 800,000. Okay, so we get anything that's greater than 800,000, but we also want the sales month filter to include ER. And if we hover over our row labels, we see that our filter is only for some of sales, which are greater than 800,000. Now to have a multiple filter, we need to go into our options. So right click anywhere in the pivot table and choose pivot table options. And under the totals and filters tab, under filters, we have the allow multiple filters per field. Now we need to check that and press OK. Now let's go back to our filter, sales months, label filter, contains ER, and press OK. So now we get all the months that contain ER and are greater than 800,000. And if we hover over there, we can see that we have the multiple filters Sales months contains ER and value filters. Sales months, sum of sales is greater than 800,000. So if you're ever gonna do multiple filters, then make sure that you activate that option under the pivot table options. We have our sum of sales in our pivot table here. Now, say that we want to include the average of sales. Now we can do that and we can also filter by that. Now let's grab our sales and drop it into our values area. And from the drop down arrow, we choose value fuel settings. And then we choose the average. And we can rename this to average. And press OK. So we have the average of sales here. Now we can actually go and filter that. We can go to value filters, then for example, we can choose greater than. Now in the show items, we have sum of sales, but in the drop down box, we can actually choose the average. So we can filter by the average. And in there, we can put is greater than, and let's put in an amount, greater than 55,000, and press OK. And we have our average filtered by that amount. I've got our manual filter here for the products and I want to show you how to add new items into this manual filter. Now let's have a look at what's in here. What I have are the bottles and tonic selected and the rest is not selected. So if we go to our data table, what I'm going to do here is just 
copy and add a new item in there. And I want to change the products from tonic. I want to change it to cider. Okay. Now we'll go back and refresh the pivot table and then we'll see what happens. It doesn't get updated in our pivot table. But what it does is cider is included in our filter list. So what we have to do is activate a setting within the pivot table, right click and go to fill settings. And in the filter, it says in here, include new items in a manual filter. So we have to tick that box and press OK. So let's go back and let's add in another product and see what happens. Control, copy and paste in there. And instead of cider, let's put in a new product called beer. And we'll go back and refresh the pivot table and we'll see what happens now. Right click, refresh. Beer has been included in there. And also, if you have a look at the filter list, beer has been ticked there. So now we've added a new item in a manual filter. Now the last thing we're going to do is bring beer on top. Right click and we can sort from A to Z and we have it there. So it's a good trick to know if you want to include new items in a manual filter. When you have multiple filters like we have here, it's hard work to clear them all. For example, we've got a lot of filters in there. Okay, Let's say we want to clear them with a click or a couple of clicks. Well, we'll have to go in there and press all, okay, and then go in there, press all, okay. So it takes time. That's not the quickest way. Let's press control Z to go back. Now, one way is to click in our pivot table and go to the options tab and choose clear and press clear filters. But there's another way, a quicker way. Let's press control Z to go back to where we were with all of our filters. Now in our quick access toolbar, we can add in a clear filter button. Now let's right click in there and choose customize quick access toolbar. And in here we have the commands. Now the default setting is popular commands. Let's click on the drop down button and we can go all the way down to the data tab. Choose that. And then we have the clear filter button there. We click on that and we'll press add. And then we'll press OK. And you can see it's been added here. So now with a simple click, we clear all of our filters. Now this also works in your Excel tables. So a great tool to have when you're working with filters in a pivot table or in an Excel table. Now in the column labels over here, there's no way that you can put in there a filter. Now if you highlight here and press filter, it doesn't give you the option. But I'll show you a quick workaround. Click outside the pivot table and then press Control Shift and L and then automatically it adds in there a filter. So you can filter individual column items by going in there, number filters, then you've got all these different options. We have our PL here shown in a pivot table that shows the revenue, cogs, and expenses for 2012, 2013, and 2014. And we want to show the top five expenses for each of the years. To do that, in the row labels drop down box, we choose the PL type and let's choose only expenses. So unselect all and choose expenses. And press OK. So we have the three years of expenses there. And the next thing I want to do is see the top five values for each of these items. So once again, click back into our filter. From the select field drop down box, we choose the item. And from value filters, we choose top 10. And instead of top 10, let's change that to top five. And we'll keep this to the items and actual and press OK. So we have our top five items there. Now finally, we click in our pivot table so we can sort it from highest to lowest. Right click, choose sort and sort largest to smallest. So they're all sorted there from largest to smallest. 
Now finally, we can go to our pivot table tools tab and see a different layout. And just to show you how it looks, let's choose the outline form. So in the outline form, we'll have the year in one column, the PL type in a second column, the item in a third column, and the actual dollars in a fourth column. And in here, you can see the actual filters. So you can choose that, and you can see that we've chosen the expenses. And in the item, you can see that we have the value filter in the top five items. And also you can see that it's sorted from Z to A. Now, another good thing with the outline form is that you can see each of the field headings in here. So the layout depends on your personal preferences. And as you can see from this analysis, by filtering and sorting, we can get the top five expenses in your PL. We have all of our channel partners and we have 123 records. Now we want to find out the top 25% of channel partners and list them. So what it is is 25% on 123 gives us around 30 records. I want to find out the top channel partners. Let's go down to our records by going control down and we'll see our grand total is around 33 million and let's go up. Now, the first thing we need to do is right click and then sort from large to smallest. Let's go to our row labels, value filters and top 10. And let's go to 25% of some values and press OK. So let's see how many records we get here. We get 21, which we put here earlier, and it doesn't equate to the 30 or so mark we have there. So what this does is it gives us the top channel partners that make up 25% of sales. So we saw before that 33 million of total sales. So 25% of that is about 8.3 mil. Next one is, let's go in there and value filters, top 10. Instead of percent, let's go to items. So in here, let's count that. So what it does is it gives us the 25. So it gives us 25 items and it doesn't equate to the 30 mark that we're looking for. Now, I'll show you a workaround to get to our problem here. Okay, let's go in here and clear the filter. Now, a workaround to this is to press Control, Shift and L while you're next to the pivot table. And then it tricks the pivot table to include a filter, as you can see there. Let's press Control Z to go back. And then another way is to go to Data and press Filter. Okay, so from in here, we can go to Number Filters, Top 10, change that to 25. From the drop-down box, choose Percent and press OK. So now, if we count all this, we can see that we have 30 transactions. So we get our top 25% of channel partners. In our pivot table, we'll have our sales month and products in our report filter. And we have some multiple items in there selected, January, February, and March. But we don't know which months are selected if we look at it from this view here. It says multiple items, but it could be any item from January to December. Now this was a real problem in earlier versions of Excel. But in Excel 2010, there's a new feature. It's called slices. Slices are large buttons that shows you what has been selected in your filters, or you can call them visual filters. Now let's insert a slicer. We have to click inside our pivot table and go into the pivot tables tools tab under the options. And in here, we click on insert slicer and insert slicer. And we'll get the insert slicers dialog box. Now in here, we have all the field lists. So whatever's in here is also included in the slicers. And we can select any one of them. Now we can select the ones that are already active here or the ones that are not. Now let's select the ones that are active, sales month and products. And then we can also select the sales region and the financial year. And finally, we'll select one that's not part of our pivot table and that is salesperson and press OK. 
And now we have our five different slices. So let's arrange these slices in our workbook. Just grab them and put them anywhere in there with your mouse. Okay. And the products we can bring down here. What we can do is just from the bottom, we can bring it all the way up and like this. Okay. So now we can see that the sales months in there have the three months selected, as we said before. And also in our slicer sales month, we can see which months are selected. So now we get a view that's not available in the report filter. So it gets rid of the multiple items problem there. And we can see that we have Jan, Feb, March. They're highlighted in blue. And whatever is not highlighted, that means it's not selected. All we can do is from the top right hand corner, we can clear the filter and the pivot table updates automatically and as well as the report filter. And now we can choose a slicer that's not part of the pivot table filter. And then we can choose Homer Simpson and that gets updated automatically. Let's choose each one of them. Now in here, it means that in the sales region that they're available in Americas and because they're grayed out here, Europe, Asia and Africa, there are no values. We can check Americas. Now let's clear the filters from here and go back. Now we can select multiple items by holding down the control key. For example, if we want Americas, we choose Americas, hold down the control key and choose Europe and choose Asia. And we get our pivot table updated accordingly. Now let's clear that. If we want to choose six months, then hold down January, press the shift key, and then go all the way down to June. And that highlights there automatically as well. So slices are a great feature. They're new in Excel 2010, and they give us some visual filters that we never had before. Now let's resize our slices. We can actually click in the slicer and we can resize it with our mouse up or down. And if we go too much up, then we get the scroll bar. So we just make sure that that's not there. And we do the same thing here. And also for sales person, we can also scroll inwards if we like. Control Z to go back. And now we can move this up here, just to make it a bit neater. And this one up here. And then finally, we can get the months all the way to the bottom there. Okay, so we can just resize as we see fit there. Let's click out of the slices. Now when we click in any one of the slices, we get the slicer tools option. Okay, and we get this option here, which is similar to the one in the pivot table. So once you click in the pivot table, get the pivot table tools tab. So you get the options and design. And if we click in a slicer, we get the slicer tools option. And we have all these different options here. Now we have one that's called a slicer styles. If we click down there, we have our light version and our dark version. Now we don't have as many styles as we have in the pivot tables, but that's okay. These are good enough. Now, another thing that we don't see is a live preview when we scroll over there. So we have to actually scroll and choose and then go back in, which is a bit annoying. Now, another thing that you can do is if you hold down the control key and choose all your slices like that, you can actually go back to your slicer styles and choose one and they all get updated automatically. You can choose from in there as well. Go to the light and then you can choose from in there. So there's a few different options where you can work with. There are 14 different styles under the slicer styles and you may not like one of them. That's okay. You can create a new slicer style by choosing the new slicer style option. And then you get a dialog box in here. Now you can rename this to John's Wicked Slicer.
slicer, then you have the different slicer elements in here, which relate to the different parts of the slicer. Now, once you make a change, you get a preview in here. Now, to make a change, you just got to click in the format area. So for the whole slicer, we're going to put in a field of this color. You can also put in a border if you like, or a font. Now, the font will apply for the items in here. Okay, so we just press OK, and you see you get a live preview. Next, we'll go to header, and then format. For the header, we'll fill it in with this color here. And the font, we'll make it into a white font, and press OK. Select the item with no data. Here, we want to create a slicer where the effect is of a button. So to do this, we go to fill, and then fill effects. And let's choose a gray color here. And then under shading styles, we can use the this style here. But you have the different styles that you can choose. You get your sample here. Okay, so if we choose that, we get the sample. But we want to choose this button here and press OK. And then press OK. And you can see it over there. Select the item with no data. Here we just want to make it a flat gray and press OK. Unselected item with data, same thing here. Unselected item with no data. Here we're just going to make it into, into a white color and press OK. And the hover is whenever you hover over the slices, you get the different color. So we can choose the same hover color for each of these four different hover options. So we'll go to the format, we can go to fill effects, and then in here we can choose this red, and we can choose that hover effect. And we'll go and do the same thing for the rest. You can see here uh, on the right hand side of the preview, we get the hover options. And now we can press OK. Now, if we want to make this a default slicer, then we can click that. So any new slicer that we insert, then this is going to be our default style. Now press OK. Now to activate it, you just got to click inside the styles and then you got the custom style. So you got to click on there. So here we have our slicer with our button looking effect. And if we hover over there, you can see the red hover color. If we choose an item, then everything else that has a value is in gray. And if we, anything that doesn't have a value is in white. So there it is there. Some pretty cool effects that you can do. Now, if you want to go back and modify it, you can just right click and modify and you can make the changes there. You can also right click and duplicate and you can make some further changes and keep the changes that you make and you can rename it to whatever you like. Another thing you can do is you can delete it. You can also set as default. You can also add it to the gallery to your quick access toolbar. Now, another thing that we can do is that if we have a current slicer that we like and we just want to make some slight modifications, then all we do is right click in there and choose duplicate. And in here we can rename it to whatever we like. Name it John's Wicked Slicer 2. And then here we can make the changes. For example, we can put in a whole slicer format. We can put in a, a dark background if we like here. And then our border, we can make it into a dash. And apply it there. And the fonts, we can change the fonts here. Instead of black, we can make them gray and bold. We can also make them a little bit bigger. 12. And press OK and OK. And to apply it, we just click from in here. Or you can open it and click there. So now we have an extension of one of our current styles. Now finally, if we go to slicer elements in here, I've explained briefly what the different elements are. And if you make changes, 
then what part of the slicer will change. So this is a great tool to have when you're formatting your slices. Now we can copy a newly created style that we've made previously into a new workbook. Now this is our new workbook here. And if you click on there, you can see the options. We have no custom styles. Now let's go back to our workbook from chapter 7.3. And in there, we have our custom slicer, which we created. Now we can move that onto the new workbook and then apply that custom slicer into all the slices within that workbook. Now to do that, we just select the custom slicer, control copy, and let's go back to our new workbook. And in here, we just press control V. So now you can see that the custom slicer is in this workbook. All we're gonna do now is click on the old slicer and press control A to select all and then choose the custom style. Escape. And now we have the custom style here. Now this slicer doesn't work in here. So what we can do is just highlight it and delete it with our keyboard. So now we can use the new custom style into a new workbook. Apart from slicer styles, slicers also have settings. Now to activate it, you can go into your slicer tools option once you click in one of the slicers. And then on the far left hand side, you can choose slicer settings. And in here, you have your slicer settings dialog box. That's one way. Let's cancel out of there. The second way is just to right click in one of the slicers. And the last option, is slicer settings. So in here we have a few settings. First we have the source name, so that's the sales region that comes from the data table, so that's the field name. The second one is name to use in formula, and here you can use this slicer when you're using cube formulas. And the name, you can name this to whatever you like, something different, just something to distinguish one of your slices. So I can rename this to John's Slicer 1. And if I press OK, and then I click in the slicer, you'll see here on the far left that John Slicer 1 is activated. So it's in the name box there. Now right click again, go back to Slicer Settings. And then here we have the header. So the header is over here where you see Sales Region, Financial Year, and so forth. And you can Uncheck that. If you uncheck that, then the header goes. Right click, go back in. Now you can display the header, but you can also rename it to whatever you like. Instead of sales region, we can name it sales continent. And press OK. You can see that's changed. Now your data table has not changed. It's only the slicer that has changed, okay? So if you click in here, where you had sales region up here, now that is not gonna change. It's only the slicer. So it's only for cosmetic purposes. Let's right click and bring it up again. Now we can also sort it here. We can sort it from ascending, from A to Z, or Z to A. If you click there and press OK, you can see that's sorted. Now right click in there. You can also sort it from in here, sort A to Z, or Z to A. And let's go back to our settings. We have the option here to use custom lists when sorting. Now we've used a custom list in previous chapters and we can activate this. Let's press OK and A to Z. And we see the custom list has been sorted accordingly. Now we created a custom list to have Americas first, Europe second, Asia third and Africa fourth. We can check that to go into our files and options. And in advanced, we go all the way down and then edit custom list. And here we previously created a custom list. So when we sort it A to Z, then Americas will be first, 
Europe second, Asia third, Africa fourth. If it's Z to A, well, it would be the other way around. Press OK to exit. And then we also have a few other checkboxes here that you can check or uncheck. Now this says here, visually indicate items with no data, show items with no data last, and show items deleted from the data source. So you can leave them on, depends on what you like. I usually leave them on. And let's press OK. Now let's click in one of the slices and press Control A to activate all the slices. Now if we right click and bring the settings again, look, we can't change the names, which is fair enough. But we can get rid of the header for every one of them in one go. Or we can rename the caption to call it Cool Slices. And if you do that, then every slicer heading will be the same. Now right click to go back in there. We can also sort them all from A to Z in one go. Just like that. And then also you have the custom list and also the check boxes if you want to show or not show some data. So there's a few settings there that you can play with and you have the flexibility to chop and change your slices. With a slicer, you can resize it to make it to your own liking. Now manually you can click in a slicer and then from in here you can resize it whichever way you like, as big or as small as you'd like. Another way is to right click and choose size and properties. And in here you get your dialog box, size and properties. And you have here the size option first. And you've got the height. So you can make your changes there and you get the live update. And the width. And the scale, you have the height as well. And the width. You can lock the aspect ratio. So if you change one, then all of them change accordingly. Now, we can also see the position and layout. So we can move it left or right up or down, you can disable it as well from there. Another thing you can do is add columns. Now you've got one column here, going all the way down, but you can increase that to two, three or four, as many as you like. Imagine you had a lot of information there. Putting it in two, three or four columns is much better visually and aesthetically. This works well when you're using months. Now the button height as well can be adjusted and the width as well. In properties, you can move and size with cells. You can move but don't size with cells and you don't move or size with cells. You can also print object and lock it in there and press OK. Now, another way that you can resize is once you click in the slicer, on the slicer tools and options, on the right hand side you have the size and the width and you have the height. And also from here you've got the columns you can change. By pressing Ctrl A you can select all of the slices and then escape to unselect. In here we have two columns. Now let's bring it back to one so they can all be the same. Now by pressing Ctrl A, we can increase the columns for all of the slices. Press Escape. Now let's press Ctrl A again. And in here, we can align the slices. We can align it to the middle, just so they can be in order. Another thing you do is when you've got Ctrl A, you can move it around to wherever you like. We have our pivot table which has the financial year and sales region in the row labels and the sum of sales in the values area. And now we're going to insert a slicer. So we'll go to the pivot table tools options tab and choose insert slicer. And here we are going to choose the quarters, so sales quarter and press OK. And we can resize it and then move it up here. 
So we have our slicer for our pivot table number one here. So we're going to insert a new pivot table now. So let's go to our data set and in there we can choose insert pivot table and let's put it into our existing worksheet and we can move it in here and press OK. And now we're going to put the salesperson in the row labels, the sales month in the row labels, and the sales in the values area. And we'll get out of that. And we have our second pivot table. Now this pivot table is called pivot table number four. And this pivot table here is called pivot table one. And we can change this to pivot table number two, just for our example. Now let's insert a slicer for our pivot table number two. And let's choose the products slicer and put it in there. So let's resize it. Okay, so if we choose that, then our pivot table number two on the right hand side gets updated accordingly. Now what we want to do is connect these two slices. So pivot table number one and pivot table number two change accordingly. So if I choose Q1, then both pivot tables change based on that selection. Now to do that, we need to select pivot table connections. One way is to go into the options tab and choose pivot table connections here on the left. Or another way is just right click in there and halfway down, we have pivot table connections and we get this pop-up box that comes up. So what it's saying is that this slicer that we created is connected to pivot table number two on the right hand side and that's right now we want to activate it and connect it to pivot table number one on the left and press ok now we want to do the same thing for the first pivot table slicer it's connected to pivot table number one on the left and we want to check it so it can be connected to the pivot table number two on the right and press ok so now if we choose q1 then both pivot tables change accordingly. Q2, Q3. If we choose the products, then as you see, both pivot tables change accordingly. So you can have multiple pivot tables, multiple slices, and you can connect them all together. And with the press of a button, they will all be in sync and talking to each other. I will show you a few different ways on how you can filter a slicer. The first way is to mouse click on individual entries, like this. The second way is to hold down the control key. Once you select one item, hold down the control key so you can select multiple items. The third way is to select one item and then hold down the shift key and then choose the last item you want to select and let go of the shift key. Now this comes handy when you have a list of items that are over 50 and you just want to select half of them. And my favorite is click on the first filter and while the mouse is still being pressed, scroll down all the way, just like that. And again, scroll all the way up or all the way down. And then by holding the control key, you can deselect items. So there's a few different ways on how you can filter a slicer. I'm gonna show you how you can use one slicer to control two pivot tables without having to activate the pivot table connections. First of all, we need to click in our first pivot table on the left and select it by going select entire pivot table, then control copy from the keyboard. And in here, we press control V. So we paste it in here. Now, what we're gonna do is we're gonna take out the financial gear and the sales region and include in here the sales person and the sales quarter, just like this. Now that we have the two pivot tables, they're using the same pivot cache. So if I click January, then they both change automatically. 
And if I select the first quarter, then the second quarter, and the third quarter, and the fourth quarter. Now we can see this by going on to our pivot table connections, and the slicer is connected to both pivot tables. So there's a quick way where you can use one slicer for two pivot tables without having to activate the pivot table connections. If you want to send this report out to someone else and you don't want them to touch the pivot table, but allow them to use the slicers, then you can do that. To do this, we need to select one slicer, press Ctrl A to select all of them, right click and choose size and properties. Under properties, you've got to uncheck the locked box and press close. And now we need to go into the review tab in the ribbon and choose protect sheet. Now in here, we're going to unselect the first option, the select unlock cells. We have to keep them activated so we can be able to select the unlocked slices. And then one more box we need to tick is the use pivot table reports. And we can put in here a password to protect it, or we can just press OK and it'll protect without a password. Just like this. Now let's escape so we can unselect all the slices. Now I'm clicking in the pivot table and nothing's happening. So the whole workbook is protected. But if I go on the slices, I can actually select them just like this. I'm going to show you a cool way where you can use slices and then have interactive employee photos show up. So here's our slicer. If we choose Homer Simpson, it comes up, Ian Wright, myself here, and Michael Jackson. Now there's a few steps that we need to go through. And once you go through those steps, it's pretty easy to understand. Now what I've used here is the camera tool to take a photo. And I've linked that photo by putting a named range called Show Employee Picture. Now that name range has an offset function in it. Now the offset function is here. It says start here. Now I've named that range and I've also named the, ra the range number of cells down. So for an offset function, we have the first part, which is where do we start? So it has a starting point and I've called a start here. So I've called it here on the left cell A15 start here. The second part of the offset function is how many rows down do we go? And I've named this number of cells down. Now I have named cell A9 number of cells down. So as I change this, then it goes down accordingly. So one row down, three rows down, four rows down, two rows down. So by linking this picture with the offset function, we can go grab these pictures that we have here and it brings them back into this photograph that was snapped by the camera tool. So let's go to the how to and I'll explain how it's done. First of all, we need to create our table. So let's get our table here with our number and employee names. So we can control copy and control paste in there. So we have our table here and double click there. So the first thing we need to do is insert a pivot table. So let's grab our data and go to insert and pivot table and we'll put it into our existing worksheet. Now let's put it all the way down here because once we insert a pivot table, we get all this area here and it's going to overlap. So we've got a bit of space here. Now what we need to do now is to drop in the number field into the row labels. And that's all we need to do. We're not going to put here anything else. So we've created our pivot table. Just one thing, right click in here and remove the grand total. Okay, so we have the pivot table here and we're gonna press Control X to move it here 
and press Control V. Okay, so we have our pivot table here. Now, one thing we need to do now is name the range. So when we make a selection, for example, number two or number three, so this cell here, D10, we have to name it because we're going to use that for the number of rows to go down in our offset formula. So to name the range, we're going to name a number of cells down. All we need to do is go in our name box in there and name it number of cells down. And we'll put an underscore as well because in our previous example, in the interactive employees, we used this name range. So just to distinguish it, we'll put another underscore and press enter. So now we have that named. Next, we have to insert a slicer. To do that, we click in our pivot table and go to options, insert slicer, and now we choose the employees. So we have the employees names there. Now, if we select all, we have all of them there. So let's put our employee names up there. Just for now, we'll pack it up there. So the next step is to define our name for our starting position, because the first argument in the offset function is our starting position. So we're going to start over here, and we're going to call this start here as a defined name. So in there, we're going to call it start here. Now we use that name in our previous example, so we just put the underscore again just to distinguish it. So we call it start here. The next step is to make these four rows here high enough so we can include our pictures. So I've made them about 100 and you can adjust it to whatever you like. And also you can make them as, as wide as you like as well. Step number six is to insert the pictures. Now you can insert pictures by going into insert and picture and you have them all there. Now let's cancel out of there. What I can do is just go back and grab these pictures. So control copy and control V. So make sure that it sits in there. So we've inserted our pictures. Step number seven, we need to define the name for the formula that would drive the pictures. So now we're going to put in there the offset function. To do that, we'll go to our name manager and press new. We're going to call it function that will get our pictures. Now you got to make sure that there are no spaces in there for that to work. And this refers to, well, we're going to put in there our offset function. So we're going to say offset, where is our starting point? And we've named our starting point start here. So we'll put in there start here with the underscore, then comma, how many rows down? We've named that in there, number of cells down. So number of cells down and underscore. And the next argument is how many columns do we go right or left? And we'll put in zero and then a comma and then close brackets and press OK. So we've defined our range there. Step number eight is to take a camera shot of a blank space large enough to, to fit our picture. So we can take a, a shot over here, but I'll show you an example. All you can do is just take a, a shot of a picture like this, of space like this, with your camera tool. Now, if you don't have the camera activated, you can activate it by going into File, Options, and Quick Access Toolbar. Now, from the drop-down box, we choose All Commands, Click in there and press C to go down to the camera tool. And then you can just press add in there. Now I've already added it. Press OK and it gets added in here. So we've selected a range here and let's take a, a photo. 
So we've taken the photo and now we need to put it somewhere. Where do we want to put it? We can put it in there. Just click anywhere. So we have our, our background. Now finally, we need to reference this blank photograph to our offset name range. So we've defined our offset function with a name called, so if you put that fun, it will give you the name tag there and then press tab and press enter. So now what it does is the offset function starts here. It goes down, number of cells down, one. So it goes down here and it returns back whatever's in there into our camera shot. Now if we choose in right, it goes down three rows from our starting position. So it goes one, two, three. So in here, it's looking in there and it's taking whatever's in there and returning it back in there. So that's how it works. Now, finally, we need to format the photo here and just put in a background like this. And now you can use your slicer to bring up all the different pictures and you'll be as happy as Homer. In chapter A15, we created a PNL by using calculated items. And now we're gonna add in some slices where we can control the years and the months for the PNL. After that, we're gonna drop in the plan numbers and then do a comparison between the actual and the plan numbers. Now let's click in our pivot table and go to the options and choose insert slicer and we're going to insert the months and the year fields. So we have the year field here and let's just reduce the size here so we can drop it into the top left hand corner just like that. Now instead of having a column heading called year, let's right click and get rid of that. Let's choose slicer settings and from in here under header uncheck the display header option and press OK. Now let's just drag it up a bit and it can fit in there. OK, perfectly. Next thing is to get the months and again right click, slice the settings, uncheck display header and from in here on the top options tab we're going to add in some columns. So we're going to have four different columns and then let's just resize this a bit so we can see it and we can just drop it in here as well okay now the next thing that we can do is highlight the first slicer press control and with the mouse select the other slicer and then we can just change in the colors from in here so now we have the different slicers let's check 2012 and you see the number changes there and then we can choose Jan, Feb, March, whatever month that we want, and then the PNL gets updated accordingly. We can do the same thing for 2013 and 2014. Now, the next step is to add in a, another pivot table with the plan numbers. So, let's highlight the pivot table, press Control, Copy, and in here, we can just press Control V, and we've copied the same pivot table, but we can actually change this around. So instead of sum of actuals, we can get rid of that and let's drop in the plan numbers in there, just like that. Now, instead of having the field and items listed here, we can just highlight this column and right click and press hide. So we can hide that. And we can just reduce this a little bit further in there. So now we can use the slices to change the actual and the plan, just like that. Finally, we want to add in a variance. So I want to see the difference between the actual and the plan. In here, let's just reduce this. And from in there, we're going to choose the revenue. Now we get the get pivot data, so let's escape out of that. Now to fix this, just click anywhere in the pivot table, go to options, and from the options drop down box, unselect the get pivot data. Okay, now let's go back in there and let's do equals or plus the revenue of the actual minus the revenue of the plan and press OK. We can get this and drag it all the way down 
and we have our values there. And in here, we can put in a header called variance. We can click in there and from the Format Painter, use the same formatting in there. And the same thing in here. So now, as we choose the different months, we get the actual, the plan, and the variance. We have our actual numbers for the year 2014, and we want to create three different scenarios for 2015, 16, and 17. We want to create a base case, a best case, and a worst case. Now in our data set here, we have our actual values for 2014 highlighted here in purple. Now what we've done is we've copied these values here and we've put in the scenario for base, best and worst case. Okay, So we just copied and pasted the values and all I did is just change the name from actual to base to best and then to worst because when we do our pivot table and we create the three different scenarios, we want the 2014 actual numbers to be shown all the time because we're gonna do a variance analysis. Now, what I've done here at the bottom is put in the 2015 values. So I've done the three different scenarios, worst, base, and best. So I put in different colors just to distinguish them. And then in here, what I've actually done is I've put in a formula that relates back to the 2014 actual values. And I said the worst case will be 95% of that. So I've done the same thing for each of the months. Now for the base case, I said that it's going to be about 5% increase on 2014. And then for the best case, I said it's going to be about 20% increase on 2014. Now I've done the same thing for 2016, but I've changed the values there. I said that 2016 worst case will be the same as 2014. Its base case will be about 10% increase. And then its best case will be about 25% increase. And the same thing for 2017. I said it's going to be a 5% increase on 2014 for its worst case. 25% increase for its best case. And then a 50% increase for its best case. Okay, so what I've done is I've gone into the pivot table in here, and what we have to do now is drop in our sales month into the row labels, our financial year into the column labels, and then our sales into the values area. And let's just double click in there to make it even, and then just put it into the center. We can just make it a little bit bigger like that. Okay, so we have our values here, but what we can do now is drop in our slicer. So go to the options, insert slicer, and let's drop in this scenario slicer and press OK. Now, let's make a couple of changes to this. Let's make it into four columns, and then we'll just drag it across like that, and then right click in there and slicer settings, and let's get rid of the display header, because we don't want to see that. And let's just put it like that, and put it on the top there. So we have all our scenarios here. So if we choose the actual case, then we just see the actual numbers for 2014. If you choose the base case, because we had the numbers in 2014 in base case as well, we can see that 2014 is shown there, and we've got the 2015 to 2017 base case scenarios. We've got the best case and the worst case. So finally, what we're going to do is drop in a value calculation to see the difference between the 2014 numbers. So click in the pivot table, grab the sales, drop into the values area. From the drop down box, choose value field settings, show values as. From the drop down box, we choose the percentage difference from. Now, the base field is going to be the financial year and the base item will be 2014. So we're going to show the values as the percentage difference from 2014 financial year. Now the custom name we just changed there to percentage variance from 2014 and then 
in the number format, the custom. Let's just choose a this format here and before the semicolon, let's put in a percentage. And the same thing there, let's put in a percentage and press OK. And then OK there. Let's just reduce this a bit. So we see the worst case scenario for 2015 is minus 5% on 2014. 2016 will be even and 2017 is a 5% increase. If we go to our best case scenario, we see the different increases there. We have our base case scenario as well and we can see the changes. A calculated field is a newly created data field. This is created when you make a calculation with your existing fields. So in essence, you're adding a virtual column to your data set. And to create a calculated field, you gotta click anywhere in your pivot table, and then in the options tab, under the calculations group, in the field items and set drop down, choose the calculated field, which is the first option. And you get your insert calculated field dialog box, now in the fields here, you have all the fields that are in your pivot table field list. Okay, so you can choose any one of them. Now on the top, we have the name and this we can change to customize it. So what we're gonna do now is get our cost of goods sold, which is our cost divided by our sales. Now the name, let's change it to cost of goods sold or short cogs. Now in the formula, you have the zero there. You gotta get rid of this. Backspace to delete it. Now the next step is choose your field. So to do that, we get our cost. We can click once and press insert field. And now we can use the mathematical signs that we use in Excel. So we can use divide. We can also use the minus, plus, Multiplication, we can use percentage, we can use to the power of, and also smaller than, bigger than, or equals to. We're gonna use the divide, so cost divided by sales. Now let's find our sales, and we can press insert field or double click, and then we can add this. So it's added in our list here, okay? And then we can press OK. Now when we press OK, you see that a new column will be created and also COGS will be added into our field list as a virtual field. We'll press OK. So COGS is added there and also in here, in our values. Now one thing we need to do is to right click in here and number format because it's a percentage, we need to use the percentage and press OK. So just format it there. So we have our cost of goods sold there. And finally, we can go into our values area and change the name from sum of cogs to cogs. Now click on the drop down box and choose a value field settings. And in here, we can get rid of this. Now, what I usually do is put in an asterisk there just so I can distinguish it that it's a calculated field. Because if not, then you may be confused. You may think that this COGS may be a summarized value or it could be a calculation. So it's always good to put some kind of sign beforehand just to distinguish it and to show us that it is a calculated field. Now let's press OK and we have our COGS in there. So what we can do now is when we filter our pivot table, then this calculated field changes as well, okay? Now if I put in there the sales month in there, then that will change as well. If I take out the financial year in there, we have our COGS, which gets recalculated. So it's embedded into the pivot cache, just like a grand total. Now we can use an existing calculated field to create a new calculation within our calculated field. Now to do this, let's click in our pivot table and go to the options tab 
and under calculations choose field items and sets and choose calculate fields what we want to do is calculate our sales margin so the calculation will be one minus cogs first of all let's change the name and call it sales margin and in our formula get rid of zero and then put in one minus and here we're going to choose cogs so our previously created calculated field is included in our fields as well as our field list so let's double click on cogs and press ok so we get our sales margin there now we need to format the numbers into percentages right click and press number format and percentage and let's put one decimal place just to activate the percentage symbol finally we're going to put in an asterisk to our sales margin there just to distinguish it so that we know it is a calculated field to do that click in our drop down arrow and choose value field settings in here we'll get rid of some of sales now if we get rid of this and press ok we'll get an error message that the pivot table field name already exists well that's correct because it exists in our field list down here because we created that in our calculated field so we need to distinguish it now we can put in a, a space and that will work because Excel recognizes space as a character but instead of a space because we want to distinguish this calculation as being a calculated field then we just put in an asterisk and then press OK so we have the sales margin there which is our calculated field just like our cogs and up here we have our sales margin and our cogs so we've used one calculated field to create a second calculated field If you made a mistake whilst creating a calculated field, then you can go back and edit it. Now to do that, you click anywhere in the pivot table and choose the options tab and then field items and sets and calculated field. In here, from the drop down box, you've got your calculated fields. Now we can choose our sales margin. We can modify or delete. If we press delete, then it will delete the calculated field from our pivot table and our pivot cache now let's press that just to see and press ok so you can see that's gone from there and sales margin is also gone from our pivot cache and our values area there now if you press ctrl z you can't go back you gotta go and recreate it so once you delete it make sure that you're certain that you don't want the calculated field before you proceed now to modify our calculated field we can choose calculated fields and from now drop down box we choose our cogs now first of all we're going to press the modify button okay so in here we can make our changes so instead of cost divided by sales we can say for example one minus cost and then we can press ok and you can see here the change we made now one minus cost means nothing I'm just showing an example that you can go there and modify it. We can go back and change that. Once again, cogs, modify. Instead of 1 minus cost, it'll be cost divided by sales and then press OK. So the change has been made and our calculated field also remains in our pivot type of field list and our values area. Within a calculated field, we can use any Excel functions like a sum, an if, an all, an and, or an average, as an example, as long as they don't reference external cells. Now let's create an if statement. Click in our pivot table and go to options and field items and sets and calculate a field. Now in the name, we're going to change that. So what we want to see are rebates given if our sales are more than 700,000 so if our sales are more than 700,000 then we're going to give a rebate of 3% so the name will be rebates given and the formula will give it a zero now we start typing in the if statement 
just like we would in our Excel workbook. Now, one thing in here is when you're typing in an Excel function, you don't get the helper. So you gotta make sure that you know what each step within a function needs to be. So within an if function, the first step is our argument. So if sales are more than 700,000, then we have to give a 3% rebate on sales. So it'll be sales times 3%. If not, then zero rebate. Close brackets and press OK. So you can see there we have our rebates given for anything over 700,000. Anything less than 700,000 is zero. Now just make a note that we have to get rid of the subtotals and the grand totals because what's happening is that when you're doing a calculated field, that it's also calculating each subtotal. Now, this is not correct because our subtotal for January is 23,000. That's the only rebate that was given. But here we're getting 81,000. So make a note that when you're doing calculated fields and you have an if statement where you can get zero values, then you gotta make sure that the subtotal is turned off, okay? So to do that, we just go into the design, subtotals, do not show subtotals, and then grand totals, off for rows and columns. One final step is to rename our rebates given in our values area. From the drop down arrow, choose a value for settings. Because we want to distinguish a calculated field, then we just put in there an asterisk and then press OK. So we have our rebates given. So it's that easy to create a calculated field with an Excel function. A calculated item is a virtual data item created by using a row label or a column label item. So our calculations will be based on the items in the months row label and also the years in the columns labels. Now, when we do the calculated fields, we use the field list to do our calculations, but now we're gonna use the items within the field list. So let's click anywhere in our row label or column label. So if we go to options and field items and sets and choose calculated item, we get our dialog box. Now on the left hand side we have the fields and on the right hand side we have the items. So we're going to use our items to create our formula. Now what we want to do is create a bonus scheme. So for the first half of the year we give a 10% bonus and for the second half of the year we give a, another 10% bonus. So our formula name will be H1 bonus and then in the formula, we'll get rid of the zero. And we're gonna put 10% times. Now in here, we can put any mathematical equations that we will normally use in an Excel function. So we can use the times, the plus, the minus, the power, less than, more than, and equals to. In example, we'll use the time, so 10% times and the bracket. So the first half of the year, it'll be January plus February plus March plus April plus May plus June. Close bracket and we can add this. Okay, so we've added this in there. Now we can create a new formula for H2. So we can override this, that's fine. So let's get rid of the contents in there. And what we need to do is choose sales month. Now it gets added in here. Now that's fine. If we press OK, it's not gonna work because we're in calculated items and you can only take in the items. So let's get rid of this. And let's put in our month from July to December. July plus. August plus September plus October plus November plus December. 
Now you see here that our calculation that we did before is included in our items within the sales month. And we can use this later on to make further calculated items. Okay, so we've done our H2 bonus and press add. And we'll see it's gonna get added in the bottom of our row labels. We'll press add and then okay. So we have our H1 bonus, which is 10% of the first half of the year. Now we'll see our sum there is 5 million. 11,165. So our bonus will be 10% of that, which is here, which is correct. And from July to December, our sum is 5.3 million, and we have the same there. And it calculates it for each year as well. Now, the grand total, make sure that that's switched off because if we add this, it adds the H1 bonus and the H2 bonus as well into the grand total. Now, that's a shortcoming of calculate items, so we have to delete the grand totals or any subtotals that you may have. So to do that, go to design, grand totals, off for rows and columns. We can use an existing calculated item within a new calculation. What we wanna do is get our H1 bonus and see what our average is for the six months. So it'll be the H1 bonus divided by six, and the same thing for the H2 bonus. And to do this, let's click in our row labels and go to the options tab and choose the field items and sets and a calculated item. In the name, we're gonna call it average H1 bonus. In the formula, get rid of zero. And we're gonna choose the H1 bonus. I wanna divide it by six. And then we can add this. Next, we're gonna get the average H2 bonus. We can just override this and get rid of this first. And let's go back to our sales month, okay? And get rid of sales month. Now, let's choose our H2 bonus, insert item, and divide it by six. And we can add this and press okay. So we have our average H1 bonus, which is 101,000, and our H2 bonus, 89,000 for 2012. For 2013, we have the same values, and 2014, we have the calculator item as well. So you can use previously created calculator items and you use them in your new calculations. There's a couple of ways to edit a calculated item. First of all, let's click in our row labels, go to options and fields, items and sets and calculate an item. From the drop down box, let's choose the average H2 bonus. Now in here, if you want to delete it, you can just press delete and press OK. Now that's gone forever, so before you delete anything, make sure that you really want to delete it. If not, you gotta go back and recreate the calculated item. Now if you want to modify a calculated item. Let's go back and choose calculated item. And from the drop down arrow, choose average H1 bonus. Now we can make changes to the formula here. That's fine. We can change that to eight or 12 or anything like that. But if we make any changes to the name, for example, we change that one letter, then it adds whatever we're making here as a new calculator item. Okay, so if you wanna modify a calculator item, you can only modify whatever is in the formula. So let's go back and press S. So for example, instead of six, we can change it to 12 and modify and press OK. And you see that changes there, okay? Now another way where we can make a change is within the pivot table. Now the formula is there, so we can go back and, and change that to six and press enter. What happens is it only changes it for that year. So you gotta go and change it for each subsequent year. You can also change the name there. Instead of average H1 bonus, you can call a average bonus. And if we go back to our calculated item, then you see the name there has changed as well. 
It can be a little bit tricky when you're modifying within a calculated item. So just make sure you take care before you make any changes. We can also use Excel functions to calculate an item as long as they don't reference any external cells. So we can use functions like sum, if, or, and, average, and so on. Now to do this, let's click in our row label and go to options and fields, items, and sets, and calculate the item. So what we're gonna do is get the average for 2012, 2013, and 2014. So in our name, we can call it average. And in our formula, we can go back, get rid of the zero. Let's put in average, open brackets, and put in January, comma, February, comma, March, April, May, June, July, August, September, October, November and December and close bracket and we can just press OK and then we get our average here for each year Now we can check this let's highlight Jan to December and in our status bar we have our metrics there now if you don't have this just right click and you can choose here the average count numerical count minimum maximum or sum okay to activate it now we can see that our average is 865 if we go back 865 so the same thing for 2013 and 2014 we've been using calculated items in our row labels but we can also use them in our column labels so to activate that we can just click anywhere in the column labels and then go to the options tab fields items and sets and choose calculate item now in here we can create our formula so what we're going to do is get the variance between 2014 and 2013 and also 2014 and 2012 so put in here variance 14 versus 13 and get rid of zero and the formula will be 2014 minus 2013 and let's add this and let's do another one variance 14 versus 12 and in here financial year okay let's get rid of financial year and choose 2014 minus 2012 add okay so we have our newly created calculator items that get the difference in our column items. And it's important that we name them as we have because if we filter, for example, take away 2012, then we'll know what these values relate to. And to go back, we just filter all. Nothing is that we can put in the sales regions, add it in there, and that calculator item will also calculate in there. Also, we can go to design and add in our subtotals to the top of the group. And again, we have our calculated item working there as well. Now you can also do this if you had actuals versus budget instead of years. It just depends on what items you have within your data source. And if you put them across the column labels, well, you can do your calculated items there. A couple of limitations when you're using calculated items one of them is if you have the average sales here like we do average of sales in our values and also you can see there we've summarized it by the average and say we want to go into our row label and calculate item from there we get a warning that averages standard deviations and variances are not supported when a pivot has calculated items. So that's one shortfall. Now if you had a calculated item in here already and you wanted to add in there an average standard deviation or a variance, 
then that also could not be done. Let's go to our next shortcoming here, grouped items. We have group sales here. Now let's go into our field items and try to put in that calculated item. Again, we get a warning that we cannot do this because the pivot table report field is grouped. Now if we had a calculated item in there and we wanted to group anything with a calculated item in there, then that also would not work. And finally, when you're in a row label here, you can only do a calculated item for the actual row label that you're in. So we've selected products, you can't go and create a calculated item for salesperson. To do that, you gotta click in salesperson and then go to field items sets and choose calculated item. If you wanna do it for products, you gotta click in products and then choose calculated items. I'm going to create a couple of calculated items, one for the row labels and one for the column labels. And then I'll show you how we can use the solve order to get around a problem that can occur. So first of all, let's do a calculated item for our months. Now, click in the row labels there and go to the options and fields, items and sets and choose calculated item. And our formula will be the December sales divided by all of the year sales. So I want to see the weight of sales in December. So let's change the name to December portion percentage. And in here, we're gonna choose December, and then we're gonna divide it by the sum of all the months. Close bracket and press OK. Just make this a bit bigger and in here. So we go to the home tab and then we just put in a percentage in there and we just put a decimal place if you like. Now next let's sum the different regions that we have. So we're going to sum Americas and Africa into West and Europe and Asia into East. So to do this, we just gotta click anywhere in the column label and go to the options. Under fields, items and sets, choose calculate item. In here, we're gonna call the first formula East, and we're gonna choose Europe plus Asia, and we'll add. The next formula will be West, and in here, we're gonna choose Americas and and Africa and press OK. So finally, we change this around. So Americas and Africa we can put together along with West. And then Europe and Asia are together and the totals are there. Okay. Now let's just format this a bit. Okay. And in here, we'll put a bold for the west. And for the east, we can bold that so we can see our results. Now we have a problem here in that the calculation that's down here is not the same calculation as the December portion. It's giving us a wrong calculation. So we can fix this. Let's go to the options and field items and sets and choose solve order. Now in here in solve order, it says if the value in a pivot cell is affected by two or more calculated items, the value is determined by the last formula in the solve order. So we have two different calculated items. So what it's doing, it's taking the last calculation that we did, the West, which is Americas plus Africa. So it's taking that calculation to calculate this. We don't want that. Now we're gonna move the December portion percentage to the end so it can take effect. Now to do that, we click and then move it down and 
press close. You can see the percentages have changed. And also you can see there that the formulas changed and in there the formulas changed. So you can use a solve order if you have two or more calculated items that are clashing. Every time you create a calculated item or a calculated field, then the formulas that you use are listed. Now to check that, you just click anywhere in the pivot table, go to options, field items and sets, and then choose list formulas. Now in here, we have our calculated item formula for the December portion. Also, we have the calculated item for our column labels. Choose that and we can see the East formula equals Euro plus Asia. The West formula equals Americas plus Africa. And the December portion percentage equals December divided by the sum of the whole year. And the listed in order of one, two, three. So the December portion is the last sub order. And that takes precedence when there are two or more calculated items that clash. So this is a good way to see what calculated items or calculated fields that you have in your pivot table. Now we have a calculated field here, which we created earlier. Now we can remove these temporarily. If you can see here on the right hand side, on the pivot table field list, we have the COGS calculated field in our pivot cache. We can just uncheck and remove it. And then we can go and do some adjustments to our pivot table. For example, we can take out the sales region and sales month, and we just bring in here the quarters. And if we want to bring in the cogs again, then we can bring it in there. And the only thing is that we just need to format this into a percentage and press percent and press OK. So you can temporarily check or uncheck the calculated fields. The order of operations is a rule used to clarify which procedures should be performed first in a given mathematical expression. The calculations in a pivot table also follow this order of operations. For example, we have our table here called order of operations listed by first to last. So the brackets take precedence, then the percentages, then the exponents, then we have the division and multiplication come next. Now these are equal in precedence. Addition and subtraction come next. Now these are also equal in precedence. And then we have the comparisons. Now let's go to our example up here just to have a look. We have the formula 2 plus 4 times 5. So in here, the multiplication has a higher order than the addition so this will get calculated first so the 4 times 5 will get calculated first so 4 times 5 is 20 and then it will add it to because the addition comes after the multiplication in the order so we have 22 now in our next example we have put brackets between 2 and 4 so obviously the brackets which come first in the order of operations take precedence so it will calculate 2 plus 4 first which is 6 and then it will multiply it. So 6 times 5 is 30. Now this order of operations is also used in Excel and in your calculated items and fields. So when you're making your formula, just make sure that to look at this order of operations if your formula is not working properly. In this chapter, we're going to create a PNL where we show the revenue COGS, gross profit, expenses, and then get our operating profit over the 12 months. And what we're going to do is add in a trend line by inserting some spark lines. And also we're going to put in a slicer to see the different years. Now, we're going to include calculated items in here. And the calculated items are the gross profit. So the calculation will be revenue minus COGS, and then the second calculated item is down here, which is operating profit, which will be the calculation gross profit minus expenses. 
So we have our data in here and we have our months going down on the months column. We have our different years. We have the different PL types separated to COGS, expenses and revenues. And they separate it into the different items. So we have different expense items, as you can see in a normal business. And we have the actual values and the plan values. So this is a typical PL that you find in most businesses. Now from in here, we can create a pivot table. We go to insert and pivot table, and we'll put it into a new worksheet and press OK. In the row labels, we're gonna drop in the PL type. And then we can drop in the item at the bottom. And then on the column labels, we'll put in our months. And in the values area, we'll put in the actual dollars. Now let's close this and we have a PL taking shape. Now let's just make a few design changes. We can choose this pivot table design. Go to view and get rid of the grid lines. We can reduce this to about 80%. Now the grand total we don't want there, we can just click on grand total, right click and then remove grand total. So we have our PL here. Now let's click on COGS and we can actually bring the revenue up there but just typing in revenue, REV and you see it gives us the revenue option and then press tab. So it automatically moves the revenue from the bottom to the top. We have our COGS and that's fine. Let's minimize that. And now we have the expenses there. So what we're gonna do now is get the gross profit. So let's click anywhere in our PL type item and then go to the options and fields, items, and sets. And in here we choose calculated item. Now the calculated item we're gonna do is gonna be called gross profit. So it's gonna be revenue minus COGS. So the name is gross profit. And the formula, we just click there, backspace to get rid of zero. And then we're gonna get the revenue, double click, the minus sign, and then double click on COGS. And then we'll press OK. And you can see it's added it down here, gross profit. Now it's calculated all the different items that belong in the revenue, but we don't want that. So what we can do is the actual values are within the subtotals in here. So let's minimize gross profit and let's go up here and then we can just click on there and grab it and just put it in there. Now let's right click and show the field list and from the values area, let's just format the numbers. So we can put in there a comma. Let's choose number format and then number. No, there's more places and use a thousand separator and put a negative red font there. Okay. So we've entered our first calculated item called gross profit. Now we're gonna add in our second calculated item and it's gonna be called operating profit. And it's gonna be the calculation of gross profit minus expenses. So firstly, we have to put in our cursor in one of the items within the field name called PL type. Now anywhere here in the blue area, we can choose and then go to options, field items and sets, calculated item. Now from the drop down, you see we have the gross profit, but we want to create a new calculated item and we're going to call it operating profit. In the formula, let's get rid of the zero. And then in the items, we have the gross profit, which was the calculated item that we created earlier. Let's double click there and then press minus and then double click in the expenses and then press OK. And we'll see we have the different calculations for the operating profit. Now in the operating profit here, we have the expenses being deducted from the gross profit amounts. Okay, so now let's go to the operating profit. Now, we don't actually need these numbers here. They don't mean anything to us. We just need the subtotal there. So let's minimize operating profit and then go all the way up. Now, one thing is let's get rid of the grand total there. We can go to design, grand totals and off rows and columns. Now let's select the months there and right click and column width. Let's choose 12. Now in here, we're going to put in our trend. So we're going to put in some spark lines to see our months and how they're trending. So let's type in trend. 
and we can click there and format the painter and just bring it in there. Now one thing, let's make this centered, okay? And we can just format that there. Okay, so now let's go into insert and spark lines. Let's choose a column for our subtotals. The data range will be January to December. Press enter and then press OK. So we have the spark line. Let's make this a little bit bigger. Now let's choose a different color. We just go a light color there. And then under the marker color for the high points, we want a red. So I want to see the highest points. So we'll see here that our fifth month was the highest point. Now, what we're going to do is press Control Copy and highlight this area. Hold down the Control key and then highlight the operating profit. Look up the Control key and now I just press Control V. And it fills in the spark lines for the respective subtotals. Now, we're going to put in a spark line in here. So go into Insert and let's put a line. Data range, January to December. Press Enter and then OK. Now once again, the color will go blue color and that high point will make it red. And again, Control Copy, select that, hold the Control key down and then select the other range. Let go of everything. Now Control V. So we have entered the different spark lines there. Now, last thing we want to do is put in a slicer on the top here, so control the gears. So click in your pivot table, options, insert slicer, let's choose a year and press OK. So from in here, we can actually, now that it's selected, choose the columns, two, three, and then we can just make it a little bit bigger and right click in there and then slicer settings. Let's get rid of the display header and press OK. And we can bring that like that. And we, let's put it in the corner there. OK. So we have our PL here with our sparkline trends and our years here. So if we choose the years 2012, the numbers change, the sparklines change, the same for 2013, and the same for 2014. And I think your boss will be pretty proud of the final product. In this chapter, we're going to create a variance report for our sales regions and products over the different quarters. And we've used the calculated fields to calculate our variance. So what we've done is we've got the actual versus the plan. Now you can see that in yellow for each of the quarters and also for the total on the right hand side there. And with our slicer, we can actually change the months and our calculated fields change as well. So let's go over to our data table and I'll explain to you how we can set this variance report up. So here we are in our data source. We have the customer, product, salesperson, sales region as we had before, the order date, and here we have the actual and plan. And we're going to use these fields here to calculate our calculated field. So we're going to say the actual minus the plan will give us our new calculated field. Now let's click anywhere in our data table and go to Insert and Pivot Table, and we'll go and put it into a new worksheet and press OK. Now on the row labels, we're gonna put in the sales region and the products. On the sales value, we're gonna put in the actual and the plan. And in the column labels, we're gonna put in there the sales month. And let's grab the sales month and just bring it on top there on the column labels. Now this view, we're going to see the actual and then the plan. And then we're going to add in a calculated field in the next column down here. And it's going to say actual minus the plan and it'll give us the variance. So let's close in here and do some cosmetic changes. I will go to view and get rid of the grid lines and then let's minimize this. Let's go all the way down like that, like that just for now. And we can make the changes later. Okay, so now that we're in our pivot table, we can just go to the options and choose the field items and sets, and then choose calculated field. Now in here, the name, we're gonna call it actual versus plan. Actual versus plan. 
in the formula, let's get rid of the zero, and we're gonna double click on the actual field, put the minus, and then double click on the plan field, and then press OK. So you can see there the sum of actual versus plan has been added for each of the months. We'll go right across there. You can see that's been added there. Okay, let's click and right click and show field list. Now, the sum of actual versus plan, the calculated field has been added into the values area. Now let's choose a drop down, go to value field settings, and instead of calling it sum of actual versus plan, let's get rid of this and let's put in an asterisk just to distinguish it that it is a calculated field. And then just press OK. Let's go to select entire pivot table, then select values, and then press Control and 1 to bring up the format cells dialog box. And in the number, let's just format the number, get rid of the decimal places, the thousand separator, and the red negative font, and press OK. You see that changes it for everything there. Now what we're going to do is group our months into quarters. So, so let's highlight the months I want to group. Right click in there and press group. Now the default name group one is shown, but we can overwrite that by just typing in Q1 in the keyboard and pressing enter. Let's do the same thing for the other months. Let's grab April, May and June. Right click, group and call it Q2. Let's grab July, August, September, and call it Q3. And then finally, October, November, and December. Right click, group, and call it Q4. Okay, let's just make this a little bit neater. Okay, let's put it on the left. Because now that everything's grouped, we can just right click and expand collapse collapse entire field. So it collapses all the fields and we have the actual versus plan for each of the quarters now. So let's highlight the actual versus plan. Hold the control key down on your keyboard and let's just select the calculated field. And then in the font, let's put in a yellow font just to distinguish it. Now if we hover over the actual versus plan calculated field, we get a little black arrow. Now press the mouse and then it highlights everything. Press Control 1 and we get the format cells in the border. We can put in there a black or a blue border. Let's put in a blue one and then on the right hand side just to show where the actual versus plan finishes. In the column labels and the row labels, we don't want that. Let's go to options and then get rid of the field headers. Now finally, we're going to put in a slicer just to see the different years. So let's make a bit of space in there to put in the slicer. Click around in the pivot table, go to options, insert slicer, and let's grab the sales year. So financial year, and press OK. Now right click in there, go to slicer settings, and click in there just to get rid of the display header, and press OK. Now let's move this like that. And in the columns, let's make it into three columns there. And we can move it over there and we can change. So with the slicer, if we choose 2012, the actual versus plan calculated field changes for each quarter and the total. 2013, the same thing, and 2014 as well. So here's a quick variance report created by using a calculated field for your actual versus plan fields. With charts, you can graphically see your data and can easily see trends within your data. Now in a pivot table, you can insert pivot charts. Now this is a visual way to see your pivot table data. A pivot chart is an extension of your pivot table. So as you're making changes to your pivot table, then your chart also gets changed. So let's insert a pivot chart. Well first, we have to click in our pivot table and in our pivot table tools tab in our ribbon, we choose the options, and on the right hand side, under tools, we have pivot chart, and then we choose there. Now, we get our insert chart dialog box, and we have the different charts on the left. Now, let's 
insert a simple column chart and press OK. So now we have our chart in here. Now note that the x-axis has the sales region. So all the row labels are always in the x-axis. And in the y-axis, we have our years and our values. If we want to move around the sales regions to the column labels, we can do that. And you'll see that our pivot chart will also change. So let's get the sales region from the row labels to the column labels, and then the financial year down to the row labels. As you can see now in the x-axis, we have our financial year, and on the y-axis, we are showing our regions. Now you'll also note that when you're using a pivot chart, that the names change here. So instead of row labels, we have access fields, categories. Instead of column labels, we have legend fields, series. Another thing that you will notice is that we get our filters in our pivot chart. So we can actually filter from in here. So we can choose the financial year, just to include two years, and that gets changed, as well as our pivot table. So they're both connected. So this pivot chart is an extension of the pivot table. Now we can make the changes from the pivot table and select all, and the pivot chart gets changed as well. Sales regions, we can just choose one. This gets amended, and so does our pivot table. We can also go back to our pivot table and make the changes there. Now these report filters within our chart takes up space. So I like to get rid of them. Now just hover over one of the report filters and right click, and then choose the hide all fill buttons on chart. So now we're just showing our chart. Now we can use our pivot table to control the filters and change our chart. Go back and select all. So these pivot charts give us the power to visually see our data within our pivot table. Now if we click on our pivot chart, we get the pivot chart tools on the ribbon here. And we have the design, layout, format, and analyze. Now let's click on analyze. In here, we can see the field buttons. So we can show all, or we can hide all, or choose whichever ones we want to see. We also have the option to see our field list. We can clear all, or clear all filters from here. We can also refresh the data, and we can insert slices. So let's insert a slicer. Now we've covered slices in our chapter seven. Okay, so let's go and choose our sales quarter, and then we can also choose our sales person and press OK. So we have our two slices added in here. We can just move them a bit like this. Okay, so as we choose the salesperson, then the chart and the pivot table gets filtered automatically. Now the same thing for the sales quarters, if you want to see Q1, Q2, Q3, and Q4. So the slices gives us a visual way to see our filters that we have selected. Now we can also click in our pivot table and choose options and insert slicer. And from in here, we can choose our financial year and press OK. And now we can choose 2011, 2013, and 2014. So there's a couple ways to insert a slicer. And once you insert them, they're all connected to the pivot chart and also the pivot table. If you click in your pivot chart, you get the pivot chart tools tab. And we have analyze, format, layout, and design. Now under design, we have a few different options here. First of all, we can change the chart type. If we click in there, we can choose any of these charts to change them to. Let's choose pie chart and press OK. And you see that that has changed. We can go back, choose a line, and then that changes as well. 
And let's choose an XY scatter and press OK. Now we get a warning that we cannot use an XY scatter, bubble or stock chart type with a pivot chart. So that's the only limitation to choosing a chart is that we cannot choose these three charts. Press OK, we can go back. Now we have some more information here. We can switch the row column. So we have the years in our row labels and our regions in our column labels. And we can switch that around by pressing this. As you can see, the pivot table has changed and so has our pivot chart. We can press it again to switch it back. Now in the chart layouts, in the drop down arrow here, you have 11 different layouts to choose, where they have the chart title, the axis titles, the legend, and the data labels in different formats. So you can pick and choose from in here, whichever format you like. Now some of them work well, others not, but you have the option to have a look. Okay, another thing that we can do is choose a different chart style. So from this drop down arrow, you have the multi colors here, you have the gray look. Now let's move it over here so you can look at the different colors. Now we can choose in there. This is the 3D look. Okay, so you can choose these different styles here, just depending on what you're trying to achieve, personal preferences. I like this style here. And finally, on the far right hand side, we have the location where we can move the chart. So if you click on there, you have the option to move the chart. It says choose where you want the chart to be placed. We can create a new sheet or we can move it within one of our existing sheets. Now the pivot is the pivot sheet here and our data table is a data table sheet there. We can move it to a new sheet and then press OK. Now we move it into a brand new sheet and it's called chart five. Now in here, if you go to your pivot table and you choose a quarter and you go back, then this changes accordingly. Now we can go back to our Analyze and put in our field buttons from in here and then we can choose our filters from in here. If you want to move it back, go back to Design, Move Chart, Object In, Pivot, where we were before and it moves it back in here. When we click in our Pivot Chart, under Pivot Chart Tools, we have our Layout tab. Now in here, we have the different labels, axis, background, and analysis that we can choose. Now for labels, we have the chart title. The first option is None. Then we can center it Overlay Title. And then we can center it Above Chart. Under the axis titles, first of all, the primary horizontal axis, which is on the bottom of the chart, we can choose the title below the axis, or we can have none. We can also choose more options in here, where we can format it. Go to the vertical axis on the left hand side of the pivot chart. You can have the rotator view, the vertical title, and the horizontal title. And once again, we can go to more primary options down here. In the legend, we can turn it off. In the shell on the right, at the top, left, at the bottom of the chart, we can overlay it at the right, or we can overlay it 
at the left. And we can choose more options here where we can format it. Now under data labels, we can switch them off. We can center them, inside end, inside base, and outside end. And more options there. On the data table, we can show data table at the bottom. We can show with legend keys. More options down there. On the axis, the horizontal axis, which is the bottom, we can have none. We can show left to right. And show axis without labeling or show right to left axis the vertical axis we can have none we can show default axis and show axis in thousands we can show axis in millions in billions and show access with log scale. Let's go back here and set it up to left to right and default axis. In the grid lines, we can have minor grid lines, major and minor grid lines. In the vertical grid lines, we can have major grid lines, minor grid lines, and major and minor grid lines. In the plot area, we can have none, we can show plot area. We also have the more plot area options. Now in here, in the analysis, we can choose a trend line. So we can put in a linear trend line and it gives us the option of which region to choose. Let's choose Americas and we'll get the trend line there. We can have an exponential trend line, a linear forecast trend line, and a two period moving average. In error bars, we can have error bars with a standard error, we can have error bars with percentage, and also with a standard deviation. And finally, the chart name, chart one, you can change it to our own name, regional chart, and press OK. And you can see this changes here and also in the name box our chart changes there. So there's a few different ways where you can lay out your chart to make it look more appealing and have information stand out so people can analyze it quickly. Now to format our pivot chart we just have to click in it and we get the pivot chart tools tab and then we choose the format tab. On the far left hand side, we have the drop down box where we can choose which part of the pivot chart we can format. So first of all is a chart area and in here we can use the different shape fields. Okay. So what I'll do now is I'll just put in a slight background like this. We can also change the text from in here. What I'll use is a slight gray. So you have all these options here where you can change the text and the shape field and also the different colors from in there, borders and fields from in there. Okay. So you've got a, a different variety of options that you can choose. Now let's go to our next area, which is the horizontal category axis. Now you see the border there. Okay. So I want to put in there a text field to make it a little bit darker okay now the legend we can put in there a shape fill like that the plot area now we're going to use the same shape fill as we have for our whole area okay next is our vertical value axis and in there, we can change the way that the text font is. 
we can put a, a little bit darker, just like that. Now, the vertical value axis and major grid lines, now these are the grid lines here, I usually like to have them a little bit lighter in the background, okay? So you don't see them that much. Now you can choose these different styles. You can have them as dark as you want so they can stand out. But I like to have them a little bit lighter. So the shape outline, a white background, which will look nice as well. Or you can put a slight grayish background. Next is the series Americas. Now in here, you can actually change the color of the column chart. Under shape view, we can choose different colors. Or we can go to the gradient and choose different gradient variations. And you see the live preview. Okay. If you go to more gradients, then you can choose from in here some different options. Now you can do the same thing for Europe, Asia, and Africa. Okay. Now let's go back to the chart area and the shape outline. Let's put a border in there. Okay. So I want to put a, a dark border like this. Go back in. The weight, I want to make it a little bit thicker. Make it like that. Go back in. You can actually put dashes if you like. Now, back in here, under more lines, under the cap type, I want to make it round and then round here. So we get the round edges, okay? And then round corners. And you can make it thicker like this. I usually have it about five points. And then close. Now, there's another way where you can change your graph. If you click in there and press Control 1 from your keyboard, it actually brings up the dialog box. So you can change it from in here. You can put in the fields, border color, border style, shadows, glow and soft edges, 3D format, the size, properties, and, and alternative text. So you've got a few options there. Now, you can actually click where you want to change, and this dialog box changes as well. So the solid line, we can go back and put in a, a white line, and it will change. Let's click on our axis. So it brings in the format axis, okay? So in here, we have the minimum and maximum points that we can choose. Now, if we keep it at auto, it'll be at auto. But say we want to change it to 1.6 million. So the maximum amount, let's fix it. Instead of 1.8, let's put it 1.6, and we'll see what happens. You see that? It changes like that. So you can have it fixed, or you can have it auto. If it's a one-off, graph, you can fix it, but if it gets updated automatically, then keep it at auto. You can also have the major tick marks outside, inside, across. Now, these are the marks in here. The same thing, if you click at the bottom there, you've got the cross you can choose, or you've got the minor tick mark you can have inside. Now, you can't see it there, but if we go in here, and the minor tick mark, Let's make it inside. You can see that there. Now, if we want to go to our graph, we can choose there and make our color changes. Or we can go here on our axis or our labels there. So you can use this option as well. So it's important to spend some time to make your graph more attractive because you never know who's going to end up looking at it. The more appealing it is, the better it looks on you. Pivot charts have come a long way since Excel 2007. In 2010, you have more formatting options. First of all, you don't lose the formatting when the pivot table changes. And then, you also have the option to use slices as your filters. Now, one thing you can't do is insert XY scatter, bubble chart, or stock charts from your pivot table. But there's a workaround. What we can do is reference the cells outside the pivot table. Now to do this, make sure that when you're in the pivot table, under options and the drop down box, the generate get pivot data is switched off just like this. So there's no tick option there. So let's go outside our pivot table and press plus or equals and then choose row labels. Then grab the row labels, drag it all the way down, 
and then drag it all the way across so we have that in there. Now what you can do is control copy if you like and then right click and paste the values so you can hard copy them or you can just keep it like this so it can be linked to the pivot table. Now what we can do is go to insert and scatter chart from in there. So now we have our, our scatter chart inserted. So if we go to our pivot table here and we filter by regions, our pivot chart changes accordingly. And as well, if we just want to choose a few of the months, we can, and that changes as well. We can go back and select all. So this workaround works well if you want to use XY scatter charts, bubble charts, or stop charts. In chapter 9.5, we created this chart here. And now I wanna save this chart as a template and then use it next time I create a pivot chart. So I don't have to go again through all the steps to create this beautiful looking chart. So first of all, what we need to do is save this chart as a template. Click on the chart and go to design. On the far left hand side, there's a button here called save as template. Now it brings us to this extension, which is Microsoft templates charts. We have to save it in there so we can access it later on. Now let's name this to cool column chart. You can name this to whatever you like and press save. Okay, so now let's go back to our pivot table and insert a pivot chart like this. We can put a column and press OK and move it up here. Now what we need to do is go to the change chart type and under templates, we have our previously saved template. If you hover over there, you see the name cool column chart and press OK and it changes it accordingly. It also works on other charts. So instead of a column chart, we can change it to a pie chart and press OK. And it keeps those formats in there as well. If you click on your pivot chart and then right click, you have these options here that you can choose. So you can refresh the data. You can cut and paste the pivot chart somewhere else. Now you can use the font there. You can also change the chart type from in here. So you can choose a different chart. Another thing you can do is select the data. So it brings up the data here and you can switch the row and column from in there. So you have the Americas now on the x-axis. And if you go again, you have the years on the x-axis. Press OK, right click again. You can move the chart to a new sheet or to an existing workbook. You can also format the chart area from in here. So you have the option there and you can click anywhere in your chart to change the area that you can format. And another way to format is to go to format and format selection. And from in there you can make your changes or you can choose which part you want to make the changes. We can insert a chart title and then link that to one of our pivot table cells. So every time we filter, then the chart changes as well. So let's go to our layout and then choose chart title and put it above the chart. Now we have the chart title there. We can actually go to our formula box and press equals and then choose the filter there and press OK. So now when we go and choose Q1, it changes to Q1. When we choose Q2, it changes to Q2. Now the only thing is if we have multiple values, it will show as multiple items. And then if we put it to all, it will show as all. But it works well if you want to show each quarter and take a snapshot and send it over to your manager to have a look at it. There's a couple of ways you can copy a chart. You can click in the current chart and press Control copy 
from your keyboard and then click anywhere else in your workbook and press Ctrl V, Ctrl Z to go back. Another way is to click in your pivot chart and then hold the Ctrl key while your mouse is selecting the chart and then move across like this and let go of your mouse and now let go of your Ctrl key and you've copied the chart in there and now you can go to design and change the chart type and you can change it to a pie chart. There's a quick way to insert a pivot chart. All you need to do is click in your pivot table and press the F11 key on your keyboard and it puts the pivot chart into a new worksheet called chart number three. And from in here, you can make your changes and also your pivot table changes accordingly. And if you go back, you can see the changes have been made there. We're back in our pivot table. If we click in here and we press Alt F1, we create a pivot chart on the same page. We can create a pivot chart directly from our data source. All we need to do is click in our data source and go to the insert tab. Now from the pivot table drop down arrow, we choose pivot chart and then we select to put into a new worksheet and press OK. Now we have our empty pivot table and pivot chart and now we can start creating our pivot chart. Now let's drop in our X axis into our row labels. Let's drop in our Y axis into our column labels and let's drop in our values into our values area. So now we've created our pivot table as well as our pivot chart all in one go. You can take this pivot chart and email it to one of your colleagues or your managers and click in your pivot chart and press Control copy from your keyboard. Now go to your email outlook or whatever email that you're using and in your new message, you can just press Control V and then it gets inserted in there and you can send it to your boss for review. Now let's get rid of that. Another way you can do it is go into your insert and screenshot and then go to screen clippings. Now, if you choose that, it'll go to your previous screen. So we were using the Excel screen. And then from in here, you can actually take a snapshot like this and then then that gets embedded into your email body. And from in here, you can format it whichever way you like and then email it from there. We can copy and paste a pivot chart into a PowerPoint presentation and then make the changes back into the Excel sheet and then from there, update the PowerPoint. Now to do this, just click in your pivot chart, press Control copy. Let's go into our open presentation and right click and then choose the keep source formatting and link data and press OK. So in here, you can make your different changes if you like. And let's go back and close our file here. So what we can also do is edit the data. So next time you open this and you want to edit the data, you can just press that and it opens up the information. So from in here, we can actually make our choices instead of Q3, we can just Q2 and you can see that changes automatically. And also we can change the way this looks so we can move financial year there and sales regions there and that changes as well. Or we can put in there some products and then our pivot chart changes in our PowerPoint presentation. So we can save this, get rid of it and then we have the updated chart in there for our presentation. There are a couple ways to print your pivot chart. 
If you have your pivot table and your pivot chart in one worksheet, then you can just click in your pivot chart and go to the file and print. Now in here, you can see that we have the view on our right hand side and the settings we have print selected chart. So it will print this selected chart and we can press print and you can print it to your printer or if you choose PDF, you can actually save it as a PDF format. Let's press print and I'll show you here and then press OK. And we just reduce this and we see it's printed into PDF and you can save it or email it to whoever you like as a PDF format. And let's get out of this. Now, another way you can print the pivot chart is if you click in your pivot table and press F11, then it creates a, another chart onto a separate worksheet. Now, when you're in here, you can go to File and press Print. And you can see here now the view is a little bit bigger than before. So it's much better using this format. And from in here, you can print to your printer or to a PDF document. Sparklines are new in Excel 2010. And what they are are small graphical representations of each data row. So to insert, we're going to click outside our pivot table and go to insert and spark lines. Now it asks us here our data range. So let's select the first row and then location is F5. That's fine. Press OK. And now we can just drag it all the way down. So you see there our graphical representation for each of our rows. We have our troughs and peaks. If we click in there, we can actually change it to a column chart and then we can do a light color there. And if we go to the marker color, we can actually highlight the high point and just make it a little bit darker so you can see the high points there. Now we can also, if we choose Q1, you'll only collect Q1 data, Q2, and then if we choose all, we see all the data. So it gives us a quick snapshot of our troughs and peaks without having to insert a pivot chart. There are a few tips to follow when making a nice pivot chart. First of all, make sure that you have a title here. What I've done is I've linked the title to a reference cell here. And what I've said is it equals the report filter so 2012, and I put the and sign, and then in brackets, I put my title in there. Okay, so if we change this to 2013, then that gets changed automatically. So I always have a title in there. Another thing we need to do is to sort the pivot chart in descending order or ascending order. But I like descending order because you see the best performer first. So to do that, you go onto your pivot chart, right click, sort, largest to smallest. So we have the largest to smallest there. And the next one is to make sure that we start at zero. Now this starting point is at 2.4 million. Now we can see here that it seems that Europe is twice the size of America's, but that's not the case because the value for Europe is 2.6 million and the value for America is 2.5 million. Now to fix this problem, you click in your axis, press Control 1, and then the minimum amount, the fixed, change to zero and press OK. And finally, instead of having numbers in your axis, we can actually get rid of them and put some data labels. Now to insert data labels, just click in your graphs and make sure they're all selected. Right click and add data labels. So we've added the amounts there. Now let's click on the data labels. We can actually click twice to edit one, or we can click out and go back in to edit all of them. Press Control 1, and in here we can move them wherever we want, but let's put them on the top there. We can also choose the category name there, and we'll leave it as is. Now we can Click on our axis there and press delete to get rid of it. And also in our grid lines, click and delete. And now we can just sort, right click and sort 
largest to smallest. And then we can click in here and we can just make that a little bit darker. And always try to keep your graphs simple. Less is more when you're working with pivot charts. What we've done here is created three different charts and with our slices, we can actually choose which charts to show based on a named range formula that we used here. And then we can also use slices to change the data within each of the chart chosen. Now this is a similar concept to chapter 7.11 for the interactive employee photos with slices. Now instead of inserting photos, we're going to insert pivot charts. So I can go on to the how to section and explain how it's done. Now first of all, we have to create a table. So number one, two, three and the charts we've named regional sales, orders received and top five channels. So second is to create a pivot table. So we can highlight this and insert a pivot table. And let's put into our existing worksheet just out here on the right and we want to put in there the row labels to equal numbers so grab the numbers for the row labels now let's get rid of the grand total just into here so now that we've moved the pivot table here we need to name the first row number of cells down so this will tell us if it's selection number one it'll move one row down if it's Selection number two, it'll move two rows down. If it's selection number three, it'll move three rows down. So to name the range, we need to go into our name box in there and call it number of cells down. Let me just put an underscore and press enter. So if we click out of that and click back in, we'll see that's named range. So the next step now is to insert a slicer. To do this, we'll go to options insert slicer and choose the chart so we have the three different charts so what we need to do next is to define a name for the starting position so this is our starting position and we're going to name it start here let's call it start here and underscore okay the next step is to make this row 230 high so Let's grab the three different rows that we're going to put in our charts. Make the height at 230. So the pivot charts can fit in there perfectly. Number six is to insert the pivot charts. So what we can do is go back in here and grab the charts that we made before. So all these charts are from in here, okay? So we can grab these and copy them instead of redoing it again. Control copy and then we can put them in here. Control V and escape. Okay, so they're in here. Now we just got to make sure that they are within the boundaries. Okay, so we may need to just adjust that a little bit. Move this there and this in here. Okay. So this should be fine now. So step number seven is define the name for the formula that would drive the pictures. So in here, we need to go to the formula and name manager, and we're gonna name this show chart. So let's go to new and call it show underscore chart and underscore. And this will refer to this function here, it'll be offset. And then we're saying, where's our starting position? Well, we named the range previously and we said it was start here. So we can put in the start here. The next argument is how many cells down, but well, we've named the range a number of cells down and that was named in the pivot table. So we can type that in number of cells down comma and then the next argument is how many columns to the left or right but we'll put in zero 
and then comma and close bracket and press OK and then close. So we've named that. Next is to copy the pivot charts and paste the picture link. So to copy the pivot chart, all we need to do is just go in our cell here and press Control Copy. Go up here, click in there. We've made this at 230 as well. So as big as those. So we'll go right click and choose here linked picture okay so we're pasting the linked picture from our first chart and we'll grab any of the three but we just use the first chart for now now the next step is to reference the picture to our offset named range so what we need to do is grab this show chart define name which we did before and link it to the chart here so we can actually link named ranges to pictures. So we can say show and we'll put that. We get the options here so we can double click the second one and press enter. Okay, so now it's working. And let's go to number 10 is to insert the slicer from the pivot chart and connect them. Okay, so first of all, let's grab our first slicer and we can move it up here. I'm just make sure it's working properly. Orders received, regional sales, top five channels. So that's correct. Now we can go in and grab the slices that we have here. So these slices were created from in here by going on to options and insert slicers, sales region, the financial year, and the sales person, and press OK. Hold down the control key, control X, and we'll go in here and press Control B, Escape. Okay, so we have our slices in here. So grab the slices and put them in there. And all we need to do is connect these slices to our pivot tables. Okay, we can put it like this for now. So right click, pivot table connections, and they're all connected, just to make sure they're all connected. Right click. Pivot table connections all connected. Okay, they're all connected. So these slices here are connected to the pivot charts, and this slicer here changes the chart type. So if we click 2012, that gets changed. If we click by salesperson, that gets changed, and by sales region. Based on what we've learned in this chapter, if we put everything together, we can make some interactive charts here, which are very powerful, and you can start making some dashboards. So have some fun, and let me know what you think about it. With a pivot chart, you cannot create an XY scatter, but I will show you how to do this via a workaround using the index function, to get our sum of sales and our sum of costs. And then with a slicer, create an option where we select sum of sales and then the graph changes to that. And then also select the cost and then the graph changes to reflect the cost information. Now, first what we have to do is create a, another pivot table which includes sales and costs in there. And I've numbered them one and two. So let's select that and go to insert and pivot table then we'll go to an existing worksheet and we can put it in here and press ok so i'm going to drop in the field in the row labels and the number in the values area and what i'll do now is from in here go to insert slicer and insert the field name in there so we have created our slicer and let's bring it up here now all we need to do is create an index function where we get the sales information or the cost information depending on the column that we choose. So if it's column one, it'll be sales. If it's column two, it'll be cost. So let's press index and then the array is gonna be in here, the sales and costs. Press F4 to lock the area in there. The row number, we're not gonna have a row number. Now the column number will be the link 
to the pivot table selection. So let's move this up here and press F4 to lock it in there and enter. So now if I double click in here and press cost, that means it's looking at column two and returning all the values in column two from our array. If I press sales, it's returning all the values from column one in our array. So now we can create a scatter graph from here. Just go to insert and scatter like this. And we just put it in there. So we choose the cost. We have the cost scatter graph. We choose the sales. We get our sales scatter graph. In this chapter, we're going to create a PNL pivot table report with graphs. Now we have our pivot table here that we created in our chapter eight. And what we've done here is we've actually put in some pivot charts for the expenses at the bottom here. And you can see the months going across from left to right. And then we have another pivot chart for the revenues going from left to right. And then we've added in our slices in there for the years. So each time we change the slicer, so let's choose 2013, the pivot charts will change and so will the pivot table here. So if we press that, you see that changes and then 2014, that changes as well. So it gives us a nice graphical representation of where our revenues and expenses are for each of the months. Now let's go to our data source and I'll show you how you can create this. So this is our pivot table that we created in chapter eight. And now all we need to do is just right click in there and go to expand collapse and collapse entire field because we don't want to see every little detail there. Okay. Now let's go to our data source and in here we have our accounting PL report. Let's create a pivot table, go to insert and pivot table and let's go to a new worksheet. Now in the row labels, we're going to add in the month. In the column labels, we're going to add in the PL type and the item and the values we're going to add in the actual in there. Now in the column labels, we only want to see the expenses. So from the drop down arrow, let's choose only the expenses and press OK. Now let's minimize this a little bit. So now that we have our pivot table, we can create our pivot chart because we know that anything in the row labels will be in the x-axis. So we'll go on the bottom and anything on the column label will be on the y-axis. So let's go to options and pivot chart. And in here, we're going to create a stacked column chart and press OK. So here is our chart here. And now let's right click in the filters there and go to hide all field buttons on chart. And then let's just make this a little bit bigger. So we have our chart in there. Now let's format this a little bit better. Click on the Y axis. And from the home button, we can just make that gray. Press control one and the number. Let's just put in there a separator with zero decimal places. Now click in the grid lines there and press control one again and the line color will be a solid line, but it'll just go a light gray. Now in the months here and choose from in here, just a blue color there. Now let's go on the pivot chart tools and let's choose in here the layout and grid lines, primary vertical grid lines, and let's put in some major grid lines there so we can separate the months. So now that we've clicked on our pivot chart, press Control X and let's go back to our pivot. And down here, let's press Control V. Okay, so we can add that in. So we have our expense graph there and we just align it so we can put in the months next to the months in there just like that we just probably move it into the left there finally let's get rid of the border press control one border color no line so it just is like this okay so we're happy with this we're going to use the same format for the revenue pivot chart now click 
in the graph go to design and save template as now in here it automatically takes you to the Microsoft templates and charts directory you can name this char to whatever you like let's call it PNL pivot table and press enter now the next step is to create a second pivot table for the revenue and from there we're going to create a pivot chart so go to insert and pivot table a new worksheet and we're going to drop in the months in the row labels the PNL type in the column labels and the item in the column labels and the actuals in the values area just like we had before now the only thing here we want to show the revenue only so let's just take the revenue like that let's go to pivot chart and let's put in a clustered column and press ok now whilst we're in here we can go to change chart type and then from the templates folder we can hover across to our PNL pivot table that we just saved previously. Click on that and press OK. And you can see that changes accordingly. So now we can grab that, press Control X, go to our pivot, scroll all the way up, and then Control V to include it in there. Now one thing we're going to do is click in the months and press delete because we don't see them. And then we can just double click in the home tab just to minimize it. We can actually minimize it from in here just so we can have a bit more room. Now let's move this across. So we're gonna align it into the months, just like we have before there. Now in here, we can add in right click and insert and press F4 again, just to have a bit more space. Let's click in our pivot table, go to options and then insert slicer and let's insert the year slicer and press ok and we can right click slicer settings get rid of the header from the options tab let's move the columns up to three now from here we can just move it like this and then we can change the color if we like and we can put it up here and we can just delete this so we can move it up a bit and from in here we can bring this up just so it can fit into the same page and finally let's right click in our slicer and go to pivot table connections and what we need to do is connect the different pivot tables to this slicer so by clicking the pivot table number two in sheet one and also the pivot table number three in sheet two we're connecting the pivot tables and respective pivot charts to this slicer. Press OK. So now when we press 2012, the slicer changes, the pivot charts change, and the pivot table changes accordingly. 2013 the same, and 2014 the same. Finally, we forgot just to make this a different chart. Right click, change the chart type, and let's go to the first type there. It just looks a little bit neater that way. Do another test and there we go. So here's a great example of how you can use a pivot table with different pivot charts and put it all into one page and then control it with a slicer to get some graphical analytics with your pivot table. In this chapter we've created a pivot chart dashboard. We've done this by creating three different pivot tables, one for a top five channel partner, which you can see in here. And then we've created the pivot chart and cut and pasted it into here. The same thing for the number of sales group. We create another pivot table and a pivot chart. We've cut it out and put it in here. And the same thing for the sales and cost per month. We have a separate pivot table we create a pivot chart and then we've placed it in here. What we've also done is inserted four different slices and we've connected them. And by choosing the different years, the pivot charts change automatically. So you get a nice looking dashboard with lots of metrics. You can choose the different months. You can also choose the different regions. Let's highlight everything again. 
And you can also choose the different sales ranges. With this dashboard, you are sure to wow your boss and get noticed. And I'll show you how to do this in a few steps. So this is our data set that we've been using. And we have all the different information here with the channel partners, the sales, the different regions, salesperson, and so forth. So now we're gonna create three different pivot tables. And from there, we're gonna create three separate pivot charts. One for the top five channel partners, the next one for the different sales groups, and the last one for sales and costs. So let's go to the first one and create the top five channel partners. Let's go to insert pivot table and put into a new worksheet. So let's get our channel partners and put into the row labels. We'll get our sales and drop it into the values. So we have our pivot table here. Now, first of all, let's right click in the values and we'll sort it from largest to smallest. And from the drop down box, let's go to value filters and we'll do the top five. So let's put in the top five items and press OK. So we have our top five channel partners. Now let's go to options and pivot chart and insert a pivot chart from in here. And let's choose a bar and press OK. Now let's just make some changes. Let's get rid of these buttons by right clicking in there. And let's get rid of the total there. Click and press delete. Let's go to design and let's choose this here with a white outline. And click on the grid lines and press delete. Now let's click on the Y axis and go to home and let's put in a dark font in there. And from in here, we can delete that because we don't want it. Now let's click once in your graph and right click and let's add some data labels in there. Now we can color them in. Let's put it into a blue there and then press control one and the number, let's put in a thousand separator and zero decimal places. In the title, let's double click in there and change the name to top five channel partners. And double click to highlight and let's put it into a dark gray there. Okay, now let's right click in the chart and then let's fill it in with a light gray background. And again, within the graph, click on there, right click and once again, let's fill it with a light gray. Now let's click on the edges and then press control one and the border color will do a solid line and we'll have a white border. And the border style we can just put in number five and let's make it round corners in here and press okay. So you see our chart is taking shape now we're gonna use this similar format for the other chart. So what we can do now is save this template and then when we create the next pivot chart, we can apply these different formats so we don't have to go through all the steps again. So once you click on your chart, go to design and save template as, you get this directory here and it goes to Microsoft templates and charts. And in here you can save your chart and let's call it dashboard chart and press save. Okay, so we've created our first chart. While it's clicked, press Control X, go to our dashboard, click anywhere in there, press Control V. So this is our first chart in there. And let's just put it just like that and we can reorganize that later. So let's go to our data table and create a second pivot table and pivot chart, which is gonna be sales groups. So go to insert pivot table, new worksheet. In here, we're going to put in the sales in our row labels. And from in here, right click and press group. And once you group it into ranges starting from 10,000 all the way to 100,000. And then the increase will be 10,000. We'll leave it like that and press OK. Now again, get the sales and drop it into the values area. And because we've grouped the sales, we automatically get a count of sales. And leave it like that, that's fine because that's what we want to use. Now let's include in there a pivot chart. Click the pivot chart. And we're gonna use a column and press okay. 
Now let's go to the change chart type and in our templates, let's get the previous template that we created, which is this one here called dashboard chart. Click on it and press OK. So you see we get the format as we had before, but now we can just right click in there and again change the chart type and let's put it into a column and press OK. So we've got the same format, but we have the different chart type. Now in here, just double click and rename this to number of sales per group. You can name it whatever you like. And let's put that in gray. Okay, let's click on the chart, press Control X and go to our dashboard, click anywhere in here, and press Control V. And we can just bring it all the way up here. And you see now we have our second pivot chart in there. Let's go back to our data table and we're gonna create a final pivot chart for sales and costs. Go to insert pivot table and press OK. In our row labels, we're gonna put the financial year and the sales month. In the values, we're gonna put in there the sales and then the costs. Now, we get a count of sales because before we grouped ourselves. So once we group our sales, the next time we create a pivot table, we get a count of sales, but that's okay. From the drop down arrow, go to value fill settings and choose some. Let's go to our pivot chart and insert a column chart and press OK. And let's get rid of the buttons there. Now we're not gonna use the same chart style as before because if we do that, it'll mess things up and it won't look good. So let's go back and I'll show you how it's done and press OK. It just doesn't make it nice. So let's press Control Z and get out of that. And now we're just gonna manually make some updates here. So we have our sales and our costs here. I want to put our costs as a line on the secondary axis here on the right hand side. So to do that, we've clicked in our sum of costs, which are in red, press Control one, and then plot series on, put secondary axis, and press close, and then change chart type, and let's put in a, a line, and press OK. So now we have the two charts on different axes. So the sales are in blue and they're depicted on the left hand side axis here. So let's put in a blue color there to distinguish it. Like this, press control one, number, and we can just put it like that. Now on the right hand side, we have our sum of costs. So let's click on that and then let's put in a red color there. And again, control one, and let's format the number. Now let's click on layout and go to access titles, the primary vertical axis. Let's choose that and we can put in there sales. We can right click in there and just put it in a blue color. Now let's go again to the access titles and go to the secondary vertical axis title just like that and put in that cost just to distinguish it. And let's put that in red. Let's click in there and press control one and we can move the legend to the bottom and press close. Now let's click on our grids there and we can delete that. Let's click in our axis there and put in a blue color. And now let's click in our line and press control one and the line color, let's put it into this light red color. And then the marker options, let's put in a circle and the marker fill, again, we just put it in like that into a light red color and press okay. Let's go on to our layout and put in a chart title, choose above chart and then double click in there and we're gonna call it sales and costs per month. And then double click in there and we'll put it into a gray color. Okay, now let's put in a gray background for our graph. Just click anywhere in there, right click, and then in here we choose a slight gray, then click within the graph and you can press F4 and it'll repeat the last action. So we have our graph there and now one last step is to put in a border. Click on the border, press Control one 
the border color will put in a white color and the border style will make it a bit thick number five and then pull round corners and press close so we have our chart there and now all we're going to do is just click on it press ctrl x and ctrl v and we have it there and we can just resize it just to make it a little bit bigger okay so now let's just double click in the home tab just to get a bit more space so we can see that so we have our three different pivot charts there that were created from the three separate pivot tables now the final thing we need to do is insert slices and then connect them so every time we change the slicer the three pivot charts are in sync so to do that we can simply click on any chart so let's go analyze and insert slicer and let's put in there the financial year the sales month the sales region and the sales and press OK. So we have our four different slices there. So let's grab the financial year and bring it up here and we just make some adjustments to it. Let's put it into three different columns and then let's make it dark and we can move it like this. Right click and slice the settings. Get rid of the display header. Let's make the height for, for the buttons a little bit bigger. So we have one slicer there. Let's grab our sales month. And again, right click just to get rid of the header. And from the options, let's put into three different columns that shows the different quarters. And then we can just resize it in here, just like that. And then once again, let's make it, the buttons a little bit bigger and then we can put in there a dark color. The next one are the sales regions. Let's grab it in here. Get rid of the display header. And then let's put into two different columns and resize it accordingly. And again, let's make this a little bit, the buttons a little bit bigger. We can put in a different color if we like, just to distinguish it. And finally, we have our sales. Now they're grouped into the different ranges. Let's get rid of the header. And then let's put it into separate groups. Then again, resize this. And we can make it a little bit bigger again. And let's drop it into two columns just so we can see that better. Okay, all the way to the bottom there, and then the color. Let's choose that. Let's click on the different slices, press control key, and click on all of them just to align them. Go to align, we can say align center. Now, we need to connect the slices because if we choose one slicer, it's only gonna change the bottom one because that's a chart that we chose to insert the slicer. So. Let's right click in each of the slices and go to pivot table connections and let's tick on the empty boxes. So what we're doing here is we're saying that pivot table number three in sheet two and pivot table number two in sheet one are being connected. Press OK. The same thing for all of them. If we choose 2012, the chart changes, 2013 and 2014. Same thing for the months. Let's highlight all of them like that. And then we have the different regions. And also we have the different sales ranges there as well. Now if you see there, we've got the different sales ranges. If we go to our first sheet, we can see the different sales ranges. So as we choose that, it changes the pivot table accordingly. So this gets updated, even though you don't see it, it's on another sheet, it gets filtered accordingly. Let's go back in here. Now, let's highlight everything just by holding down the mouse and selecting it all. So you can see we've created a pretty impressive dashboard in just a few steps. And I'm sure that with this dashboard, you're gonna get noticed, but the next round of promotions, I'm sure that your name will be mentioned. In Excel 2010, you can add the new conditional formatting options like data bars, color scales, 
and icon sets. The conditional formatting is embedded within the pivot table structure, so if you update and refresh the pivot table, then so does the conditional formatting. Now to insert that conditional format, you're going to click anywhere in your pivot table, and then from the Home tab, choose Conditional Formatting, and let's choose Highlight Cells Rules. And we'll choose Greater Than. So in here we get a dialog box, and we can choose the amount to put in there. So let's say anything greater than 600,000. Now we can format it with a light red fill, with dark red text, and you've got a few other options there. Now we can also custom format. Now we get the Format Cells dialog box, and under Fill, we can choose the different color to format it with. And let's choose a red, and press OK, and then OK. Now we get this drop-down box here that says Apply Formatting Rule 2. We can choose Selected Cells, we can choose all cells showing some of values. And if you choose that, it will also highlight the subtotals and grand totals. And the third option is all cells showing sum of sales and also the values that are in the row and column labels. Now, this third option is not going to highlight any subtotals or grand totals. So most of the time, you're going to choose the third option. So we have the values there that are more than 600,000. Now to make changes to this conditional format, we'll go back into the conditional formatting option, and we can choose clear rules, and from in here, clear rules from this pivot table, we can just click on that. Or we can go to manage rules, so we can edit the rule, we can change the dollar value from in here, we can also change where the rule applies to, Let's cancel out of there. We can create a new rule, or we can actually delete a rule from in here. And let's press OK just to get out of it. So with conditional formatting, it gives you the option to highlight the values that will make your analysis much easier to do. To highlight cell rules based on the values, you'll actually click in the values within your pivot table. You need to go to the Home tab and under Conditional Formatting, choose Highlight Sales Rules. And from in here, you've got four different options. Greater than, less than, between, and equal to. Now let's choose the Between option there. And we want to format the cells that are between 400,000 and 500,000. And we'll use a light red fill with dark red text that's available to us. And then we press OK. Now, from the drop down arrow here, we choose the last option. So it shows us the two values that are between that range. So let's go to conditional formatting and manage rules. So in here, it says applies to. So it applies to the sum of sales that are within the sales quarter and financial year. So if we take out the sales quarter, and the financial year, then this conditional format will not work. So if you change your column and row label fields, then you're going to reapply the conditional formatting for those new fields. We can actually highlight cell rules based on text labels. Now we have our quarters here in our row labels. Now let's highlight all of them and then go to the Home tab and Conditional Formatting, Highlight Cell Rules. Now because we've highlighted the text, then it gives us the option to highlight text that contains. So in here, let's highlight text that contains Q1 and press OK. And then we can go back and highlight again text that contains Q3, press OK and go back there. So it gives us the option to highlight row label or column label text items. We can also highlight cell rules based on date labels. Now in our pivot table, we have our order date dates. You can have any dates that could relate to when a payment is due or when an invoice from a customer is meant to be paid. 
So we can put a conditional format that will show us which dates relate to a particular month. Now to do that, we need to highlight in our pivot table and select all the dates. Now we go to the Home tab and Conditional Formatting, Highlight Sales Rules, and then choose a date occurring. And in here, you have the option to choose the different dates. Now we're going to choose this month and we'll want to put it in here in a green field with dark green text and press OK. So we'll scroll down all the way, you can see that, that these three dates are due to be paid this month. And say that you open this pivot table on a future date, then this conditional format will be refreshed automatically and apply to your current dates values. We can use conditional formatting to highlight the top and bottom cell values. Now let's click in our pivot table anywhere in our values and go to the Home tab and Conditional Formatting and choose the top bottom rules. Now let's start by choosing the top 10 items. And instead of the 10 items, we can actually choose the top 5. And then we'll keep it with this formatting and press OK. Now from these formatting options, we select the last option so we can see all the values except for the subtotals and grand totals. So we have our top five items there for our three years of financial data. Let's go back into conditional formatting and we can clear the rule by choosing the last option, clear rules from this pivot table. And then we'll go back in and let's create another rule. Let's choose the top 10%. So in here, we can choose a different percentage. For example, the top 25% of sales for the three years, press OK. And then from this drop-down formatting rule, let's choose the last option. So it shows us here the top 25% values from our three years. We'll go back and we can go and clear the rule. And let's apply another rule here above average. So in here, based on our selection, it's going to give us the values which are above the average. And press OK, and then let's apply it to everywhere. So what it's done is it's calculated the average over the three years, and the values which are above that average will be highlighted in red. Okay, let's go back and clear the rules. Now, we've got the option to do the bottom 10 items, or the bottom 10%, or the, the below average. Now let's go to the more rules in here, and let's choose the apply rule too. Let's choose the third option once again. And in here, let's choose the top. We can actually choose the bottom as well. So let's choose the bottom one item for each column group. And we can format that in red, and press OK. So this is one column group, and it's highlighting the last value. That's another column group. So is that, and so is this. So it's showing us the bottom value based on that. Now let's go back and clear this rule. And then finally, let's go to the more rules. And in here, let's choose the third option, and bottom one, and each row group. And let's format it in red and press OK and OK. So what it shows us here is that the bottom value from this group, the bottom value from this selection, and the bottom value from this selection. And it does the same thing for each of the different regions. So the top and bottom rules in conditional formatting are a great feature and your data really does stand out. Data bars, color scales, and icon sets are new in Excel 2010, and they're a cool little feature under conditional formatting. Now let's highlight our pivot table values here, and go to the Home tab and Conditional Formatting, and then choose Data bars. And here, you got the option of a gradient field and different colors. And as I'm scrolling, you can see the live preview in the pivot table, and you got the solid field as well. 
So here it highlights the values automatically by highest to lowest. Now let's go to the more rules option and let's apply this rule to the last option, which means all the values except the subtotals and grand totals. And here we can only show the bar. If we press OK, you can see that the values go and we can see the bar only. And let's go back to conditional formatting, manage rules and choose pivot table 2 and double click in there just so we can make some changes. Now in here we can actually choose lowest value, we can actually put in a number, a percent, a formula, a percentile or automatic. Now let's put in a percent in there and let's pull 50 percent and the maximum will pull 50 percent and then we can have a solid field or a gradient field and we can choose a color in here and let's put in there a light blue we can have a border or a solid border and then the color of the border as well in the bar direction we can go left to right and you see the preview here or right to left let's keep it a context and you've got some options for negative values and axis Let's untick the show bar only because we want to see the values and then press OK and OK. So we see the values there. So in here it's highlighted the top 50% in a blue color and the bottom 50% in a blank background. Now let's press Ctrl Z to go back and let's go back to conditional formatting and choose color scales. So in here you have the different scales here and you can see automatically that the lowest value is 599 and that's highlighted in red. If you choose the second option, the lowest amount is in green and the highest is in red. And you've got these different options there. Now this is good for resourcing or popularity scores. Now let's go to the more rules here. And the format style we can use a two color scale or a, or a three color scale. And then once again, we can choose the lowest value the midpoint and the maximum there and we can leave it like this the lowest value will be in red the midpoint the 50 percentile mark will be in yellow and the highest value will be in green and press ok and we can see that there we can press ctrl z to go back and then finally we have the icon sets now these are good for when you have some budget values and you want to see whether you've achieved your values or you have certain scores or if you have a project and to indicate whether you have any risks or opportunities so you got a lot of different ways where you can highlight the numbers now under more rules we can actually choose to show the icons only instead of the numbers and in here we've got the option of the different icons to choose as we saw previously now under here we can actually change our values so it says here give us a green when the value is more than or equals to 67 percent now we can change this percent to a number to a formula or to a percentile now it says here when it's between 67 and 33 percent then it give us an orange and when it's less than 33 percent give us a red color we can change this as well and even change the numbers so we can say 50 and then when it's 50 give us a red so anything that's below 50 will be a red and let's press ok and you see that and we can go back and just do one more thing under manage rules double click in there and say that we had a budget so anything that's over 800,000 we get a green mark because our budget was 800,000 per month. So anything above 800,000 is green, anything less is red. Now we can do this by saying first of all number bigger than or equals to 800,000 is green. If it's less than 800,000 and zero number then it's a red. So let's press OK and OK. And quickly here, we can see that all the values that did not meet our budget are in red, and the ones that do are in green. So these data bars, color scales, and icon sets are fantastic if you want to 
quickly show and highlight relevant numbers and your numbers really do stand out, which makes your analysis that much easier to do. In our pivot table, we have all our sales people and we have their sales per year and per quarter. And we want to give them a bonus if they've earned more than $700,000 of sales in one quarter. Now, first of all, we need to highlight those people so we can identify them and then we can give them a bonus. Now to do this, we can insert a conditional format, which is format sales that contain. Now, from the home tab, we'll go to conditional formatting and we can highlight sales rules that are greater than but instead of going there, we're gonna to go to create a new rule. Now we want to apply the last rule, which means all the sales apart from the subtotals and grand totals. And then we choose the format only sales that contain. And in here, we keep it at sell value. And then we choose here greater than or equal to. And in here, we're gonna reference a cell. We put in here 700,000, press enter. And then format, we can choose a green color and press okay, and then okay. So automatically, it shows us the salespeople that have earned more than $700,000 of sales in one quarter. Now say that this metric changes, we can say anything that's bigger than 750,000, then the conditional formatting in the pivot table gets updated automatically. In our pivot table, we have our list of channel partners and their sales from 2012 all the way to 2014. And what we wanna do is give our top three channel partners per year an award so they can go away on a trip. Now to do this, we can actually click in our pivot table and go to conditional formatting. And under top bottom rules, we can choose the top items there. But we can also go under new rules and then the apply rule two will be the last option. So we can show all values except grand totals or subtotals. And then choose the format only top or bottom ranked values. Now we're gonna choose the top three. And then for all values, we're gonna change that. We're gonna choose each row group. So what that means is that it will show us the top three in each year. And it will highlight them in the color that we choose. Let's just choose a green and press OK, and then OK. As you can see there, we have them colored. You go all the way down. You can quickly highlight and see which were the top three channel partners for each year. And we can send them a trip and thank them for their contribution over the last few years. We have our salespeople and their respective sales per year. And what we wanna do is see the salespeople that have been performing above average for three consecutive years. Now, those salespeople will get a promotion. To do this, we click in our conditional formatting. We can actually choose the top bottom rules and choose above average from here, but let's go to the new rule. Let's choose the last option so we can highlight the values except the grand totals and subtotals. And from in here, we choose the format only values that are above or below average. Now let's choose above average and then we're gonna select the all values there. So what it's gonna do is get the average for all the values, and then whoever is above that average will get highlighted in the color that we select. And let's choose a green and press OK, and then OK here. So let's have a look here. If we highlight everything, and on the bottom status bar, we'll see the average is 2.672. Now if you don't have this, just right click and you can Click it into action there. So 2.672. So any sales that are more than 2.672 will get highlighted in green. And that's evident there. So the only sales manager that has exceeded expectations has been in, right? So he'll receive 
a big promotion in 2015. What we have in our pivot table are our 2013 sales and our 2014 sales. And we want to compare to see whether our 2014 sales were bigger than the previous year per month. So to do this, we're going to highlight the 2014 column, go to conditional formatting, and then choose new rules. For the apply rule 2, we'll keep it to selected cells because we just want to conditionally format the selected cells and then the rule type will choose the user formula to determine which cells to format. Now in our formula here we're going to put 2014 is bigger than 2013. If that's true then it will highlight in green and then the next rule will be is 2014 for February bigger than 2013 for February if that's true, highlight in green. If not, do not highlight. So first of all, let's click in C3 and then we're going to press the F4 button three times just so we can get rid of the absolute reference because we need to apply the argument for each row. So if we had the dollar signs or the absolute reference, then it will only have this argument here for row three and not the rest. Okay, so let's do bigger than and then B3 and again press the F4 sign to get rid of the absolute reference and then we press that and let's format in green and press OK and then press OK. So we can see here quickly that we have January, July, September, October and November months that were bigger than the previous year's totals. And let's go back to conditional formatting to manage rules and we can see this under the pivot table that the rule applies to this selection which is correct and the formula is C3 is bigger than B3 because we don't have the dollar signs or absolute reference it means that it will go into each row and calculate that argument and return back the true or false into the 2014 column if it's true it will give us green if not it will be blank In chapter 10.10, .10, we selected the 2014 values there and we said, is 2014 bigger than 2013? If yes, then highlight in green. If no, then don't highlight. Now we can see this by going into the conditional formatting under manage rules. And we can see if we double click there that we've applied the rule to the selected cells. And this is the formula, C3 is bigger than B3. Now press OK. Now what we can do is actually take out the sales month and drop in some other fields and this conditional formatting will still apply to that. Let's have a look. Take that out and bring in customer. You see that works fine there. Same thing for products. Salesperson. Sales region. We can see the sales quarters and then the channel partners. We'll scroll all the way down. We'll see whatever's highlighting green means that 2014 was bigger than 2013. So when you apply the rules to the selected cells, then you can expand the conditional formatting rule to other fields. So what it does is it gives you more flexibility to analyze with more fields. We have the 2013 and 2014 sales and the months here as well. And we want to highlight the top five sales for this. And then what we want to do is take out the sales month and drop in the customers and keep the conditional formatting alive. Now to do this, we highlight in our values there and go to conditional formatting, new rule, and we select the second option, all sales showing sum of sales values. So what we're gonna do is keep the conditional formatting for the values live every time that we chop and change our fields. Now let's put in our rule and we're just going to say our top five and then 
format and let's put it in that color there and press OK. So we'll have our sales month there. Now let's take that out and put in our customer. You see that's highlighted. Our products, our salesperson, our sales region, our sales quarter, and then our channel partners. So if we scroll down, we get our top five channel partners. So if you choose the all sales showing values, then you can apply that conditional formatting to one field. You can chop and change that field and the conditional formatting will still apply to the new field. We're gonna create a conditional format for our values here that says highlight the top X percent of values and we're going to control that conditional format with some slices. So as we choose the percentage on the slices, then the conditional format will get changed as well. Now let's create a pivot table. Let's highlight the percentage list that we've created here. Go to insert and pivot table, an existing location, and we can just put it there for now. Now what we're going to do is throw in the percentage into our row labels. Now, grand total, we can get rid of that. And what we're going to do is reference this first cell here to our conditional formatting rule. Now, what we're going to do is insert some slices, go to insert and percentage slices, and then we can just we can add some more columns and we can just put it there, change the color. Let's click in our pivot table here and go to conditional formatting, new rule. And let's choose all sales showing sum of sales value. And then format all sales based on their values. And let's choose a three color scale. The lowest value will have a 0%. The midpoint will be a 50 percentile. And the maximum will be a percentage. And we're gonna reference this to the first cell here and press enter. Now the color we're gonna to change to green and red and press okay. So now as we press 50, our cell reference is here. So it'll show the 50% on our maximum value. And then we'll go 55, 60, 65, 70, 75, 80, 85, 90, and then 95. So what it's showing here is the top 95% values, as you can see here. So the top two or three values there are highlighted in red. The midpoint is in yellow and the low point is in green. So you can do some pretty funky stuff with slices and conditional formatting just by referencing the selection chosen by the slicer back to your conditional formatting rules. We can show text in the values area of a pivot table with a bit of conditional formatting magic. Now to do this, we need to set up a couple of rules. Now what I've done here is I've added in a new column called region code and I've coded the regions as Africa being number one, Americas being number two, Asia being number three, and Europe being number four. Now also each row of data relates to a unique date. So I've got one for every two days, I've got a unique transaction. Okay, what I've done now is I've gone to our pivot table here, and I've included our order dates on the left hand side, and our products on the top. And then what I've done is, is I put in the max of region. So what that means is, for each region, I get the maximum value. So obviously the maximum value will be a one for Africa, a two for Americas, a three for Asia, and a number four for Europe. So that's the second step there. Now, third step is to do a conditional format where we're saying that if the value equals a number one, 
then show me Africa. If the value equals number two, show me Americas and so on. Now to do this, we're going to click in our pivot table. So let's start on the top left hand corner of our values, being cell B5. Go to conditional formatting, go to new rule, and then select the third option here so we can see all our values. Now let's use a formula to determine which cells to format. So what we're saying is B5, and let's press F4 three times. So it's not an absolute reference. And then we'll say if B5 equals one, then let's go to the format area and under number, let's choose the custom. And in here under type, let's get rid of that. And let's put in brackets, if it equals one, close brackets, then Africa, and then let's put in there general. Okay, so that's a trick there. And press OK. Now we can also format this in terms of a fill color. So let's put in a fill of a light color like this, and then press OK. So now you see all the number ones have changed to Africa. Let's do the next rule, new rule. Say so again, the same thing. If it equals to two this time, now let's format. And in here, I'll paste what I had before and I just change the values. So number two equals Americas. And then we'll put in a color like this and press OK and OK. You can see that's changed there. Let's do the next one. equals three will be Asia Asia and then we'll fill this like that you see that and then finally we'll do the rule for number four equals four, let's format, and let's paste in the rule, let's change it to number four, and it'll be Europe. And then we can fill it in with this color there. And okay, so there you go. Now we can see for each transaction that in which region it belonged to for all the different products. So we have our order date in our row labels and our products going across. And we're going to drop in our sales in there and we want to get the count of sales. So press OK there. Okay, so we have different counts there in our products and our order dates. And now we want to highlight the blank sales. So if there's any blank sales, put that in red so they can stand out. So let's click anywhere in our values, go to conditional formatting, new rule, and then apply rule to the all cells showing count of sales values for order date and products. So that means it's going to show it for all the values except the subtotals. Now, choose the format only cells that contain. Now from the drop down box, choose blanks and under format, choose any color you want. Let's choose a red here and press OK and then press OK. So it highlights everything that doesn't contain a value. So you can quickly see which dates don't include any values. In this chapter, we're gonna create an accounts receivable aging report, and it's gonna show us when the receivables were meant to be paid and how long they've been outstanding. We have our receivables due date in here, and we have the actual receivable date in the next column here and we can create a matrix report simply click in the data source go to insert pivot table and go to new 
and the row labels we're going to include the receivables due date on the column labels we're going to put in their receivable actual date we click in the date and we're going to group that into the months and year so right click press group and then choose months and years and press ok now as soon as we've done that a new field has been created called years now we'll do the same thing for the receivable actual date let's go in our column area right click and group just choose years and press ok and you can see there years 2 has been included into our field list and also in the column labels area and let's get out of here and in the row labels we have the original due date and we just want to see 2012 so let's just choose 2012 and in the grand total click in there right click and remove grand total and let's get rid of the grid lines let's right click and show field list and in the values area we're going to drop in our sales so grab the sales and drop it in there so we have our matrix looking pivot table so in the values area let's right click and show values as percentage of row total let's just center this like that okay now we have zero in there but we want to get rid of it so we can get rid of those zeros by using conditional format so let's go to conditional formatting and go to new rules and let's choose the third option there and this will apply the conditional format to the values and not the subtotals and then in here we choose format cells that contain the cell value equal to and in here let's put a zero now the format we're going to put in there a color of white because the background is white it's going to get rid of the zeros and press ok so one thing is just to get rid of the grand total down here go to design grand totals off for rows of columns so what it says here is that receivables that were due to be paid in february 2012 20 percent of them were paid during that month 31 percent were paid in march 4% in April, 35% in May, and 8% in June. And if you select all this, you see the sum is at 100%. So we can see that the aging is pretty bad because it lags about three to four months. And we get the same trend here all the way down for the different months. Now what we're gonna do is highlight the percentages that were received in the particular month. So for February, receivables that were received in February we're going to highlight in green for March receivables that were actually paid in March we're going to highlight in green and so forth so we're going to highlight the receivables that were received on the actual due date now for that we need to do some conditional formatting let's go to the home tab and press conditional format and create a new rule let's choose the third option there just so we can highlight all the values except the subtotals and then let's use a formula to determine which cells to format and in here we're going to put a if formula so we're going to say if february equals february then highlight the values in green so to do this let's type in the if formula and we're going to say if a7 click on there and press f4 twice just so we can lock in column a so if a7 equals b5 now press f4 once just so we can lock in the row number five so if a7 equals b5 then true or else false now let's put in here an equal sign we forgot that now if this is true then the format we're going to fill it in a green color there press ok there and you can see all the receivables that are due within the actual due date are highlighted in green everything else is overdue and was paid on a later date now we're going to do another pivot table report and we want to see the distribution of the accounts receivable over the months so let's highlight the pivot table press ctrl copy and we'll just go down here and press ctrl v okay so we have the same pivot table here now let's click anywhere in the values right click and show values as and let's change that to include percentage of grand total and now we're going to go to design grand totals and we'll have it on for rows and columns and what it says here is if we highlight everything we're going to get 100 just like that 
So it shows us the distribution of the age receivables over the months and years. Now finally, we can put in a heat map down here and we can just highlight there, go to conditional format and a color scale. And let's put in there this one here. So this is 100%. Now it says that out of the age receivables that were due in 2012, about 15% were actually received in January 2013. And the rest, you can see the distribution in there. So conditional formatting allows you to highlight problem data and you can take some action to improve your business. We have our sales results for our regions and our products going across the years and we have the grand total here as well. And we're going to put in some conditional formatting just to show the highest and lowest sales values throughout the years and throughout the regions. So first of all, we're going to put a data bar just within the values here. So to do that, just click anywhere in the values and go to conditional format and go to data bars. And let's choose a gradient field like that. Now we get this drop down box here and then I'm going to apply the formatting rule to and this third option here means that it will only conditional format the values and not the subtotal. So click there and then we can go back to conditional formatting, manage rules and double click just so we can change the color here. So the color, we can leave it like this and the border, let's put in a blank border and we can get a preview here and then press OK and apply and then press OK there. Next, we're going to put in a three color scale on our grand total. So let's highlight the grand total there. Press control key from the keyboard and then with the mouse, highlight the rest of the grand totals, but exclude the subtotals. Go to conditional formatting and go to color scales and we'll include this second one in here. And finally, we're going to insert some slices in there. So in your pivot table, go to options and insert slicer. We're going to put in the financial year the sales quarter and the sales month and press OK. Now let's grab the financial year, right click, slice the settings and get rid of the display header. And we can just put it like this and move it in the corner there. Now what we're going to do is just double click in here just so we can have a bit more space and then highlight the rows and insert just like that. So we have the years there. Next, put in our sales quarter. Let's get rid of the display name again. And then we can just bring this up and then put it there. And then the sales month again, let's get rid of the display header. And then from the options, we're going to choose the three different columns. So that means each quarter is separated. And we can just put it like this. Just make it a little bit bigger, okay, and move it up there, and there we have it. So we can click on the slicer, hold the control key, click on all of them, go to options, and then we can choose whichever color that we want. Okay, so now that we have the slices, if we choose one here, the conditional format applies to that year as well, and it changes accordingly. If we go to Q1, the same thing. We can hold the mouse key and scroll down to highlight everything again. We can choose each month individually. You can quickly see which are our high and low sales values. So with conditional formatting, you can put some visuals on your pivot table and your data does stand out. Get Pivot Data is a formula that uses the pivot table to create customized reports that give the user more flexibility. It uses the pivot table as its engine to spit out numbers based on the user's needs. There are certain advantages of using a get pivot data formula. You can produce a report to your liking so you're not limited to the pivot table formats. When the pivot data source changes, then all you gotta do is refresh the pivot table and your report will update as well. You can also format your report and upon refreshing your pivot table, it will never lose its formatting. And finally, you can add extra columns for business metrics that are unable within a pivot table. 
There are lots of people that don't use the GetPivot data formula. It's because they don't know the power that it can have. The reason is that most people will actually go outside the pivot table and try to do a quick sum formula. For example, 2013 plus 2014, like this. And when they try to scroll down, then they get the same number. And then they look at this formula and they're saying, well, it's a get pivot data. I don't like it. I don't understand it. So I'm not going to use it, which is fair enough. But I'll show you ways where you can use the get pivot data to enhance your reports. Let's press Control Z to get out of there. Now, to activate the get pivot data, you got to click in your pivot table, go to Options, and under Options, from the drop down arrow, choose Generate Get Pivot Data. That's ticked and means it's on. If you uncheck and you click anywhere inside your pivot data, then you get a cell reference. If you want to use get pivot data, make sure that it's selected. So let's get a number from within our pivot table and press enter. Now let's go to our function in here. Just click anywhere in there and we can move this around here. Move it up here. Okay. Now, if you want to get the explanation of get pivot data, just click on there and you get the Excel help and you get the details about the function and what it does. Now, the data field, these are the values that you want to return. For example, sum of sales, count, or average. Now in here, it gets the sales, which is the sum of sales here. So it's the sum of sales that we are showing. And the second argument is the actual pivot table. So in here, you can click anywhere in the pivot table, but we usually click on the top left-hand corner. Now, the third argument, this is the field name. So we're looking at salesperson. We have here salesperson, and we also have the quarters. So the field name is, first of all, the salesperson. And then within salesperson, we have the item, which is in right. So we've selected cell D12. So it's in right as a salesperson. And we'll go to the second field, which is the financial year which is up here. And the item within the financial year is 2014 because we've checked in there. Finally, the third field is the sales quarters. So we have the sales quarters in the row labels. And then item three, we have the actual cell that we've chosen relates to Q4. So it puts it in that order and you can put up to 126 different combinations there. Now let's press enter and we'll get our value out there. And the power that comes with a get pivot data formula is with the item numbers, we can actually reference them to a cell. So instead of saying 2014, we can change it to 2013 and see what happens. The value changes to 670. Let's change Q4 to Q3. It changes to 624. And finally, instead of in right, Let's put in John Michaludis. So he gets John Michaludis' 2013 sales. So based on this, you can see how you can create a report in here where you can reference your items with your own custom format, your own metrics, and every time the pivot table gets updated, all you gotta do is refresh and then your data gets updated here. And I'll show you how to do this in the next chapters. Now we're going to create a custom report with the get pivot data formula and what we're going to do is reference our formula to the items that we have here so the years 2013 2014 the quarters and then the regions that we have there and we're going to paste the formulas into the empty boxes we're going to get our totals and then our variance or delta amounts and then we're going to use this combo box to change the variance based on our selection. So first of all, let's go and choose America's Q1 2013. So the equal sign or the plus to activate our formula. America's Q1 2013, let's click in there. Now let's go into our pivot table. So it's taking our sales data 
and the pivot table is A1, which is correct. Field number one is sales region, correct. Item number one is Americas. And instead of having Americas there, we can actually reference it to here. Now let's press F4 three times so we can fix the columns. Now let's go to our next field, financial year, 2013. Same thing, get rid of it. And let's get the reference in there. Now let's press F4 twice so we can fix the rows. And then we have field three and item three. Get rid of that. Again, reference it in there and press F4 twice so we can fix the rows. Now press enter and we get the amount 652159, which is there. What we're gonna do now is drag this down to get our values. And you can see they match in here. Now sometimes your formula may not work and it happens sometime when, example, you have some leading or trailing spaces. So let's double click in there and put in a space and press enter, we'll get a reference. So sometimes when you copying and pasting text or values, make sure that there are no leading spaces. Control Z to go back. Okay, so let's drag this across in there. And we'll have our values there, Control Copy, and then Control V. So we have our totals, we have our totals there, and we have our variance there. So quick and simple, in a matter of minutes, we've created our own custom report with our own metrics, and we can extend this to add some more metrics at the bottom if we like. Now, if our data changes, then this will get updated as well. So let's go back to our data source and change America's Q1 2013. Let's change a value so we can see if it gets picked up here. So data table, we're in America's 2013 Q1. And let's put in a, a big value, like a million dollars. We'll go back. So this will get updated here when we refresh our pivot table. Right click, refresh, and you see that automatically gets updated. Now finally, we've put in here our metric, which is the variance. And what I've done here is I put in a, a form control from the developer tab. So I went in there and pressed insert form control. I chose the combo box and I placed that in there. And then if I right click in there under format control, the input range is this here. So it's Q1, Q2, Q3, Q4 total. The cell link is there. So when Q1 is chosen, it'll be number one. When Q2 is chosen, it'll be number two and so forth. And then drop down lines, I've chosen five and 3D shading. So as we change this, our values change. So what I've done is a formula in here, which is a, an index formula with a array formula. So, so what I've said is area 2014, so the the array is in here, in blue, 2014. The column selection, I've named the range, which is number two. So in this array, it's choosing the second column, two, because I said Q2 equals two. So it's choosing the second column, and then it's doing the same thing in 2013. It's choosing the second column. So, so the second column in 2014 minus the second column in 2013, we get our value. Now, to make this work all the way down. What I did is I highlighted all the rows here and then I press Control, Shift and Enter to turn it into an array formula. You can see that we get the live results as we changing our selection. So cool little trick there that you can do outside the pivot table and another Great reason why get pivot data is fantastic because you can add things that that you normally wouldn't be able to in your pivot table. We can also reference dates with the get pivot data formula. In our pivot table here, I've got our order date in our row labels and our sum of sales in our values area. And what I've done is I've taken the date of the first order. So the order is sorted from the earliest date all the way down to the last date, okay? So I've taken the first date and typed it in here. 
And now what we can do is type in our get pivot data formula and cell reference this cell in here. So let's press equals or plus and write in the get pivot and then press the tab key. Now the data field is going to be sales, so we need to, with the brackets, type in sales, close brackets, comma, the pivot table, you can click anywhere in here. We usually click on the top left hand corner and press F4 just so we can fix the value in there and comma. Next is the field name. So we have the order dates as we said before. So let's type it in, order date, and make sure the spelling is the same. And the item number one, well, that'll be this reference here. So all we've got to do is just click in there, close the parentheses, and press enter. And you see, you get the value there. Now, the date that you put in here, you've got to make sure that it actually exists within your data source. If it doesn't exist, then you're not going to get a value. For example, we have the 3rd of the 1st, and then our next transaction is on the 12th of the 1st. So, what we can do is, for example, let's put in the 4th of January in there. You get a reference, because the data doesn't exist. Instead of giving us a 0, it gives us a reference there. So, let's put in the, the second valid transaction. There you go, we have the value there. Another way that you can do this is actually put in the date formula. So I'll press Control D just to copy what's up there. Okay, so it's the same formula there. Now, instead of referencing the cell here, which we did before, what we're going to do is put in there the date formula. So let's type in date, D-A-T-E. Okay, press the tab. And the year, well, we can type in 2012, the month, is January, put in 1, and the day is 12. And then we'll go out here and we can close the parentheses and press enter and we get our value. So there's a couple of ways that you can reference dates with get pivot data. Just make a note that your dates do have values. If not, then you get a ref error. We can use data validation to make our get pivot data formula interactive. What we're going to do is create two drop down lists, one for the months and another one for the regions, and then incorporate those into the get pivot data formula by way of cell referencing. And then once we change the months and regions from our drop down list, then our get pivot data results will also change. So let's Grab our months from in here, control copy, right click, and paste the values. Next, we'll choose our regions. So click in Americas, hold down the control key, choose Europe, and then again, hold down the control key, choose Asia, and then hold down the control key and choose Africa. Press control copy, go up here, right click, and paste the values. Now, what we're going to do is create our data validation. So, in our data tab, we choose data validation. And then in the drop down box, we choose the list. And our source will be our months in here. And press OK. And we've created our list of all the months in there. Now, let's do the same thing for region. So again, data validation, choose the list. Our source is in here, press OK. And we have our list for the regions created. Now let's create our get pivot data formula just by referencing it in our pivot table. So we have our value there. So now what we're gonna do is, instead of using the January argument in our formula, we're gonna get rid of it, and we're gonna reference it in our data validation list. Now for Americas in the regions, we'll do the same thing. Backspace to get rid of it. Choose our data validation list and press enter. 
So we have our value there. So now, as we change our months, the formula gets updated. And also, as we change our regions, our formula gets updated as well. So a cool little trick that you can use when you're creating customer reports with Get Pivot Data Formula. Now Get Pivot Data does have a short form. Now let's reference our Pivot Data for Q1 Americas and press Enter. And we have our formula in here. And say that we want to add in the sales month of January into this formula and let's see what happens. So in there we'll put in sales month and then January and press enter. We'll get an error message. So if the sales month is not part of our pivot table in here, anywhere in our column labels or row labels, if it's not part of our pivot table, then it's not going to give us a result. So what we're going to make sure is to grab the sales month and drop it in there. And then we have our get pivot data updated. Now in here, we have our sales quarter Q1 as part of our formula. So we grab our sales quarter and we'll take it out. The reference is valid because our data is not part of our pivot table. So to fix this, we just got to make sure that you get rid of that argument there and press enter. So if you want to make sure that your Get Pivot Data formula is working, then make sure that you drop in all the fields into your areas here so they can work properly. Another thing to note is that if you drop in fields into the report filter, then the Get Pivot Data is not going to pick that information up. We have our pivot table here with our regions on our row labels and our months on our column labels. And it goes all the way to the right hand side there. So what we want to do is bring these grand totals to the left hand side of the pivot table. Now to do that, press equals or plus and we'll go all the way to the grand total and enter that in there. So we'll get our grand total there. Now if we drag it down, then it's fixed to the America's grand total. So what we need to do in here Instead of having this America's name, we just got to reference the cell C3 and then we can just drag it all the way down there. Now, for the grand total to work, we just got to do the same and click in the grand total. If you see in the arguments here for a grand total, it only has the data field which is grabbing the sales values and the pivot table location which is C1. Now this works well if you keep the format like this. But say that you want to add in some more fields like the quarter in there, well this doesn't work. First what we need to do is say that if the first cell here, C3, equals to grand total, then we need to put in this formula here. If not, then put in that formula there. So let's grab this formula from in here, control copy, and then in here we'll say if C3 equals brackets grand total, then let's press control V and put in our formula that we took from the bottom. So if C3 equals grand total, then it will give us the grand total amount there. If not, then it will give us all the regional totals. And then close parentheses and press enter. And now we can just drag all the way down here. You can drag all the way down if you want, if you're going to add some more items in there. Okay, so that fixes that problem. Now we have another problem with the ref error. Now to fix that, all we have to put in there is an if error formula. If you're using Excel 2010 or beyond, if you're using Excel 2007, then you're going to pull if is error. Okay, I'm using Excel 2010, so I'll put in if error, go to the end, comma, value if error, 
well double brackets so it means blank and then I'm here double click and then you can see we have our our grand totals for our regions and also our grand total in there so cool little workaround if you want to see your grand totals on the left hand side of your pivot table We've got our pivot table on the top here and we've included our sales regions and our sales months and years on the top and the actual and plan in the values area. If we go right across, you can see all the months there, all the way across. Now it's pretty ugly looking and we're going to do a better report here at the bottom by using the get pivot data formula. Now let's close the field list there. And what we've done here is we put in the months from January all the way to December here. We just type that in and we're going to use that later in our formula. And in there, we've actually put in the months and by pressing control one, you can see that we've entered the MMM and that puts it in Jan. If we press in another M, it puts in the whole month. It doesn't really matter. We just want to show that it is January, even though the actual date is the first of the first 2014 and then the first of the second 2014 and so on and we're going to use these to determine whether our action month is an actual or a planned month based on the end of month date so let's go into the end of month date and in there we're going to put in a formula called end of month and today so press plus end of month and then the start date we just put in there another formula which says today and close brackets comma and the month, we don't want any forward months, we just want today's month. So today's end of month is the 31st or the 5th, 2014. We know that because if we go here, today's the 21st or the 5th, 2014. So the end of month is going to be the 31st of May. Now in here, we're going to put actual or plan based on what today's date is. So if today is less than the end of month date, then it's actual. If it's not, then it's planned. So in here, we have to put in a if formula. So let's put in if, and let's click in there. So if B15, so if January, now let's press the F4 twice so we can lock it in because we're gonna drag the formula down. So if January is less than or equal to the end of month date, let's press F4 once to lock it in. So if that is true, then return us an actual in text. If false, return us the plan. So anything from May onwards will be plan. And before that, it'll be actual, as you can see there. So now we can create our get pivot data. And based on this actual or plan detail, it will return us the values from within the pivot table. Press plus or equals and click in the pivot table there next to Americas. It doesn't matter that it's 2012. We can change those values later and we'll get the get pivot data. Now what we're going to do is we have the actual there in brackets. So the first argument is the data field. So it's taking the data from the actual. But we wanted to reference this cell here. If we press enter, we get a reference. Now I'll show you a trick that will give us the actual data. So it's B16. Let's press the AND sign and then the, the two parentheses. And that means that it'll lock it in as text. You see that? It works. Okay, so we've got the actual there. Now let's go into B16 and press F4 twice so we can lock in the row 16. The second argument is the pivot table and the defaults to A2. It could be anywhere in the pivot table. Let's leave that. That's fine. The sales region is Americas, but let's get rid of this and then let's reference it in here and then press F4 three times to lock in the column A. Now the financial year says 2012, but we can actually put in a formula there and we can say year and then we can go in there. So we're getting the year from January, which is 2014. And let's press F4 twice to lock in the row 15 and then close brackets. 
and then sales month we've got january let's get rid of this and then let's reference it to january so as i told you before we're going to use the months names in there in our formula and here is where it's going to help us out and then press f4 twice to lock in the row and then press enter so we get 260,257. so we can see that jan 2014 actual is 26257 so that's correct so our formula works all we're going to do is just drag it across there and then drag it all the way down and what i've got here are some subtotals okay now we're going to put in some conditional formatting here so if it's plan then it's going to be grayed out if not it'll be blank so let's highlight all the cells there and go to conditional formatting new rule and then use a formula to determine which cells to format let's put in there an if function so if b16 and press f4 so if b16 equals plan then true or else false so what we're saying is if it's plan then we're gonna format it in gray if not it'll be blank let's format and let's just put in a gray color there press ok and ok there so you see that it's graded out now let's test to see if this works so let's say we'll go into our next month and let's put in the 30th of the 6th 2014 and you're going to see that the this plan here changes from plan to actual and the values change from the plan it gives us the actual values for 2014 in june and the conditional format as well gets blanked out so let's put in there one month ahead and press enter and you see we get the live change there again let's go two months ahead and that changes accordingly so you can have a situation where your actual data gets inputted in here and all you need to do is just go to the pivot table right click refresh and then the information will get updated accordingly and when you go into the end of month date then the values change so the get pivot data formula gives you some awesome power to create some live reports and you can print this out and send it off to your boss on a monthly basis and you don't have to recreate this each month. We have listed our channel partners on the left hand side here and we've got the different months and we've got the individual values for the years and on the right hand side here is we have a report that we want to compare each channel partner and based on the base year that we choose and the comparative year we want to see the variance. Now we're going to do this by inserting a get pivot data formula and I'll show you how to do this in a second. Now the first thing we need to do is create some pivot tables. Now we've got the month, base year and comparative year. Now let's highlight the month and go to insert and pivot table and let's go to an existing worksheet and we'll just put it in there just for the moment and let's drop in the month in the row labels. So we have our pivot table there and then we'll go to move pivot table and let's put it now we'll do the same thing for the base here insert pivot table and let's put it in here and press ok and then the base here into the row labels and then let's move it in there and then finally we've got the comparative here let's do the same for that Okay, so that's the first step done. Let's go to our report up here. Now, the base here, so let's reference that to the months pivot table. So the first entry there and press enter. And the same thing for the comparative year. Now, we're gonna use slices later on to control the months. And I'll show you how to do that in a second. Now, in the base year, we're gonna reference that to the base year pivot table. So the first entry there. And then the comparative year will do the same thing and then enter there. The next step is to put in there a get pivot data formula. So let's press enter and then choose anywhere in there. Okay, so we're taking the sales 
as being the data field, which is correct because we are using the sales information there. Our pivot table is in A3. And the financial year, instead of having 2012, just get rid of that to here and then press F4 twice to lock in the row number. The sales month is January, but then let's get rid of that. And then we can reference that to, to I12 and press F4 twice to lock that in. And the channel partners, we can get rid of that. And we can go in there and just go up one and press the F4 three times to lock in the column and then press enter. So we can check this now that ABC Telecom in January 2012 was 103,000. So 2012, January, ABC Telecom, 103,501. Okay, so let's put in there an if error because if we get an error, then we'll get a zero because some channel partners don't have any values and press enter. Okay, drag this across, press control copy and then highlight this area, right click and then put the FX in there. So we have our values there. The final step is to insert a slicer. So let's click on our pivot table and go to options and insert slicer and then press the month. So we have the month there. Now let's put that into three groups and we can move it up there. Let's do the same thing for the base here. Insert slicer and then we can move that up here as well. And then finally, put the comparative here, click in there and insert the slicer. And let's move that in there. So now that we have our slicers, if we choose the base here, you can see that this changes and so does the get pivot data for the base here column, 2013 and 2014. Comparative year, the same thing happens. The information changes and you can see that because it takes the first entry in the pivot table and we've referenced that in here okay now let's choose a value there and now we can also do the months as well so we can do the analysis based on the different months and we get the variance dollar and the variance percentage so by using the get pivot data and some slices, we can do some comparative reports on channel partners. And it's not only limited to them, you can do comparative analysis on products, on employees, on whatever metrics that you like. Macros enable you to record steps that you do in Excel and then run those steps automatically with the press of a button. You can create these macros for your clients or colleagues to give them the analysis power that they wouldn't normally have. Now to create a macro, you simply need to go into your ribbon and then choose view. And on the far right hand side, you have the macros button and you can press the record macro button from in here. Another way you can do it is through the developer tab. Now you may not have this activated, but I'll show you how to do this. First, you go to file, then options, then under the customize ribbon option, on the right hand side, you have the developer box there. Now it may be unchecked. If that's the case, just check it and press OK and that will activate it. Now another thing you've got to take into consideration is the trust center. So click in there, then under trust center settings, click that and choose macro settings. Now in here you have different macro settings. If you choose the disable macros, then once you open your workbook, the macros will be disabled and then you need to enable them. Now if you want to enable them with a notification, that means that on top of the formula bar, you're gonna get a, a yellow strip that says enable. Well, choose this option. If you wanna disable all macros without notification, choose the first option. And if you want to disable all macros except digital signed macros, then choose this option. Now the last option is not recommended. 
That means enable all macros when you open the workbook. Now you may have some dangerous code in there, so never choose these. So let's choose the second option and press OK and OK. And now in your developer tab, you have the code here, the macros, how do you record it? You have also the add-ins here that come from your computer. And also you can insert some form controls in here. So there's a few options in here under the developer tab. The main thing is the record macro or bringing up the macros that you've already recorded. We're gonna record a simple macro to refresh a pivot table. Now to do this, first of all, we need to go to the record macro button under the developer tab, or you can go up to view, macros and record macro. So let's do it from here. And then it brings up the dialog box. And in here you need to name your macro. So let's call it refresh pivot. Make sure there are no spaces. You can put in here a short key just to activate that macro next time you want to run it. And also you've got the option here to store the macro in. If you choose this workbook, then that means that you can share this macro with other people. So if you email this document to someone else, like a client or a colleague, then choose this option. If you want to keep it just for yourself, then choose the personal macro workbook. And if you want to store it into a new workbook, then choose that. We'll choose this workbook so that can be embedded into this workbook. And description, you can just write in a short description if you like. We're not gonna write anything, we'll press OK. So now the macro is running, and we know that because on the bottom here, we have the blue box that says, a macro is currently recording. And we can press that to stop it. Now if we go to the developer tab, then you can see that it's running there and it says stop recording. So we know that it's recording. Now, all we're gonna do is click in our pivot table, right click and press refresh and stop recording. That's our macro. Now to see our macro, let's go to macros in there and you can see the refresh pivot there. Now it's in all open workbooks or we can choose this workbook and it comes there. So now we can run it from in here and we can edit it or delete it from in there. Now let's cancel out of there. What we're gonna do is insert a shape and then we're gonna attach that macro in there. So let's put in a shape and then from the shape styles, let's choose a button like this. And then in here, we just gotta right click and choose assign a macro. And then from in here, we can just choose our refresh pivot macro and press OK. Now once we've done that, you can see that the hand has been activated. So if you click that, it will refresh the pivot table. Now let's right click and then type in there refresh pivot table. Press Control All and let's format this a bit. Let's make it a little bit bigger and then put this in yellow and then step out of it. So if we go to our data table and then we change the amount here to say 10 million and then we need to refresh our pivot table, we just go in there and press refresh. It's very simple to create a quick macro. Now another thing you gotta make sure is if you go to file and save, it will give you a dialog box that says because this is a macro, you need to save it as a macro enabled workbook. So to continue saving as a macro free workbook, click yes, that's not advisable. Let's click no, and then it brings up our save as dialog box. And then from in here, all we're gonna do is just, from the drop down box, choose Excel macro enabled workbook. And then press save. And let's get out of this. And now we're in here and you can see that this macro enabled workbook, the type is macro enabled workbook and also you get the exclamation mark. So let's double click to get back in and now we have the enabled content. So for the macro to work again, if we click here, it's not gonna work. We're gonna click enable content and then refresh pivot table and it will refresh again.
and we're going to create a macro where we filter our dates so we can see this month's values, this quarter's values, and also the year-to-date values. Now we have the order dates here in, in our row labels, but it can be invoices due or customer payments to be received. It could be any dates. Now to create this macro, first of all, we're going to clear whatever is in the filter and then run the macro for each of the three filters. So let's choose any date filter. Okay. Now let's go into our developer tab and press record the macro. So the first macro will be called this month and we'll keep it into this workbook and press OK. So the macro is recording. The first action will be to clear the pivot table. So let's go in there and press clear filter. And then let's create the date filter for this month. So click on the drop down box, date filter, and choose this month. And then stop recording. That's our first macro. Let's record our second macro. Press record macro and call it this quarter and press OK. First step is to clear the filter. The second step is to choose this quarter filter and then press stop recording. Record macro for year to date. Record macro, call it year to date, press OK. Let's clear the filter. Let's go back in, date filter, year to date, and stop recording. So now we've created our three macros, and now we're gonna put in some buttons and assign those macros to each of the buttons. Now let's insert a shape, and we can insert this color shape there. And let's choose this style here. So what we can do now is just click on the shape with our left mouse button, press Control and Shift, and then this moves it across. Let go of the mouse button. You're still holding on Control and Shift, and then click and drag across. So we've created our three shapes. Now in here, we're gonna call uh, this month, in there we'll call it this quarter, and the next shape we'll call it year to date. We can click on one shape, press the control key, and select the three shapes, and then we can edit it from in here. We can center it, we can make it bigger, we can make it into a yellow color, and then we'll go to the format and text effects, we can put in there a shadow if you like and then we may just drop it down a bit like that okay so we have our three different buttons and now let's assign the macros right click assign macro this month okay right click assign macro this quarter assign macro year to date okay so let's see if this works this month, okay. If I click this quarter, well the step was to clear the filter and run the date filter for this quarter. So it does that, and then year to date. Now today's date is the 20th of March, so obviously we're in the first quarter. So year to date and this quarter will be the same. So here you have a quick macro to see your date filters. So when you open this workbook next month or in a few months down the track, then Excel is smart enough to know your current date and then recalculate the date filters based on your current date. We're gonna record a macro where we're gonna get different pivot table views depending on the button that we're gonna press. Now the trick to this is that the first step of the macro is to clear the pivot table and then the second step is to create the pivot table. So let's go and record our first macro and call it region by quarter and press OK. So the first step is go to the options tab, clear, clear all. The second step is to create the regions by quarter. So we'll grab the quarters, 
region, and then we'll grab the sales twice into the values area. Now from the drop down arrow, we choose value field settings, and then we put in here average and press OK. Finally, select everything, go to the home tab and just put in a comma and get rid of the decimal places. And then we can go to developer and stop recording. That's our first macro done. The second macro is going to be called year to date sales by month. So press record and call it year to date sales by month and press OK. The first step, once again, go to options, clear, clear all. The second step is to create the pivot table. Let's grab the years in the row labels, the sales month as well, and drop in the sales twice into the values area. Now from the drop down arrow, value fuel settings, and show values as. And from the drop down box here, we're going to show values as a running total in. And the base field will be sales month. And the custom name, we'll change it to year to date and press OK. And then once again, click in here, go to the Home tab and customize it a bit like this. Developer tab, stop recording. The third macro is going to be called Top 10 Channels. Press OK. Options, clear all. Grab our regions and our channel partners on the left and our sales in our values area. And then from the channel partners, we can filter it by value filters and top 10, and then just press OK. And then finally, in the pivot table, we can just right click and sort largest to smallest, and go to the developer tab and stop recording. So we've done our three macros. Now all that's left to do is to insert the shapes and assign the macros to the shapes. So let's do this. Insert shape in there, and we'll get one shape in there. Now let's choose the color of the shape, like this. Now hold down with your mouse key, and then press Control Shift, and drag down with your mouse, let go of the mouse key. And then while the Control Shift key is still being pressed, click the mouse, drag down, and then let go of the mouse key. So we've created three similar shapes. Now let's name them region by quarter, sales and average, year to date sales by month, and then top 10 channels. Okay, now let's click in one here, press control all, so we can format the shapes. And then in here we can just choose a color I like color like this and press old and we can just make it a little bit bigger like that okay escape so now let's assign the macros right click assign macro and in here we're going to choose region by quarter and then the second one is year to date sales and the third one is the channel partners now all that's left is to press the button, sit back and enjoy the magic of the macros. So we have the region by quarter sales and average, the year to date sales by month, and then the top 10 channels by region sorted from largest to smallest. We're going to record a macro where we're going to see our top customers by using a scroll bar. So as we scroll up or down, then the number of customers in our pivot table changes as well. So our macro will be to clear an actual filter and then create the filter of the top X customers. Now, let's go to the developer tab and record macro and call it top customers. and press enter. And in here, make sure that you have the filtered pivot table. So the first step will be to clear the filter. The next step is go to our value filter, choose top 10, and then just press OK from in here. And then stop the recording. So that's our macro done. 
The next step is to insert a scroll bar. So in a developer tab under insert, let's choose this scroll bar here. And then we can just simply put it in there, just like this. Okay. So right click in there and format control. The minimum value will be one. The maximum you can do as high as you want, just depending on your customers. We'll put in there a maximum of 100. The incremental change will be one. So as you move the scroll bar, it moves by one. And the page change will be 10. Keep it at that. Now the cell link, we have to link it into this cell, E1. Okay. And press OK. So now, as we're moving this, you see that the that the number changes automatically. Okay, up or down, or we can just take this and move it all the way up or down like this. Okay, we've got a hundred there. Make this a little bit bigger. Okay. So now let's go into our Visual Basic button, and then under Modules, choose this and double click. And the value that we have here, instead of one, let's get rid of that. And we're going to type in there active sheet dot range. And then put in there the parentheses. And in brackets, we're going to put in there E1. Okay. So E1 brackets close parentheses dot value. You can save this and close it. So what we're saying is, as this number changes, then our macro filter will change as well. The final step is to right click in our scroll bar and assign the macro, top customers, press OK. So now we can move this up or down. And you can see that our customers and the values change as well as the grand total. So a cool little trick there that you can use to see your top customers. In our chapter 12.3, we created three different date filters. And now what we're gonna do is put these macros into our quick access toolbar, which is over here. And then we can access them from there rather than having buttons. So let's go to file and options and then quick access toolbar. Choose here from the drop down box macros and you have the three different macros. So we can just select the macros and add, and add, and add. And then from in here, now press modify and in here we can choose whatever design we like. So it's just up to you. There's all these different designs. Now I'll just use a different color like this. And for in here, I'll use another color and year to date, I can just use that, okay? Press okay, and then you can see that the macros are here. If you hover over it, you'll see what it relates to. Okay, let's press it, and they change automatically. One way to reduce your file size is to copy an existing pivot table into a different worksheet. Now we have our pivot table here and we can go to the file and look at our properties and our size is 45 meg. Let's escape out of there. So what we can do now is go to options and select entire pivot. Press control copy. Now we go to file and new blank workbook and press control V. And here we have our new pivot table. And if we go to file and save, we can save this as book three, that's fine. Now, if we go back into the back end, we can see that our size has reduced to 11.8 megs. Now let's escape out of there. Now, if we go to options and change data source, it's linked back to our data source in our other workbook. That's fine. Now, we can also see our data set if we just go to the grand total and double click and it comes up in this workbook. 
Okay, so that's a quick workaround where you can reduce your file size by copying it into a new workbook. Another way to reduce the memory size is to delete the data source. Now because our pivot table is run by the pivot cache, then we can make the changes without having the data source there. But the only thing is that we cannot refresh the pivot table. Let's look at our file size, which is 45 meg. And let's go to our data source, right click and delete and press OK. So we've deleted our data source. If we go to options and refresh, well, we cannot refresh it because our data source is gone. But what we can do, we can actually rearrange this pivot table because it's running by the pivot cache and then put in there the regions. So we can make changes to our pivot table. That's not a problem. I'm gonna press save. And let's go and see our file size now, which is 12 meg. So it's reduced dramatically. Let's go back. Now if we want to see our data source again, all we're going to do is click in our grand total on the bottom right hand corner, double click, and our data source has been included in there. Now we can connect the pivot table, just go to options, change data source, and then select our table here. And press OK and we have our data source connected once again. A good way to reduce file memory is by saving your Excel file as an Excel binary workbook. Now these files store information in binary format. Since .xlsb files are binary, they can be read from and written to much faster, making them extremely useful for very large spreadsheets. Now our file size is 45 meg. Now, if we save this as a binary format, all we're gonna do is choose the formats from in here. And the third option is Excel binary workbook. Click that, press okay. And now let's go to the file tab and have a look that our size has reduced to 26 meg. If you have over a million rows of data, then it's best to use Microsoft Access to create a pivot table. Excel only allows you 1,048,576,000 rows of data that you can input. So anything above that, you'll need to put it into a database like Access. In here, we have an Access database with over 1 million rows of data. So we've got about 1.5 million rows of data here. And what we're going to do is we're going to import that into an Excel worksheet and create a pivot table. Now let's get out of this and go to our Excel workbook. And from in here, we're going to go to insert and pivot table. Now we're going to choose the use an external data source option and then click on choose a connection. We're going to browse for more. And then what we're going to do is go on to our directory where our file is kept. So here it is here, we're gonna double click that and we're gonna create it in cell A1, press OK. So from in here, we have all of our fields and we can simply drop in and create our pivot table, just like that. So we have all our data there that you can see. Now just to make sure that everything is there, we can drop in the sales again and then use a count just to count the number of transactions that are there. If we go all the way down, you see we've got 1.5 million rows of transaction as we had in the Access database. So as your Access database gets amended, then all you do is press refresh to make the updates, or you can go to connection properties and in there choose refresh every X number of minutes or refresh data when opening the file. Another advantage is that if we save this, then our file size is small. Let's have a look, file, and we've got 28 meg of data. Now there are a few compatibility issues with Excel 2007 and Excel 2010. Now Excel 2010 has slices, 
In Excel 2007, they're not visible. So if you create an Excel file with slices in Excel 2010, and you open it in Excel 2007, then they're not visible. A box will appear instead, stating that the slicer cannot be viewed in Excel 2007. Also, Excel 2010 has six different calculations. Now, if these calculations were created in Excel 2010 and opened in Excel 2007, you will see the results, but if you refresh, then these go away. Now, in Excel 2010, under the Report and Layout, the Repeat All Items Labels option, if these calculations were created in Excel 2010 and opened in Excel 2007, then you will see the results, but if you refresh, it will go away. And finally, if you've saved an Excel file in Excel 2007 as compatibility mode and you opened it in Excel 2010, then you need to refresh the pivots in order to have the full Excel 2010 pivot features. Now you can share a pivot table via Microsoft's OneDrive. Now OneDrive is the same as SkyDrive, they've recently changed the name. And before that, to have access to it, you need to set up an account with live.com. So all you need to do is have access to OneDrive via Microsoft and then you can upload all your files in there, which I've done here, and then you can share it. So if you click on this creating a custom style Excel workbook, and then go to share, we've got the option to invite people or get a link. Now, we have three options. The person can view only, they can edit, or can be public to everyone. Now let's go to edit and create link. So now what I can do is go to invite people, and then I've got here, I can write a note that, please see my pivot table for this year's results. And then here you got the recipients can edit, which is the step that I chose before. But you can click there and you can do the view only. But let's do edit. And in there, recipients don't need a Microsoft account. So you don't really have to have a Microsoft account to access it. You can open it in a web browser. Now let's press share and then press close. And now I'm gonna go into my inbox. And now that I'm in my inbox, you can see that I've received this email. And it says here, John has a document to share with you on OneDrive. To view it, click the link below. So, so I'm going to click this link and it opens up a web browser. So you don't have to have an account there. And in here, we have our pivot table with our slices that work. Now in here, I can just right click and show field list, and then I can take out the information here. So financial year goes out, and then I put in there the sales quarter, and that gets updated as well. So you can make changes there with your field list. Also, if you want to save this on your computer, you can just go to file, and then save as, and then save it onto your computer there. So this is a good way to send information and view your pivot table with the slices over the web and it eliminates sending emails. We have our data source here and in our financial year we have data just for the year 2014. And what we want to do is create a sales forecast based on a 5%, 10% and 20% increase on the 2014 actual financial year. So let's go to our pivot table here and we've created a pivot table with our sales regions and our months going on top and we have that there. So now we can create a sales forecast simply by going into the calculated field. So now we're in anywhere in our pivot table, we can go to options and then fields, items and sets, calculated field. So from in here, we can create our different calculated fields. The first one is going to be forecast next year at 5%. Forecast next year at 5%. So the formula will be the field with the actuals. And then let's use the multiplication sign and press 1.05. So that's a 5% increase. And we can 
add that. Now let's add another one at 10%. And in here, we're going to bring in the sales and then 1.1 and press add. So we've got that there. And then we'll do another one at 20%. And then 1.2 and press add. So we have the three different scenarios there and press OK. So we can see here in our values that they've been added in here. Let's just make this a little bit bigger. So we can see that there. And let's go in there into each one, value field settings. And in here, we can put in an asterisk just to distinguish it that it's a calculated field and press OK. We'll do the same for the next one. And then last for that one there and press OK. So we can reduce that a bit there and like this. Now they've also been added to our field list. Okay, let's get out of here. And we can see if we just double click in between the columns that we have the actuals, the forecast at 5% increase, the forecast at 10% increase, and the forecast at 20% increase. And it goes all the way across for each month, and then we have the totals. So now right click and go back into the show field list. So what we can do is actually take out the sum of actual and just leave in the 5% amount. So we can see from in here, if we can just double click to reduce it, we have the 11 million. Now right click to show the field list again and let's take out 5% and let's put in there the 10% figure and see what we get. Get the 11 million grand total. Okay, we'll take that out and we'll put in the 20% and we get 12.7 million there. So with calculated fields, you can put in different scenarios based on your actual data, use a multiplication sign and then put an increase or a decrease and you can do some different sales forecasting models. We can just highlight all that, press control copy and Control V in there and Control V in there. Okay, so the first one, we can put in the 5% scenario. In the second one, we'll put in the 10% scenario and click on the third one and we'll leave it at 20% there. So we have our three different scenarios and you can make your decision on which one to use based on what your business sees as feasible. With the pivot table wizard, we can actually consolidate information into one pivot table. Now we have here four different salespersons data and they're all in similar format. You see there salesperson one, salesperson two, salesperson three, and salesperson four. Now if they're all in the same format, then we can consolidate. Let's go to the consolidated report. Now the pivot chart wizard, there's two ways to bring it up. One is to press Alt, D, and P, and we can bring it up like that. Let's cancel out of there. The other way is to go into the Quick Access Toolbar, Commands Not on Ribbon, and then put in Pivot Table and Pivot Chart Wizard. Now to do that, we'll go to File, and Options, Quick Access Toolbar, and then from the drop-down box, Commands Not on Ribbon, and then click in there and put P to go all the way down, and then we can just and we can just choose the pivot table and pivot chart wizard and press add, press OK, and then it's added in here. So let's press that to start our wizard. Now it gives us three options. The first option is Microsoft Excel list or database. The second option is external data source. And the third option is multiple consolidation ranges. And we choose the pivot table and press next. And then in here to create a page field, choose I will create the page fields and press next. So now the first step is to select the range and let's go in here and select that and press enter and then add. Go to the second sales range, select that, then add it. The third salesperson's data, select it, add, and then finally the fourth sale information there, and then press add. 
Now, how many page fields do you want? We'll put in a zero because we're not going to use any page fields. And then press next. And then finally, it asks us where do we want to put the pivot table report. Let's choose somewhere there and press finish. And you see the pivot table field list here has got row, column, and value because it's defaulted to those names. Now, the values, we can just choose a drop down arrow, go to value field settings, and then number format, and go to number. No decimal places, thousand separator, and press OK, and then OK there. So here we have our consolidated report from the four different salespeople. Now, if we go into one report here, and let's just say there's a change that was made. For example, let's put in a big amount, one million, and press Enter. If we go back here, all you need to do is right click and refresh, and then you see the value change on the bottom right hand corner there from 127 to about 128 million. Press refresh and you see that gets updated. So each time your salesperson sends you an updated report, you can just refresh this pivot table and you get the consolidated data. I'll show you another cool little trick. Say you receive your data like this in this format and you want to put it into a tabular format. For example, in the first column, you want to show the regions. The second column, you want to have all the months. And the third column, you want to show the values. Now to do this, we have to bring in our pivot tab wizard and then choose multiple consolidation ranges. Press next. I will create the page fields. Press next. And the range, just choose this, okay? Press enter and then next. And we can just put it in there and press finish. So it brings up our consolidated range, but we've only consolidated one piece of information. That's fine. The trick to this is you've got to double click in your grand total. And then you see here that you get your tabular layout. So you have your regions in the first column. You can change this to regions instead of having row. The column, you can change that to months. And we have the values you go all the way down there so it's a good workaround when you get information that comes in untabular formatted style and you want to put it back into a pivot table tabular format sometimes in finance or accounting you want to do a frequency distribution to see how your sales or cost are distributed depending on different groups. Now we have our information here with our actual dollar sales and let's create a pivot table, going into insert and pivot table and let's put it into our existing worksheet in there and press OK. Now from in here we're going to put in our actual dollars in our row labels and then drop it again into the values area. Now from in here we just want to get a count so we'll see how many transactions fall in between a different group. So let's click in our row label and right click and we need to group here our sales and we have a automatic starting and ending point based on the minimum and maximum amounts. Now we can change that to put in 10,000 and then ending at 100,000 and increments we can have 10 that's fine. Press OK. So we have our sales ranges there and we can see the amount of transactions that we have in the values area there. Now we can put that in a graph by going into options and pivot chart and we can choose a column and press OK. Now just right click there and hide all fill buttons on chart and let's make this a little bit bigger and we can call this frequency distribution of sales. Okay, and then in there, we can just get rid of it. So now we have our graph and we can see the amount of times that we have sales between 10,000 and 19,999. You can see it there. If you hop over there, it's 22. And you've got the different sales groups and we have our frequency distribution in a graph. And you can quickly see which sales ranges are more popular and which sales ranges are not. We can do a break-even analysis with a pivot table. 
we have a scenario an item and a value table here. So in our scenario, we have three different scenarios, slow production, norm production, and fast production. For each scenario, we have a variable cost per unit and a total fixed cost. And we see the values there. Now we can create a pivot table from here. Just click anywhere in there and go to insert and pivot table. And we just put it down here for now. In our row labels, we'll put in there the item and the value will go into the values area. Now let's drop in a slicer for the scenario and press OK. So we have our slicer there. So as we choose the different productions, the pivot table changes. And by this, we can go into our break even model and then reference the cells to the total fixed cost and the variable cost per unit. And as we change the scenarios, then our break even model gets updated accordingly. So let's grab our slicer, press control X and go into our break even point and control V to put it in there. Now we have our break even model, which is a price per unit, which is a manual entry we're gonna pull. The unit sold, again, a manual entry and the total sales is the price per unit times the unit sold. The cost is the variable cost. And in here, we're gonna put the units times the variable cost per unit that's in our pivot table. So let's choose the units and then press times and go to our scenario to get the variable cost per unit, which is in there and press enter. Now the fixed cost will just be the fixed cost total from the pivot table. So go in there and grab that and press enter. So now we're going to put in a price. Let's put in $10 and the unit sold. Let's put in there 2000 and press enter. So on a slow production, we're making a profit. On a normal production, our profit reduces because our variable cost is increased and our total fixed cost has increased. And under a fast production, we have a break even point there. Now you can change these amounts just to play around with the numbers, but based on this analysis and using a slicer, you see how you can put in different scenarios and determine what your break even point is for your product or new business model. Now in here, I've created several different slices that you can copy and paste into a new workbook and apply to your current slices. Now for that, you need to go on to chapter 7.4, copy a custom style into a new workbook to see how you can do that. But here I'm gonna show you the different styles that I've created and also it shows you the flexibility that you have when creating a custom slicer. You have many options and I'll give you some ideas to see of what things you can do. Okay, so let's click in our slicer there and go to options. And in here on the top, I've created eight different slices. So the first one is this, and you see the things that you can do. Let's go to the second one. We'll go to the third one there. The next one. Then in here, so you see different styles and fonts that you can use. And finally, we have this one here. So depending on your creativity, probably yours is much better than mine. You can create different styles. Now, I've created this, it's pretty quick. You have the guide here on the left to see what you need to change. And once you do one, you can actually do many more. So once again, in chapter 7.4, I teach you how to copy a custom style into a new workbook. And in chapter 7.3, how you can create a custom style. With a pivot table and slices, we can create a balance sheet that's interactive. 
Now I've created one here and what I've got in there are four different pivot tables. I've got two graphs that are connected and also some metrics up here. And then with the slicer, once I make a change, the metrics change, the graph changes, and so do the pivot tables. So I can see my different status as that every month. So you can see you can do some pretty powerful reports and it's not that hard. I will show you in the next couple of minutes how to do this. So the first thing you need to do is when you're creating a dashboard or a interactive slicer with charts, you've got to make sure that you set out your canvas and then separate it into different areas. So on the top here, we're going to put in there the slices and then second, we're going to put the metrics. At the bottom, we're going to have the graphs and, and down here, we're going to have our pivot tables. Okay, let's go on to our data and we have our data here, which has the months and we have the years for 2014 only and we have our balance sheet items into current assets, current liabilities and non-current assets and non-current liabilities. And the type here, we have the different types of assets and liabilities as you find in a normal accounting business structure and press OK and we have the actual amounts there. So from in here, we can create a pivot table, go to insert pivot table and existing worksheet and let's put it in here and press OK. So we're going to drop in our balance sheet into the row labels and type into the row labels. So you can see it's like this. Now we'll make some space here so we can fit it in. Now from in here, make sure that under options and options, the auto fit column is switched off and the design subtotals do not show subtotals. And then the field headers, we can get rid of them. And also the no buttons. Now one thing we're going to drop in are the actuals into the values area. Now from in here, we can actually get rid of that and then just press a space. So it recognizes that as a character and it's a workaround to having a blank header. In the grand total, we're going to change that to total current assets and press enter and that's fine. And let's go back to our values and we can put in there the dollar signs into the number format. Let's go to currency and choose dollar signs with a negative red and zero decimal places and press OK there. Now we can filter this just for the assets. So when we go into the balance sheet, we can just select current assets and press OK. So it just gives us the current assets and in the design, we can choose this one in there. Now we can click and go to options and select entire pivot table and press control copy. And in there, press control V. We've pasted the similar format in here. So we don't have to go and redo all the formatting again. So the only thing now is instead of the balance type being assets, we can just choose current liabilities and that changes there. Now let's do the same for the non-current assets. So again, click there, select entire pivot table, control copy, and down here, press control V and we can do the same thing there. Okay, so let's click in the non-current assets. Let's change that to select the non-current assets. And in here, let's select to include the non-current liabilities. Now let's delete this space here. And then in here, we can just highlight it and put in a light gray. And the total assets, let's do the sum, which is current assets plus the total current assets. Now we get a get pivot data, so let's escape out of that. Let's click in a pivot table, go to options, and from the drop down option, let's get rid of get pivot data, because we don't want that. Once again, let's click in there. And then we'll do the same thing for the liabilities. 
So we have our pivot tables there for the assets and the liabilities. We can actually highlight all of this and choose a different font if you like. Okay, so the next step now is going to put the ratios there. So the current ratio is current assets divided by current liabilities. The quick ratio is the current assets minus the inventory divided by the current liabilities. So we get that minus the inventory and then divided by the current liabilities. Now the debt equity ratio equals the total liabilities divided by the owner's equity. So let's go to the total liabilities there and divide by the owner's equity. And the owner's equity is simply total assets minus total liabilities. So total assets minus total liabilities. So we have our numbers there. And in here we can just adjust it if you like. Now, one thing I noticed here that we didn't change the names for the grand totals here. So here it should be total on current assets. Here should be total current liabilities. And in here, total non-current liabilities. The next thing is to put in here the charts that relate to the total liabilities. So let's highlight total liabilities and the amount there and go to insert and bar chart and we can include that in there. So let's just do it in here for the moment. We can get rid of the titles there and then the grid lines. Let's make this a little bit bigger and then highlight that and get rid of it. So let's click in our bar chart and press control one and then from in here we can go to field and pattern field and then choose this format there and then we can choose a red color and then let's click outside of the border there and then the border color have no line as well now from the x-axis click on that press control one Maximum, you can leave it as automatic, but we're going to put it into maximum of 1 million and the major unit will be 200,000. Display units, we're going to put that in hundreds and then the minor tick mark will have that cross. We'll show display units on label chart, that's fine. And press OK. And finally, let's make this in grey colour and this as well. So we've created the chart and we can just make it a little bit smaller or bigger just depending on the size there. So we're gonna do the same thing for the other chart. So instead of going through the same process, we're gonna save this chart. So go to design, save template as. Now when you do that, it goes to the Microsoft templates and charts and we're gonna call it in the interactive balance sheet. So let's create the other chart. Let's click on the total assets and go to insert and bar and bar. And we'll have that there. So let's go to the change chart type from the templates. Let's hover over here and go on to our interactive balance sheet and press OK. Now we're gonna change this to a green color and also it's gonna go from right to left as well. Let's click in the chart, press Control one and then the Fill is going to be a green color. Now let's click in here and the values are going to be in reverse order and press OK. One thing I noticed is that we have 100. Now let's click in here and press Control 1 and we change it to thousands. And the same thing for that. Let's click in the x axis and change that to thousands. OK. So now we can put the charts in our dashboard and we can reduce it like this just to make it fit and we can change that later on. Okay, now the same thing for this. We can just put it in there. Okay, now one thing is that background should be gray, so click there and then put in the light gray background, 
click in the graph, press F4 to repeat. The same thing in there, press F4 to repeat. And we have our chart in there. The final thing we need to do is put in that array slicer so we can control the months. So click anywhere in the pivot table, go to options and insert a slicer and let's choose month and press OK. And from in here, we can put it into six columns. We can drag it across like that. Right click, slicer settings, get rid of the display header. Now let's choose the custom slicer which I created earlier called John's Wigger Slicer and we can reduce it like this or we can just make the buttons a little bit bigger so we can fit in there. So that's fine in there. Now one thing we need to do is connect the slicer to the four different pivot tables. So, now click on the slicer there, right click and pivot table connections and just check all the boxes. So we're connecting all the pivot tables to the slicer and press OK. So now we press January, the pivot tables change, the totals update and so do our metrics. So we have our live and interactive dashboard. You can see at any time how your business is doing, which is a pretty powerful tool to use, but it is pretty easy to create this once you know how to use pivot tables, slices, and a couple of charts. And by going through this course, you're gonna find out how to do all this stuff here. And it's not that hard. It looks pretty fascinating. Use the pivot table principles and some common sense. Then you can create a dashboard just like this. Here we're going to create a monthly sales manager performance where we see the sales for each sales manager on the left hand side going all the way down the rows and then get a percentage variance from the previous month. So we track each salesperson's progress from one month to the next to see whether they've increased the sales or decreased the sales from the previous month. And we're going to use some conditional formatting to show the variances visually. Now let's create this. Click anywhere in our data set, go to insert and pivot table and go to new worksheet. On the left hand side we're going to put in the financial year, then the sales month. The salesperson will go on the column labels and we're going to put in there the sales twice. Now let's close that. Let's reduce this a bit. Now go to design and grand totals off for rows and columns. Let's make a few adjustments here. Let's just make this centered. Okay, now let's bring in our field list and we have our sum of sales there. Now, let's click in there just to format our numbers. And in here, we can click and choose show values as, and we'll get the difference from percentage difference from the previous month. So we're going to show values as percentage difference from the previous sales month and press OK. We can go back in there and just format the numbers. Let's go to custom and choose a red in there. And then before the semicolon, we'll put in a percentage. I press OK and OK. And let's change the name here. Instead of sum of sales, let's call it delta or variance. I'll call it a delta and that changes there and here instead of sum of sales let's call it sales that already exists let's press ok and put a space and then we have that in there now we need to put in there a conditional format so let's click in the variance column and go to conditional formatting and choose the icon set and let's choose these arrows here now from this drop down box let's choose the last option just so we can see the conditional format only on the values and not the subtotals. Now finally we need to go back to conditional format, manage rules, double click in here and let's show icon only. So we don't want to see the percentages, we just want to see the icon. And the values here, when the value is bigger than zero, a number, and also 
zero and a number. So it's bigger than zero, it'll be green. If it's zero, it'll be orange. And if it's less than zero, it'll be red. Now let's press OK. Apply this. OK, it works perfect. And OK once again. We can see here that 294 is bigger than 170. 312 is bigger than 294. And then 229 is less than 312. So it goes down. So you see the delta for Homer Simpson, the delta for Enright, and so forth. Now finally, let's go and put in a slicer. Let's make some space up here so we can put it in there. Let's go to Options, Insert Slicer, and Get Salesperson. Now let's make it like this, and we can go two columns. Just make it a little bit bigger, and we can increase the size a bit, and we can change it to a color like that. We can put in there. Let's make it a little bit bigger. Okay, so we have that salesperson there. So now, if we choose Homer Simpson, we see his values there. We can just make this a little bit smaller so you can see it goes all the way down there. Okay. Now let's double click here so we can get a bit more space. In right, Tommy Colludas. And if you want to see all of them again, just clear the filter. So by using show values as, some conditional formatting and some slices, you can do some impressive sales manager performance reports. We have our list of customers here and we have the payments column here and in black we have the outstanding receivables and in red we have the payments that we have received from them. Now we can do a reconciliation by going into customers and sorting from A to Z. So we can have all the customers sorted alphabetically. And then we can go to the payments column and then manually see whether that equals to zero. And we can see down here that it does equal to zero. But imagine if we had a thousand customers, we'll be here all day doing this. Now there's a quick way to reconciling customer payments. Let's go to insert pivot table and we can just put it in here in the existing worksheet. And let's drop the customers in the row labels and then the payments in our values. Now by doing this, it sums up the credits and the debits and it gives us a zero amount if our customers have paid. And then we can see here that 123 Warehousing and ABC Telecom have paid the bills. Now Acme Corp, we have $3,467 outstanding, so they still owe us some money. But in AX, we have a negative 2,900. So they overpaid us. And we can have a look here. If we highlight that, we can see that there were two payments of 3,200. So it shows us there that, that our customer has overpaid us and we need to return the money. So by doing a pivot table, you can quickly analyze a bank reconciliation instead of doing the manual way. And you're sure to save heaps of time. Now I'm gonna show you a great add-in that will save you heaps of time when you're working with pivot tables. It's called Pivot Power, and it's an add-in from Contextious.com. Now Deborah Douglish is the one that invented this add-in, and it's absolutely fabulous. Now she's written lots of books on Excel pivot tables, and has been around the game for many years, and based on her experiences, she's come up with this little gem where it's gonna save you heaps of time. Now I've got a 20% discount for you. So if you stick around at the end of this video, I'll show you the code where you can use and purchase it from her website. Now I'll show you some quick benefits of this add-in. Now when we have a pivot table and we create it into a new worksheet or any worksheet, say we want to put in there some fields. For example, let's put in our quarters in our row labels. And then let's put in our sales month down here as well. And then the years on the column labels and then the sales here. So we have our pivot table here and that's a default pivot table and it's pretty ugly looking. You have this style here which is not very nice. The numbers are not formatted with a comma and you have the grid lines in the back which looks pretty ugly. So every time you do a pivot table you gotta go into the design, choose your favorite design, then you gotta go into here, value fill settings and then change the number format from in here. So you see that you've got about three, four steps to choose. And then view and get rid of the grid line. So you get a few steps here. Every time you 
to a pivot table. So imagine you had a default setting. So you press one button and then it gets updated automatically. This is where the pivot power comes in. So the add-in is in here. So once you purchase it and you download it, you've got all these different features here. And, it, and I'll talk about it, just a couple of them now. So you've got the set default. So in here is where you set your default of how you want your pivot table to look. And then next time you come in there, all you've got to press is the apply defaults and it'll apply to all your pivot tables. So in here, we can choose the format, auto fit column widths. We can get rid of that because every time you refresh, you don't want it to reduce the column size. You want to keep it the way that you want it. You've got to hear some grand totals as well. Now, a good thing here is the sort field list from A to Z, so you can sort it automatically. So from A to Z, imagine you had a big list and it, was, it wasn't sorted alphabetically, then you know it would be a mess to get in there and try and find some fields. You got some printing settings there. Now in the report layout, you can choose a compact tabular or outline. Now I personally like the compact, but I know a lot of people like the tabular and the outline format. So you can choose which one you like. I'll keep it a compact. Now the style, you got all the different styles there. Okay. So if you go into your design and then hover, whichever one you like, you see you get your style number. So this is called medium two. So I can go back in there and say, I want to show the medium two, okay? So medium two, you got everything in there. You choose whatever one you like. I'll keep it there. Okay, so let's go back here and just do the compact. We had the auto fit columns off. Now in here, you've got a few other things that you can do. Refresh data on file open. You can keep it like that. Now let's go to the pivot field. You got a few settings in here that you can choose. And also if you've got a number format, here you got the different formats. So you got number, accounting, percentage. Now I like a number with a zero decimal, okay? And I'll apply this selected number format all the time. You also have the workbook settings here. And in here, you got the option to show grid lines or not show. I hate grid lines, so I'm not gonna show them. Let's press save and apply. And look at that. It's applied that to our pivot table. So you wanna go back to your data table and do another pivot table into a new worksheet. You just drop a few things in here. It doesn't have to be in order, whatever you like. All you're gonna do is go back to your pivot power add-in and say apply default and apply all defaults and it updates it automatically and you save heaps of time. So you have a pivot table here and you just want to quickly put in some number formats. Well, you go to pivot power and apply this number or format and it does it automatically and it saves you heaps of steps. In this pivot table, I've got some count of sales and average of sales. And if we look in there, right click, you have your different values there. And say we want to change all of these into sales. We'll have to go back into one, valuable settings, sales, and do the same thing for each one of them. Imagine you had about 10 different metrics there, and you just want these sales. Well, in pivot power, you go to pivot power and choose the sum all, and it changes it to the sum. And go to number format, and it puts in the formatting there. Now let's drop in some filters in here. And then we can just quickly choose a few of the filters. And then sales region, choose a couple. Okay, so we have a few of our filters there. Now, say you wanna clear them, you gotta go in and press all, and then go in and press all. And that, that's a long way. Let's press Control Z and we'll go back. And so we had, okay, a couple of more filters here, a lot of our customers and choose a couple. Now, a quick way to clear the filter is pivot power and then go to clear all filters with one step. Another thing is the get pivot data is just right there so you can turn it on or off. A great feature is on the pivot table. You go to pivot table and list all pivot tables and it shows you in a separate sheet which pivot tables that you have active in the workbook. And it also shows you the pivot cache number in there and also the last refresh date. We'll go back in here. You go to cache, you got a cache list. It shows you how many caches you have. And here we have cache index number one. So if you've got an array of different buttons that will save you heaps of time when you're working with pivot tables. Whether you're new to pivot tables or an advanced user, this is definitely a great add-in. And because you've purchased my Extreme Pivot Table course, then Deborah and I will give you a 20% discount if you put in this code in here, M-E-O-X-P-T-C. 
and that's short for my excel online extreme pivot table course so if you put in those seven letters when you go to the checkout which is also listed now you'll get a 20 percent discount upon checkout so if you have any queries or any issues you can you can send me an email and then i'll be glad to answer any questions that you may have So we have Excel 2013 on the top here. We have the ribbon here and we have Excel 2010 at the bottom half here. And I'm just going to go through a couple of the cosmetic changes in Excel 2013. When we click in the pivot table, we get the pivot table tools option in Excel 2010 and we have the options and design tab. In Excel 2013, options has been changed to analyze. So you can see there it's called analyze and 2010 is called options. That's pretty much the major difference. Everything else has remained the same. It's just a name change, just to confuse us. But apart from that, nothing else has changed. Okay, so another thing you see in 2013, we have the insert timeline, which I want to talk about shortly. That's a new feature in Excel 2013, and also the recommended pivot tables over here. If we go to design, and then go to design in Excel 2010 here. Nothing much has changed. Everything else has remained the same there. So the major change is a name from options to analyze, but that is just a simple name change and a couple of extra features that have been added into Excel 2013, which I'll talk about. Now let's talk about the pivot table field list here. So now on the left hand side, I have the 2013 Excel version. On the right hand side, I have 20. 10. So we see the different pivot table field lists. Nothing has changed there. Now, one thing you see here is more tables here. Now, this is the data model in Excel 2013, which I will explain. That's the more tables option here. Now, the other thing we can see here is in Excel 2010, it's called row labels. In Excel 2013, it's called rows. In Excel 2010, it's called column labels. In Excel 2013, it's called columns. Now, they're just simple name changes. Apart from that, everything else seems the same. We have an Excel tab here, and let's go and insert a pivot table. Go to Insert, and you can see here in Excel 2013 is recommended pivot tables here. Now, if you don't know which pivot table layout will be best used with your data, then I highly recommend you apply this recommended pivot table options. Now click on that and it has the 10 different ways that you can summarize the Excel table that we have here. And you can scroll all the way down and then choose with your mouse and then you can see it over here. So it's a count of sales by products can of sales by sales. So it gives you a preview of the different layouts that can be applied with the data that you have. So let's click down here. So this is quite good, especially if you have a lot of data and you, and you don't know what to start. You think, okay, so what goes in the rows, what goes in the columns? This will definitely help you to get started, especially if you're a newbie. Even if you're uh, an intermediate or, or even advanced user, sometimes you get caught up with all the data and it's good to sit back and see the different options that are available. And it may just lead you to create a pivot table that you never thought you would have created previously. Now you can click here on blank pivot table and it gives you just a blank pivot table. You can start from fresh. You can also change your data source and you can get another data source if you like. But let's choose one of them here. Let's choose this. I like that. Press OK. And you see that it's already done for you. It's putting the fields in the rows and in the values here. So it's just save you lots of dragging and clicking. And if you don't like this, well, you just move it around. So great, great new feature in Excel 2013, which is going to save you lots of time and expand your pivot table horizons. you want to do a distinct count using Excel 2010, you would have to put in a complex sum product formula. But in Excel 2013, you can do this quickly using the data model feature. Now we have our 
sales table here and there's a lot of order dates here they go all the way down to about 50,000 rows and as you can see a lot of dates are duplicated and we want to know how many distinct or unique counts we have in the order date to do this we need to create a pivot table go to insert and pivot table and then add this to the data model now let's put in our order date in the rows column there and again the order date in the values here now this will count it here so it will show the total number of transactions and let's drop it in again here and what we want to do now in the second one we want to do the distinct count so let's click in the drop down choose value field settings and then in the summarize values by there's a new distinct count calculation here that's been added and that is just fabulous so all we're going to do is we can just change this here distinct count and press ok so there you have it a number one just to confirm that that works properly Excel 2013 extends slices for date fields and these are called timelines. Now a new timeline slicer enables you to easily filter your pivot table by month, quarter or year. In our Excel table here we have order dates so our timeline slicer will be created because you need a date to create that. So let's go to insert and pivot table and put into a new worksheet and press OK. Let's put in some sales in our values area over there and put in the sales regions like that. Now we're in the pivot table, pivot table tools, analyze and here insert timeline. Let's read this. Use a timeline to filter dates interactively. Timelines make it faster and easier to select time periods in order to filter pivot tables pivot charts and cube functions. Let's press that. Now it gives us the slicer. The only slicer that's available is order date because that is a date. If I had more columns with dates, it will bring it up. Because I've only got one date column, it gives me only one option. Click that, press OK. And here we have it. How nice is this? So the order date is the field name there. And if we scroll all the way to the left there, we have Jan 2012 all the way to December 2014. And that is the range that we have here. So that's the data range that we have from 2012 to 2014. And it shows it here. These are the available filters that we have based on our data. And you can expand that and make it bigger like this. And so you can scroll all the way there. And let's choose January, February, and it, see how it changes and here it gives you the option to expand and and include other months so we can do the first quarter in January and you see when I did that it says Q1 2012 just click on April and hold down the left mouse key and it automatically puts Q2 over there now let's clear the filter here and let's go if you want by years so it automatically puts it by years and you can say 2012, 2013, 2014. Let's put it by quarters. And let's go Q1, 2, 3, 4. And you can highlight all that. Let's clear the filter. Let's go to months and it gives us the months. And then we can go all the way down to days. All the way down to days. So day one from January. So this is really good filter if you want to drill down and expand on your analysis. This is a great, great tool and a great feature in Excel 2013. Now let's go back to quarters over here and let's go to timeline tools. When you click in that and click out, let's click back into it. It gives us a timeline tools option here and we can color it like a slicer. We can use the different slices there or the different colors. And if we have several other timelines, we can use this 
report connections to connect them. That's creating a dashboard and I talked about that in previous chapter. So if you have different timeline slices, then you can connect them and create an interactive dashboard. Now you can move the height, the width, include the header tag, get rid of it, the selection label, the scroll bar, and also the time level. So different stuff there. This is very, very nice. I like it. And you can also create a new timeline style by clicking in there. And we talked about how you create slicer styles. The same thing applies here to timelines. This is a great feature. Go for it. Insert it. Play around with it and wow your boss. Excel data model is new in Excel 2013 and it allows you to take information from different Excel tables and create a pivot table from it. Now before this you had to use VLOOKUPs or some IFs and it got a bit messy. But if there's a relationship between each of the tables then you can create a data model. So we have an Excel table here and if we click on it and go to design, it's called sales data. The same thing here for customer, I call the customer data and product, I call the product data. So let's go to the sales here. So this has, if you scroll all the way down, it has nearly 50,000 transactions. So these are daily transactions and it's usually what we download from our ERP system. And it has a product key and a customer number. Now the customer number here you can see it's depicted by 1001 all the way to 1010. And in our customer table here, we have the customer numbers 1001 all the way to 1010. And these are distinct values. Now, if these are distinct values, then we can create a relationship. If we had, for example, two rows with 1001 and a different customer name, this wouldn't work. For a data model to work, one of the table has to have distinct values and the other one, for example, the sales can have as many values as it wants. So this is the one to many relationship. So the one is this unique Excel table here with the unique customer numbers. And then the many is the sales transactional Excel table with many customer numbers. So we have customer number here and we can create a relationship within the customer here. Now, we also have a product key here. So we have a product key. It goes all the way down from 1 to 20. And in our product table, we have these unique entries. And that means that we can create a data model relationship. Now to do this, let's click in any one of our tables. Let's click in sales and go to insert and a pivot table. And we get our create pivot table dialog box. Now, what I can do is put in here, add this to the data model and press OK. So you can see here it's loading to the data model. So that loads it all the way there into the data model. If we go to all, now in all, we have all the different tables that are available so now for us to create a pivot table. So we created a data model and what we need to do now is to create a relationship. So to create a relationship under Analyze and Relationships and go to New. Now the table here is the table that has all the transactions. So, so that'll be the sales down here. So let's click on Sales Data and let's create the relationship. So we said that the customer number is unique to sales and also to the customer table. Now the related table will be the customer data and the related column will be the customer number in this Excel table there. Now the primary key is the table that has the unique identifiers. If there are any duplicates in there, it's not gonna work. So this is the primary means of the one. The foreign means to many, so it's a one to many relationship. So if you ever get confused, 
always put your Excel table that doesn't have duplicates into the primary area. And then if you have a sales data table, which has many rows, then obviously we'll have duplicates, put it into the foreign area. Now let's press OK. So that's created that relationship. Let's add another one. Let's go to new. So our sales data will go in, into the many side, which is the foreign side. And we're going to put the product key now because we're going to relate it to the product data Excel table. And then in here, the product key was the unique identifier. So it's a one to many relationship and press OK. Now you see when I did that here on the right hand side that the top of this diagram went gray. That means that there is a relationship and is now loaded to the data model. Okay, now I'm gonna change this around here just so I can, for our purposes. Okay, so we can see much better and that's great. So now all we can do is get the sales data the sales amount from the sales data, put in the values there. And we can get a, another field in here. We can get the, we have the product key in the sales data, but we don't know what the product name is because the product key and the product key are related here, that and that are related. We can get any of these fields and drop them in here and create a pivot table analysis. So let's get a product name and then let's put it in the row labels. And you can see that. It shows us the sales per product name. So it's taken two Excel tables and created a pivot table from that and without using any VLOOKUP. We can also go in here and put in a customer name if we like, because we said the name is linked to the customer number. So if the customer number and the customer number here are linked, then we can take any of these fields and bring them into our analysis. So let's put in the name in the columns area. And there you have it over there. Let's just put that over there. And that's our analysis that we have our three Excel tables that are linked together and we can choose which fields to use because they're all related to each other and it gives us the power to do all this great analysis. A new feature in Excel 2016 is the ability to auto group a date column. Now we have our table here and we have our order date there. Now let's create a pivot table and I'll show you how this works. Got to insert pivot table and a new worksheet. And we have here our, let's make this a little bit bigger. Okay, so you can see. Okay, we have our order date there. And let's put in the sales first in there. So let's put in the order date in the rows and have a look at what's going to happen. It automatically grouped into years, quarters, and it's got our order date in there as well. So in our pivot table, we can expand here and we can see the quarters. And we can even go deeper into the months. So this is a great feature and it saves you the hassle of right clicking in a date and then choosing the group. Now this automatically groups it and it's super, super, awesome feature they've added in Excel 2016. Now, if you don't like this, then you can just right click and press ungroup and it will bring everything back in there and get rid of the years and quarters. Now let's right click and group and put it like this as it was before. So if there are multiple years, the years will come up and then you have your quarters and you have your original date field there. So a great feature in Excel 2016. In previous versions of Excel, when you had to select a slicer and you wanted to select say a second or third slicer, you had to hold in a control key. So I'm holding a control key and pressing Asia and Europe. You see that? 
Now with Excel 2016, this icon's here, which is multi-select. So you can press that and then you can left click with your mouse without holding the control key and it selects multiple items. New feature in Excel 2016 is the ability for pivot charts to expand or collapse its data. Let me show you an example. Click in our Excel table and go to insert and pivot chart and let's press new worksheet and just press OK. So let's put in our sales in our values area and let's put in our products in our axis. And then when we put in two or more fields in one of our axis or legend series, then it gives us the ability to zoom in or zoom out. So I'll show you that. When I put this in, you see in the bottom right hand corner, the plus and minus sign. So let's put in the sales region in there. So you can see the collapse field, you can collapse it and also the pivot table gets collapsed or you can expand it and then see all the details in there. So this is great if you just want to show two different scenarios when you're doing a presentation to your boss. Now if your data has geographical fields such as addresses or postal codes, you can build a pivot table on a map by using the 3D maps icon on the insert tab. So we have postcodes here for US and they're all the way down there. So you got different postcodes. And what we need to do is go to insert and 3D map here. And we can put in a new tour. And you can see here, it's put in our postcodes, if we zoom in there, the different postcodes that we have located. So it shows us where our values are located, so where our sales are located. Now in the hide here, we can add a values field. So click on that and put in a sales. So you can see that from in here, let's just bring this down here and we can get rid of that and just bring it up there. So we can see that because we chose a stack column, it shows a stack column like this, which is a little bit weird. And then we have the bubble and then the heat map, you know, which, which is a little bit better, which shows us where our most sales are. So, you know, whatever he has, has a dark red there, it means that there's a lot of sales there. So this is pretty cool in Excel 2016. If you have addresses or zip codes, it uses Bing to visualize a map and it just gives you another way where you can visualize your data to your management team. And I think they're gonna be very impressed. So Excel introduced many wonderful new features in its update in Excel 2019. And before we get into them, I'd like to just let you know which Excel version that you currently have, because a lot of people get confused. Every three years, there's a new update. So, you know, they get confused and they don't know what Excel version they actually have. So I will just quickly show you how you can check which Excel version you're currently using. Now, I'm using Excel Office 365. With that, I get the new updates when they are released. So when Excel 2019 was released, then automatically I got all those features. But if you purchase the one-time license for Excel 2019, then you will also have these new features. So I'm just gonna let you know how you can check which Excel version you have. So you need to go to File, and then account and then about Excel over here on the right hand side. Now in here it will say Excel for Office 365 because I'm on the subscription model. If you have Excel 2019 it will say here Excel 2019. If you have any other version like 2016, 2013, 2010 it will say that up here. So being Office 365 I always get the new versions updated so therefore being on this subscription model, 
I have the latest version, which means I have Excel 2019. You can also check below. I have a link that goes to my blog and explains the different Excel versions and how to check them. It just makes it easier for you to find which Excel version that you're using. Over the last few years, I've held many pivot table webinars and I get lots of questions in the webinar chat. And one of the most common questions is how can I make my pivot table layout a default layout? So every time I create a pivot table, it shows me the layout that I want and not the default layout that Excel gives. Thankfully, in Excel 2019, this feature is finally available. So you can personalize the default pivot table layout. Now, I'll show you what I mean. We have a data source here, and I'm just gonna create a pivot table. So I go to insert pivot table and put it into a new worksheet and press OK. And I'm just gonna create a pivot table here, and it's going to create a default pivot table layout based on Excel's options. So let's put in our custom main here and we'll put in our products. Now let's get our order date in the columns area and now let's get the sales in the values area. So this is it, this is Excel's default pivot table layout which is in a compact form and you can see that the subtotals are on the top here okay see so the subtotals are on the top and then the values at the bottom and you can see the grand total is in the rows and in the columns here so but some people may not want this because this is confusing because you know normally when you're adding these up this is where the value should be it should be at the bottom the subtotal should be at the bottom and in previous lessons, I showed you how you can do that. You just go to the design and go to the report layout and you can change it all here. And compact outline tabula, repeat all items, grand totals, there you go, you, all there, and the subtotals as well. You also got the blank row. So this is how you can change it. But you can actually predetermine the layout. So each time you create a pivot table in the future, Excel knows the layout that you like and it will always show you that layout. So let's get into it. To do this, you've got to go to File and then go to Options. And under Data, you've got this one here. You've got Edit Default Layout. So make changes to, to the default layout or pivot tables. Click on that. The subtotals, we want them at the bottom. We don't want them at the top. The default is Show All Subtotals at Top of Group. It makes no sense for me. Um, I want to put it at bottom of group. Grand totals on for rows and columns. Yes, I like that. Let's keep that. Report layout showing compact form. I personally like this, but a lot of people want to show it in a tabular format or in the outline format. Let's put in a tabular form. Now, you have many other things you can do. You can insert blank line after each item if you like. You can repeat all item labels and you can include filtered items in totals. Now, there are more options here. So I'm just going to unclick that and go to pivot table options and in here layout and format whatever you do here it's going to affect the layout. So if you have any, any error values you can put in a zero or NA. For empty cells you can put any number that you like. The same thing here. So totals and filters, display, printing and data and we go through this in the earlier lessons of this course. So any changes you make here, it's going to affect this here. I'm just going to leave it the same now, okay? So I'm just going to press OK. And these are the changes that we made. We made two changes. Show all subtotals at the bottom of group. And also, the report layout should be in tabular form. Now let's make a third one. Let's insert a blank line after each item just to make it a little bit different. And press OK. And then press OK. Now. It hasn't taken shape because you need to create a new Excel pivot table. So let's go in here again. Click on there. Insert pivot table. New worksheet. Let's put the customer in there. The products as we had before. The order date in the columns. And now have a look at it. You see it's taking shape. It's a different shape, isn't it? Let's put the sales in here. 
there you go. So as you can see here, it has made these changes. Um, it's put in, put in the subtotals at the bottom of the group. It's made it into a tabular format. As you can see here, you can compare to the earlier version. It's in compact, so everything is in one column. Tabular means it just expands it out into two columns. And then it has the values there. And we've also added a blank line um, after each item. So it looks much better. And each time you open your pivot table report or any Excel workbook and you import data and you create a pivot table, this layout, the default layout that you tell Excel is going to show all the time. So this is awesome. It's going to save you a lot of time. Another cool feature in Excel 2019 is the automatic relationship detection in your Excel tables and in your Excel pivot table. Now, Excel knows when your analysis requires two or more tables to be linked together and it notifies you. Now with one click, it does all the work to build the relationships so you can take advantage of them straight away. Before you go any further into this tutorial, it is a must that you watch the video that I did in the new Excel 2013 features. It is for the data models. So I suggest you go and watch that video now so you can have a look at how you can do this data relationship manually. So pause this, go back into chapter 15.5 data models, have a look at it and come back when you're finished. All right, so I hope that you got lots of value from that video tutorial and it just goes to show you what data model is and the relationships and how to create them manually. There's a bit of work involved, but in Excel 2019, they've made this a lot easier. Now, we have the same data source as the tutorial that you saw previously in 15.5 called data models. We have the sales here, as you can see, these are all our transactions, about 50,000 transactions. And this is the many transactions here that we have. And these are the one or the unique. So this is the one to many and the product is one to many. Okay. So as I said before, under the customer table, we have the unique values to do a relationship. You could have unique values here. If you had two rows with the same number, one double O one and one double O one, it's not going to work. So these values are going to be unique. And this table here also has unique values for the product key. Now to do this auto relationship detection, we have to do the same thing. Go to insert pivot table and just click here, add this to the data model and press OK. And it automatically will add all the tables in this workbook in the data model. We know this because if you go to all here and we just hover over here, you can see the data source the name, table, it's customer data, that's what we've named it, and it's a model table name. So that's in the data model. We click on there, and it's a model as well, and that's a model. So it's created the tables into the data model. So now, instead of going to relationships and new, we can press auto detect, but this is not the best way to do it, because if we do this now, it's not gonna know anything. So we need to put in some values in here first. In the sales data, let's put in the sales amount in here first. And the product data, we said that the product key and the product key are connected, okay? But we can put anything in here from the product data. It doesn't have to be product key. It could be product name, product cost. So we can put in any of these items in here. So let's put in a product name in the columns in there. And this message comes up. Relationships between tables may be needed. Instead of creating, Let's go to auto detect and it says one new relationship created. Perfect. Let's go to manage relationships and we're going to see that the product key and the product key are going to be in that relationship. So click on there and go to edit. As you can see here in the foreign is product key and the primary is a product key. So this is the one to many relationships and these are the tables that it got the relationships from. So 
he, he detected it, it's awesome. So you don't have to manually go and you know click this table like we did previously in Excel 2013 and then put in the relational column. So you don't have to do that. It's just automatically does that for you here. So that's perfect. All we're gonna do is press OK and close it. There it is there. Let's do the same thing for the customer data table. As we said in the previous video, customer number and customer number are related and we can put in anything in here. We can put in the address, the city, the country. Let's put in the country. Let's put it in the rows in there. Now, another message comes up. Let's press auto detect. It says one is created, manage relationships. And let's go in there again and click edit and you see the customer number. That is a related column. It's perfect, we like it. Press OK and close. And as you can see here, the data changes and it has automatically created relationships for us. We didn't have to go create it. It's a great new feature. You should go and give it a try and practice. And once you have data that is all related, you can create some awesome pivot table reports without using VLOOKUP or some ifs. Data model is great. It's going to make your life easier and you create much more enhanced reports, which is going to make you a data whiz. In Excel 2016, Microsoft introduced the automatic grouping of dates and that was an awesome feature where you can just drag your date field into the pivot table and it automatically puts it into months, quarters and years. Now you can see that tutorial in the Excel 2016 tutorial videos that I have for you and in Excel 2019 they have gone one step further and they've included automatic grouping of time. In our data set here, we have the time of order, as you can see here, all the way there. And we can actually group this automatically. Let's give it a go. Let's go to insert and pivot table and press OK. And we have here our pivot table and we're going to get our time of order and put it in our rows. Once we do that, you're going to see on the left, the automatic grouping of the time. All right, so you see there from 12 a.m. all the way down to 11 p.m., beautiful. And if you click on there, you can see that, that it's grouped into minutes as well. And you can see here that it automatically puts it into hours and minutes. It's created this hours group and also the minutes group. And you can also see it here. So it's automatically created new fields for us. So that is just awesome, just with drag and drop ease. Now, let's put in our sales in here, and we can see that the sales values are grouped into the time that the order was made. So you can do a lot of analysis on there, and you can have a look at what is your best time where most of the orders come in and go into that data and give it to your boss and you have got some great and awesome insights there just with drag and drop ease. Now, if you don't want this option to be automatic, you can switch it off. Go to File, Options, and under Data, you've got here, Disable Automatic Grouping of Date or Time Columns in Pivot Tables. So if you click on that and press OK, the next time you drag a date or time field into your pivot table, it's not going to automatically group. But I suggest having this checked off and it's just going to make your pivot table slicker and you're going to be able to analyze your data much, much quicker. So there you go, automatic time grouping in Excel 2019 and Office 365. So give it a go and see what you can come up with.